kick off in a moment, but I um, just want to get everyone in before we do, and there's still people queuing outside. Uh, there are on your seat various things, including a copy of the National who've put the programme for the conference inside it. So if you have a look in there, you'll find the programme for the day, and we'll be with you shortly.
how to... Yeah, yeah. And I'll go Caroline, Clive, you, Leanne. You, Leslie. No, very happy. If you should be wherever. I might stay in the middle if that's right, but if you should come on this side, that would be great. We got Will. Okay, hello, welcome. Welcome to the assembly rooms, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Sorry about this slight delay in getting in. There's just, well, there's quite a lot of you. Um, I'm Adam Ramsey. I'm special correspondent at Open Democracy, which is one of the partners in organizing this event. And um, it was back in January when Tom Nairn died and um, my colleague Anthony Barnett was staying with me that we first came up with the idea for this conference. And it's so great to see it happening and to see you all here. So thank you for coming. Um, thank you for coming to the assembly rooms. Uh, this building was built in 1778 at the absolute zenith of Britain's dominance of the global slave trade. It was built with public subscriptions from the wealthy of Edinburgh who made much of that money from slaving. If you turn right out of the front door, you'll very shortly get to St Andrew's Square, in the middle of which is a large statue of Henry Dundas, the uh, Scottish politician who was the Home Secretary who fought long and hard against the abolition of the slave trade and whose sins are too long to enumerate here. And if you head another 20 miles or so in the same direction, you get into East Lothian, where you'll find a grand country house, which was the childhood home of one Arthur Balfour, a prime minister and later foreign secretary, perhaps best known as the signatory of the Balfour Declaration, which gave British support for the creation of the State of Israel on Palestinian land. In the last month, my nephew, who is half Palestinian, has lost 50 of his cousins in Gaza. The failure of the British state to condemn those actions, those war crimes, in Gaza has, I think, demonstrated for many of us why we're here today and why there's so much contention about the existence of the state of Britain itself. And so thank you so much for coming. We're going to have rich discussion. And we've got a wonderful panel coming up for you, for you in a moment. But first, I'm going to introduce Professor Will Storer from Princeton, who was a good friend of Tom Nairn. Apparently, he just might be telling his story, but first met him in that corner over there. Um, and uh, is going to talk about the man who brought us all here himself. Will. Thank you. Thank you. Before I begin, I think we should take a moment to salute not just Tom Nairn, but the people who've put this extraordinary gathering together within a few months. To Anthony Barnett and the organizers, this is an intellectual coup d'etat that starts a new moment in political history, and we want to salute them for their extraordinary achievement. Years ago, in a Scottish Current Affairs program, one of the pal panelists foolishly referred to themselves as intellectual, which prompted the journalist Julie Davidson to write, there are only four intellectuals in Scotland, and they're all called Tom Nairn. <laughs> it is good to remember who those four intellectuals were at the start of this conference because we need all four today. The first three Nairns are well known. First, there is the European Nairn. I did a politics degree at Edinburgh in the 70s, and in four years we were assigned not one contemporary reading on Scotland, apart from a study of funeral rites in the Outer Hebrides. Imagine then the impact of reading the breakup of Britain when it was first published in 1977. Suddenly, in essay after essay, the tragedy, of the tragic comedy of this never, never land called Scotland, missing from modernity, was performed before our eyes in the language of a poet and the logic of a philosopher. Scotland seen not in the twilight of the Ukrainian British state, but under the dazzling sun of European culture. 
Antonio Gramsci, Walter Benjamin, and Paul Klee's Angel of History. Here was Enoch Powellism skewered, little England stripped of its imperial pajamas, and the rutting hulk of Britannia hold below history's waterline and destined for the breaker's yard. And what of Scotland? Seen now as a seaworthy ship of state, thanks to Nairn's conversations with Stephen Maxwell on Scottish nationalism. Nairn was a European thinker like no other. The artist turned student of aesthetics, turned Gramscian from his time in Pisa. He gave my generation, the home rule generation, a new Republican consciousness. We were European citizens, turning the Janus faces of nationalism towards a more muscular constitutionalism. After Brexit, we need that thinker back among us today. <laughs> Second, there is the revolutionary whose solidarity with the students of May 1968 cost Nairn his career and a lifetime of precarious employment on the margins of the academy and media. In discussing the breakup of Britain, let's not lose sight of Nairn's analysis of why May 1968 failed and its lessons for that other moment of revolutionary practice which came as if from nowhere, Scotland's summer of democracy in 2014. When, in Nairn's words, reality came close to the dream. We think of Nairn as a theorist, but in fact his passion was practice, or rather the, the dialectic between the two. How do I know? Well, this revolutionary wanted to wring my neck. Where many comrades could sink the Titanic with the leaden prose, Nairn had a wit that lifted Scotland off the iceberg of Eucania with just one joke. We all know his now legendary Scottish paraphrase of the French revolutionary slogan that humanity would be free when the last king was strangled in the gut of the last priest. You, you will appreciate then the conference organizer's sense of humor in inviting me, a Kirk minister, to chair the breakout session on the monarchy. Tom would have enjoyed this irony. The first time I got a call from him, the, that familiar gravelly basso profundo voice said, Chief officer of the strangling classes here. <laughs> My unlikely friendship with this revolutionary tells us something very important about him. Like all true satirists, he was a deeply humane and caring man. His anger was directed not against individuals, but against institutions like the British state he rebelled against all his life. There was not a, a sectarian bone in Tom Nairn's body. This is the intellectual we salute today. A revolutionary, yes, but a revolutionary without contempt. If we are remembering that Nairn, this is not a day for personal contempt, but for political analysis. Then there is the anthropologist. I went to visit Tom when he was a professor of global studies in Melbourne, developing his concept of nationality politics under the conditions of globality. Everyone's now scurrying away from the once fashionable globalization thesis. But Nairn's thesis of the global was never about the triumph of neoliberalism. Nairn, the social scientist, was deeply read in prehistory and saw in the earliest human cultures the enduring structures of human sociability that made a myriad small nations the world's only viable future. 
This is not a day for despair. Going global with this nairn means we have the long durée of history on our side. But what about the fourth nairn? The one missing from almost every account of his life. As Adam said, I first met the forgotten nairn in this very assembly room, right there at the back of the hall. Everyone writes about the private man of independent mind whose only venture into politics is said to be his involvement in the ill-fated Scottish Labour Party. Not so. Tom Nairn was in this assembly room in 1980 at the second annual meeting of the campaign for a Scottish assembly that had risen Phoenix-like from the ashes of the 1979 referendum. This was Tom, this here, right now, this event, this was Tom's natural political milieu, building broad cross-party alliances in a broad movement for democratic renewal. Right through those decades, Nairn was an active participant in the civic movement for a Scottish Parliament, a stalwart of common cause with Neil Ashton and Joyce McMillan. In countless campaign events, Tom was there, never at the front, always keeping us honest. This is the fourth Tom Nairn, the unknown citizen who marched with the movement every step of the way to the Scottish Parliament. Those first three intellectuals, the European, the revolutionary, the anthropologist, they were and are uniquely Nairn. But Nairn, the unknown citizen, he is all of us. It turns out we're all called Tom Nairn, so let's get on with it. Thank you, Will. Um, as you can see from our, for our opening panel, we've got a wonderful lineup of speakers, and I'm going to use as little time as possible to introduce them so you can get as much of them as you can. So, can we start with Caroline Lucas, the UK's first Green MP, who's come all the way up from the south coast of England, from Rice Pavilion, and um, who is very welcome here in Scotland. And I can tell you, gave my baby daughter a very good hug last night. Thank you, Adam. Thank you to your lovely daughter. And um, thank you all for the huge honor to be sharing this really important day with you. I'd like to add my congratulations to the organizers for such a fitting tribute to the extraordinary Tom Nairn. While his death earlier this year was widely acknowledged in Scotland with Gordon Brown and Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond all sharing their fulsome tributes about the significant influence he had on, on their thinking, I was struck that it barely registered among English political thinkers. And that's a particular shame, I think, because much of Nairn's analysis was actually about my homeland and its seemingly permanent state of political crisis. Perhaps it reflects the fact that few of England's political elite are actually willing to accept that they are just English, let alone to contemplate the logic of Nairn's argument that the breakup of Britain, the mutual liberation from the crumbling political construct which he famously called Eucania, might just be good for all of us. But just as Tom Nairn spent a lot of his time thinking about England, I hope you'll forgive me if I spend most of my time today looking at this issue through the lens of England and the English, particularly since we have such eloquent speakers from Scotland and Wales here on the panel beside me. The title we've been given is How Did We Get Here? And I will certainly try to answer that, but I also want to look forward to how we get out of here, which is probably more important. 
But where is here in the first place? What is the nature of the democratic crisis that we face? Well, seen in one way, I think the problem is our political institutions. Clearly, the archaic and undemocratic first-past-the-post voting system, an over-centralized governance system, the unelected laws, the populist abuse of sovereignty, the vast networks of patronage, the stuffy and outdated conventions, public school atmosphere, the whole damn lot of it. <laughs> So yes, partly the problem is our political institutions, but seen in another way, it is also about nationalisms and identity, and specifically about how England in particular has struggled to find its way in the modern world. How we cling to delusions of imperial grandeur, pretend that we are so much more than just English, and the devastating consequences of that are all around us. It was English exceptionalism that drove Brexit, for example. In one way, that referendum campaign seems a lifetime ago, although I'm sure you share with me the slight horror of seeing David Cameron slouch back to Westminster in the way that he has over the last few days. But we have gone through so much more since that referendum, and if anything, I would say that the alienation and the polarization are even greater today than they were in 2016. But the truth was clear even then, that Brexit was the result of division and would make those divisions worse. It has deepened the democratic crisis within the United Kingdom. The fact that England and Wales voted to leave and Scotland and Northern Ireland to stay has put incredible strain on the myth that the United Kingdom is an equal partnership of four nations. The government in London decided what form Brexit would take without any reference at all to the elected governments in Edinburgh or Belfast or indeed in Cardiff. And unsurprisingly, as a result, support for the reunification of Ireland has grown the pressure for a second referendum in Scotland remains strong. In Wales, a new sense of national identity is on the rise. I think it is very true to say that the future of the United Kingdom is now in doubt. Yet we left the EU, I would argue, primarily because of what happened in England. Outside of the capital, every single English region voted for Brexit. And it's no disrespect to Wales, I hope, which voted by a majority of only 80,000 for leave, to say that it was an English vote that drove Brexit. And in the month following 2016, I followed, I, I traveled to as many leave voting places in England as I could to hear from people firsthand and face to face why it is that they had voted for Brexit. And sometimes that was a difficult process. And one reason that came up again and again was that those who benefit, benefited economically from the EU membership and from the UK becoming a more open and diverse society didn't do anything like enough to share those gains fairly and often sneered at those with a more traditional view of England. But those conversations were also refreshing and reassuring because there was so much more that we agreed on than held us apart. Many people were angry, of course they were, but if you took the time to go and pay them the courtesy of listening, then common ground could emerge. And one theme continually did emerge through that whole process, which my small team filmed, and we, we presented it afterwards as a, as a project called Dear Leavers. But one theme that came up again and again was about people's sense of pride in the places where they lived, but simultaneously their feelings of powerlessness. I was told countless times that London, the power that was held there, was so far away that it might have been on another planet. People felt unheard and ignored. And this was much more than an economic complaint. However, corrosive this country's grotesque inequalities of wealth and opportunity undoubtedly are. It was also about culture and identity. Many resented how some expressions of Englishness were allowed while others were not. It was acceptable to love the English countryside, English humor, English music, English literature, and to see those aspects of English as welcoming and humane, full of energy and creativity. But the moment Englishness took a political form, it apparently turned into the opposite. Even mild forms of patriotism were frowned on. The English flag was acceptable, fluttering from a church tower in a picturesque village, but was instantly interpreted as a form of racism if hanging from someone's window on an estate. Yet Englishness should not be something to be scared of, or indeed suppressed within the notion of Britain, as if that would somehow contain it safely. I think Brexit showed us the limits to that particular strategy. I think instead we need to recognize that many people who see themselves primarily as English feel that they are without a voice, including a political voice. There are no institutions that represent England equivalent to those in the three other countries in the UK. Nothing to give political expression 
who are complex and rich and sometimes raucous reality, or where differences can be expressed and perhaps resolved. So the so-called English problem is not only one of culture and identity, it is also profoundly one of democracy. And we need to ask ourselves, what kind of England do we want now and in the future, either within the United Kingdom or as an independent state, a reborn Kingdom of England? Will it be a smaller, diminished version of what we have now? Will imperial delusions and exceptionalism continue to shape our sense of self? Will it be inward-looking and resentful of lost glories? Or could it, could it just become a genuine democracy, confident, outward-looking, inclusive, and recognizing that our future necessarily involves being part of Europe? These questions, I think, have taken on an even greater urgency as xenophobic nationalism continues its rise across Europe from the success of the Sweden Democrats and true Finns to the growth of the far right in France, Italy, and Hungary. At the same time, propelled by the outcome of the Brexit referendum and the 2019 general election, in the UK, the populist right strengthens its grip on an increasingly extreme and out-of-touch conservative party. But if a progressive alternative to this national populist agenda is to be successful, I think it needs to do more than offer bolder, more ambitious policies, vital those, though those are. It needs to unify rather than divide and to offer hope rather than despair. And one of the most effective ways of doing that, I think, is by telling more compelling stories about who we are and who we can be. And so my answer to the question of how do we get out of the current democratic crisis isn't only about constitutional answers, it's not only about PR or an elected House of Lords or a written constitution. It's about telling more compelling stories about who we English are, so that we might finally be more comfortable in our own skin, less intent on subduing our neighbors, whether they be within the UK or across the empire. Because I would wager that once we English do finally settle with our own identity, we might just discover we are far more progressive than we were ever led to believe. Because right now, Englishness has been hijacked by right. The dominant version of our national story solely serves their interests. The only people who dare speak Englishness are cheerleaders of isolationism and imperial nostalgia. But there are other stories equally compelling about who we are, about the English people's radical inclusivity, their ancient commitment to the natural world, their long struggle for rights for all, stories that put the chartists and the diggers in their rightful place alongside Nelson and Churchill, stories that draw inspiration from the agreement of the people, from Tom Paine, from Blake, Shelley, William Morris, and the suffragettes, that draw on medieval writers and romantic poets who emphasize the sanctity of the environment, that recognize and celebrate England's ancient multicultural heritage. And so, if I could just end with one tiny shameless plug, uh, my forthcoming book, Another England, <laughs> sets out to tell those stories. Because I genuinely believe rediscovering those stories of an England at ease with itself and with our past, forward-looking, open, more equal, diverse, and multi-ethnic, and identifying the policies that could actually help to realize those visions and stories, I believe that project has become a political project every bit as urgent and important as leveling up or investing in infrastructure. Because a country without a coherent story about who and what it is can now thrive and prosper, it can't extract itself from its own democratic crisis, and it certainly can't rise to the existential threats of our time, the climate and nature emergencies. As the writer Ben Okri puts it, nations and peoples are largely the stories they feed themselves. If they tell themselves stories that are lies, they will suffer the future consequences of those lies. If they tell themselves stories that face their intrudes, they will free their histories for future flowerings. So finding and telling those stories that speak to the truth of England's past and present and inspire us to imagine and pursue new and better futures might just turn out to be one of the most transformative acts that we can undertake and, indeed, one of the greatest contributions to a healthy democracy right across all of these aisles. I understand why many Scots have run out of patience with the English. You are constructing your own modern narrative. Why on earth should you need to concern yourself with England's need for one? Well, I would just perhaps leave you with the answer that perhaps there has to be a collaborative effort among all of us, if any of us is to succeed. The 
incomparable Caroline Lucas. Thank you so much, Caroline. I'm going to stick with England. So um, next we have another, I think, incomparable MP, my personal favourite Labour MP. Um, I uh, don't like to indulge in alternative histories, but I do occasionally wonder what would have happened if the left had got behind Clive's leadership bit in the Labour Party in 2020, and whether we wouldn't be looking at the future Prime Minister with a very different story right now. But alas, that didn't happen. Um, Clive Lewis is the MP for Norwich South, and I'm going to... On you go. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Thank you for that introduction as well, Adam. Uh, I imagine that alternative history is uh, one my wife wouldn't like, but nonetheless, uh, it is an interesting uh, idea. Uh, it's a huge honor to be here today to speak at this uh, intellectual gathering. I don't consider myself an intellectual. I like to hang out with them, though, um, and I hope some of their ideas rub off on me. Um, before I start, I almost didn't make it. I had a, I had a phone call from um, elements in my party that said, uh, do you really want to come to Scotland and, and make this speech? And I had, to, uh, I had to explain that you do realize there's a question mark at the end of the, the, title, of the, con the, con the title of the conference, uh, the breakup of Britain, question mark, which I think just about allowed me to come up. Um, <clears throat> it's funny because Caroline, when Caroline was telling me in the green room about what she was gonna say, she was saying, oh, it's about stories. And I was like, well, that's what I'm going to talk about as well. So, I mean, great minds think alike, or minds think like. I think it's quite interesting that we both come to uh, a similar conclusion in terms of what we want to talk about here today. My opening remarks are mainly about stories. The stories we tell ourselves, the stories we tell each other, and the stories the powerful and the political class tell the rest of us. But it's that last one that's of particular interest to me. Why? Well, because to understand the British democratic crisis, the title of this morning's session, we need to understand both what the crisis is, which I'll come on to at the end, but also how we got here in the first place. We know those who control the past control the present. Therefore, the stories we tell ourselves about our past will determine the parameters of what today is considered politically possible and what's ruled out. And it partly explains, for example, why England can have Brexit, but Scotland can't have independence. It's clearly very powerful. Why else do you think the Farages' rights of this country, the intellectual inheritors of Enoch Powell, and I'll come back on to him in a bit, are so intent on waging and winning their history wars? It's because they understand that maintaining the illusional story of what Britain was is integral to the illusion of what Britain is and therefore the maintenance of their political and economic hegemony. So my journey to this awakening came not after I read Tom then, um, but after I had switched on the BBC News earlier in the year to see the Trevelyan family, uh, their family of British aristocrats, apologizing and paying reparation to the Caribbean island of Grenada. They were doing so for their family's part in the enslavement of thousands of Africans, including some of my own ancestors, it transpires, on my father's side. And it led to a podcast, Heirs of Enslavement, available on all good podcasting platforms, I'm doing my plug as well, <laughs> uh, that charts the story of Britain's transatlantic chattel slave trade and plantations all the way through to today and the continued exploitation of the same people by the same banks, financial institutions that made their money from that brutal exploitation in the first place. Now, the BBC, former BBC journalist, Lord Trevelyan, um, my co-presenter on the podcast, told me something which stuck in my head because it's redolent of wider truth, I think. She explained how her family had told itself for generations that they were part of the good and the great of British history. Irish potato famine aside, of course. Um, they were renowned historians, civil service reformers, and even Labour Party secretaries of state. But the realization they had enriched themselves through the longest 
most brutal and exploitative crimes against humanity ever perpetrated. Well, from what I could discern, it was like being woken up by a bucket of cold slops. It was a shock to the system. But it opened eyes, including my own. It allowed me to see that there had been a deliberate forgetting of our history, of our imperial story. Whether the usual sanitized story of slavery that focuses on abolition to the assertion that empire really wasn't that big a deal. And if it was, well, it brought the rule of law to the world. A deliberate forgetting. But why? Well, three key reasons. One, to cover up a crime scene that spanned the globe and hundreds of years. Two, to completely disconnect those crimes and the wealth and power they generated and how it ended up in the hands of the wealthy, the corporations, and the financial institutions, in other words, the 1%. And three, to enable the construction of a new national post-narrative empire of Britain. Together, I think they help explain a big part of our democratic crisis. <clears throat> Britain is a construct born of that empire. As post-war decolonization took place, as Ghana, India, Nigeria, and others began to break away, those sat in the driving seat of Empire PLC needed a new story of what Britain was. Enoch Powell, the first parliamentarian to embrace neoliberalism, and best known for his Rivers of Blood speech, is less well known for his role in this transformation. In 1950, he exclaimed that Britain without an empire is like a head without a body. But by the time he wrote his 1965 book, A Nation Not Afraid, he claimed the empire was simply an invention that had never really happened. Britain had never set out to conquer the world. Instead, it had been landed with the colonies. This is true. <coughs> no, rather, Britain was a pioneering island where the laws, constitution, and systems of government had been unbroken for millennia. Powell and the others gave birth to the lie that the British state was born by immaculate conception. <coughs> then growing organically into the modern day construct we now see, plucky Britain, so different from its European neighbors. If that's the story we tell ourselves, then of course the Christ of democracy makes no sense. It's like trying to square observational data of planetary orbits holding on to the belief that the Earth is at the inter of the solar system. None of it makes sense. Therefore, this forgetting is crucial, both to the maintenance of the British state, as is, the monarchy, the union, an unwritten constitution, and even our voting system. It covers up the origins for the gross wealth inequality within our country, why the city of London, the bank, the financial institution wield such wealth and such power over us, why a racialized immigration narrative is so deeply embedded into our political culture, why human rights commitments are now under attack, and why the union is so fragile. Everything begins to make sense when we tell ourselves the truth of how we got here. And by doing that, we can better work out what it is we need to do to tackle the crisis of democracy, which is what this conference is about. I'll end very briefly on a story. Um, when I was in the Caribbean making the, the podcast, that was one of the upsides of making the podcast. And I spoke to someone called Ali Gill, who's the chair of the Caribbean Reparations Committee in Grenada. And I said to him, Ali, how can I tell my constituents in Norwich South, many of whom never really benefited from empire, never really benefited from the wealth that was sucked into the United Kingdom. How do I tell them when they can't even afford to heat their homes? Many of them are using food banks that they're now going to have to pay reparations. And he said to me, he said, Clive, he said, they don't and they shouldn't have to. What they need to understand is that the people who've been exploiting and robbing and killing and murdering in the Caribbean for hundreds of years are the same people who now hoard that wealth in the UK. The same corporations, the same banks, 
the same political class that dominates. And actually, we and your constituents and we in the Caribbean have something in common, and it's them. And I think this tweet speaks to a new internationalism that's required because the Christ of democracy isn't just in the United Kingdom, it's global. We can see it in the institutions that no longer work, the UN. We have institutions like the IMF, the World Bank. These aren't institutions that are democratic, they're exploitative, they're extractive. And actually, until we wake up and understand that the Christ of democracy is international, we'll never be able to challenge the Christ of democracy here in the UK. Thank you very much. Clive Lewis. Next up, we have one of my favorite people in the world. She is, uh, we were having dinner last night, and my, and Leanne was over for me, and my, my wife was there too, and afterwards my wife said, Leanne Wood is just so lovely. <laughs> yeah. Um, former leader of Plaid Cymru, it's come up from, from Cardiff to speak to you, and uh, I will let you do the rest. Thanks for being here. That was a lovely introduction. Thank you, Adam. Now, there's no doubt, is there, that democracy is in crisis. And at base, in my view, it's the Brexit vote that was actually an expression of that. I think that the debate that led to the Brexit vote in Wales and England, yes, it was about immigration and taking back control. But it was fueled by this idea that an unelected elite was really running everything and that our elected politicians could do very little to overrule them. People couldn't understand why it was that uh, against European rules to use public procurement to support small local businesses, why structural funds that were meant to solve poverty could be spent on some projects but not on the projects that would improve things really economically. And it was this context uh, of the previous quarter of a century where the two main political parties looked exactly the same and sounded exactly the same as well. As Tom Nen pointed out in After Britain, the new Labour project, much like Keir Starmer's Labour project, is about continuity. It's about not upsetting the apple cart. It's centrism. Even New Labour's creation of Scottish and Welsh devolution was about ensuring continuity. You can have an institution, you can elect its representatives, unlike the previous Scottish and Welsh offices, but you can only have so much, not a dram more, as Nen said. From a democratic perspective, those referendum votes in 1997 were never going to be enough. There was always going to be demands for more. Now I know from listening to the two previous speakers, democracy was in crisis before the 1990s. My early teenage recollections of living through the miners' strike, I have memories of people feeling that they weren't being listened to. The futures of people where I lived in the valleys in the south of Wales just didn't matter. And of course, we'd already had the disaster of Aberfan and Trewerin. I wasn't born in the 1960s, uh, but these were very strong memories in, in people's minds. And I wasn't as politically conscious in the 1980s as I became in the 1990s. So I can only really speak about this democratic crisis from my own personal experience of it. In the 1990s, we had a discredited and dysfunctional Conservative Party, very much like we have today, and an electoral system that is designed to produce a binary outcome. It's the red ties or the blue ties. But we had promises in Scotland and Wales to create democratic institutions elected with elements of PR, 
which gave the potential for us to go beyond that binary red tie, blue tie thing. And surely that had to be good for democracy. Well, yes, it was to a point. But in Wales, for example, we've only ever had one party, the Labour Party, in control of the Welsh Government, albeit with different partners at different points. And our devolution settlement isn't actually that much different to the one that we were given in 1999. Yes, our Senedd has lawmaking powers now, and it is a reserved powers model. But the areas, the policy areas for which our Senedd is responsible are broadly the same as the policy areas under the old Welsh office. Tom Nairn said that Tony Blair's evolution project was the preservation of the world's oldest multinational state through cautious, negotiated reform controlled from the centre. In 1997, it appeared a lot more radical than it actually was, partly through hype, partly by contrast with the rigor mortis of the preceding conservative regime. Renewal at a safe distance, he said, change around the edges. Despite this, it was sold to us as a radical project, and it did keep, give people in both our countries a lot of hope. As time went on, it became clearer to many people that devolution was not a radical project, and it was inevitable that there would be demand for more. Within 12 years, in Wales, two-thirds of people voted to turn our powerless Welsh Assembly into a lawmaking parliament. And within 15 years, you in Scotland were holding your independence referendum. And this thirst for more in both of our countries still has not yet been satisfied. Here, despite a material change in circumstances since that vote took place on independence in 2014, people have been blocked from having their say again. And in Wales, we've had austerity, the COVID pandemic, coupled with the disastrous incompetence, incompetence in charge of the British state, is pushing people now more towards this question of independence. And even those people who are still not convinced, many say that they would support independence for Wales if Scotland were to leave the UK. And surprisingly, there isn't a great appetite for people to remain in a union just with England. Uh, people understand we get a raw deal now, then it's likely that we'd get an even worse deal uh, if it was just Wales and England. In, in fact, it's likely that we could even end up ceasing to exist. That said, Wales voting for Brexit, you could argue, makes that outcome more and not less likely. And isn't it interesting that our countries voted differently on that question? And we do need to understand why that happened. There's been a lot of speculation, um, but my take on it is that the Brexit uh, uh, conversation that you had here in Scotland was a different one because of the experience and the debate that you had during the independence referendum. That democratic awakening, that real interest from people in politics, that real hope that things could be different in a radical and progressive sense had been felt by people here, and we had no similar equivalence in Wales. In Wales, Brexit was that vote for change. It was a chance to take democratic control, to get our country back, as they said when alternative paths to change simply weren't available to us at that time. But the truth is, and it's fortunate for us in Wales, as well as you here in Scotland and people in the north of Ireland too, there are paths to change. Yes, the Brexit vote has made positive change for us much more challenging, there's no doubt about that. But independence and unification in Ireland's case does provide us with the hope that we can do something different, that we can create a politics that has people and not the preservation of the British establishment and the monarchy as the chief goal. And learning from and keeping the legacies alive of these great thinkers that have gone before us will help us get there. 
You in Scotland, you have Tom Nain, and I'm looking forward to learning an awful lot more about Tom in this conference today. In Wales, we also have the memory of Raymond Williams, a Welsh European, a contemporary of Nain, a Marxist and another great thinker who has left an immense body of work that we can build on. So I'd like to finish by saying, wouldn't it be amazing if we could hold an event similar to this in Wales, remembering and celebrating the work of Raymond Williams? And you're all invited. Thank you, Leanne. Um, it was great to hear you talk about how there are genuine pathways to change. Rowan Williams famously said that to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. And it was nice to see you doing some of that. So thank you very much. Our final speaker, Leslie Riddich, in, here in Scotland needs this introduction. She's been a leading Scottish journalist for many years now. I, I was going to say as long as I can remember, but I didn't want to... <laughs> Um, she's been uh, perhaps the most energetic stalwart of um, campaigning for independence since 2014, travelling around the country and speaking to huge numbers of people, um, making her arguments and writing numerous books, which you shall go and buy. And um, Leslie, I'll let you finish. Well, could I first of all just start say, I mean, I am almost greeting sitting up here with pride. And I don't say that, you know, pride, what is that? But that Scotland can host an event like this with speakers like this, come on! <laughs> My God, we've waited a long time to sort of regather ourselves here with the full force of all the knowledge, all the opinions, all the, the discontent, all the history, all the perspectives that come from a whole queen of different parties here in our country, in Scotland. This is absolutely marvelous. And so, so well done to the organizers. Now, I just want to start off by finding out where everybody comes from. I'm always curious, as you may know, in this room. I mean, who was, just as a matter of interest, born beyond the UK? Grant, you're welcome. Uh, who was uh, born in Wales? Right, okay. So the Raymond William fans are obviously, you know, <laughs> non-Welsh, Leanne, which is good news, right? Um, Ireland? England? Yeah. And Scotland. Okay, and who now, irrespective of where you were born, who is Scottish? That's the crisis of Britain, in a nutshell. Because the, there is another state in waiting in this country, in Scotland, which has remembered a different way of operating. It's not ethnic at its best, you know, in those days we fall down. But embodied in the criteria for the independence referendum was that very different outlook. If you'd lived here for three months, you're Scottish. The Brexit referendum. <laughs> the Brexit referendum, you had to be British, Commonwealth, or Irish citizens to vote. And that meant people who'd spent their entire lives here from other countries, no vote. And no one argued about that same way as no one in Scotland argued about the idea that if you'd been here for three months, you were Scottish. Talk about your Irish come into the parlour if you're Scottish. I mean, you just have to be here three months and you're in. Now, that is a great demonstration of what's driving, I think, the, the breakup of Britain now, uh, because, because Scots have got a different conception of what a country can be. We're carrying it without even being totally aware of it, we deploy it. When we have a big moment, it just comes in. Now, you know, let's not get carried away. There's some pretty dodgy size to us on a bad day too. 
But let's talk about the good days because that is the conception we're bringing forward. Um, the, the history, why we got where we are, has been so well explained by everybody that came ahead of me. But the exceptionalism is now totally falling apart for all the reasons outlined. But for my mind, as someone who spent a lot of time looking east to the small independent countries who are on almost every measure the best performing societies on earth, we know now there are other ways to run a country. And actually, when you begin to look at you know, the exceptionalism to a current Britain, Let's look at what cannot be changed. And I'm sorry, because I mean, we, be, you know, we shouldn't be having party political digs at this point, but you'd have to say the new Labour government that we're expecting to have will possibly not change any of these. So first past the post. Hooray! How exceptional! <laughs> and how exceptional to be standing alone in Europe with Belarus! <laughs> Yay! Um, the House of Lords, yay! It is the only legislator in the world that's larger than its elected one. And it's the second largest in the world outside the National People's Congress of China. That's exceptional, nice one. Um, and actually, let's not get smug. Local, what is that? Scotland has the largest local government in the world, except for Korea. So there's a template here that has to be broken, and a template that I think the Scots have been questioning on a whole lot of fronts. And there's the example that sits beside us. Because, I mean, Leanne, it was quite right, in fact, it might have been Caroline who said as well, we have to think about what the alternatives might be. Well, you know, you don't have to look far. At the risk of plugging a forthcoming film on Denmark. <laughs> Denmark. Now, I didn't know so much, but here's Denmark. It's used to control Norway, Sweden, Finland, Estonia, Iceland, Greenland, and Schleswig-Holstein. It lost them all. It lost, finally, in 1864, in a terrible war, with the very bad idea of invading Schleswig-Holstein and taking on Bismarck. I mean, in hindsight, nobody took on Bismarck. And uh, he nearly uh, annexed Denmark. Denmark nearly ceased to exist in 1864, very nearly. And actually, it was only the Allies who didn't want Germany, Prussia, taking up more territory that stopped Denmark being wiped from the map. That is the kind of um, existential crisis the Danes faced in the late 1800s, and they got over it. They got over losing a lot of it. They focused on themselves, they renovated their own thinking and country, and they are now the world's most energy self-sufficient country. Uh, they have so many accolades and so much going for them. They have a GDP far higher, sometimes double, sometimes treble, that of Britain. Can you see a kind of parallel? And actually, when you get beyond that, can you see that that entity, the whole of the Scandinavian countries, that used to be under the control of one country, have actually learned to let go, have learned to become independent without fighting, and now cooperate really strongly in the Nordic Council. Uh, to the extent that when people talk about the EU and the great advance of Schengen, for example, there was a Nordic travel area 40 years before Schengen because it made sense. The Swedes used to drive on the same side of the road as us. They switched because neighboring countries drove on the other. It made sense. This is the kind of way you can operate when you are not having this British model of a kind of primal sovereignty that still resides in Westminster as a drawdown from the sovereign. We've never got away from that. We're still sitting with the divine right of kings embodied in a prime minister who can do what the hell he likes. So, the future is there. There's many, many models for us, and as for, for, for Scotland in particular, we have a geopolitical location to die for. We are part Celt, we're part Nordic, we're part British. We're a mongrel nation, thank God for it, and it's time for us to create a state. Thank you.
Thank you, Leslie. I have to admit, I um, didn't expect we'd get to the Shetley Holstein question, but uh, <laughs> always good to have that old nut come up. Um, we have, we're a bit short on time because of um, the time to, to get in, but we've got some time for questions. I have a general policy, which is if I'm chairing an event, the first three questions have to be from women. Um, and so uh, what I'm going to do is just take one round, and then I'm going to come back to the panel for a kind of Two minute sum up, and then we're going to finish. So, have we got a row mic? Yes, over here. Um, hands up, anyone, please? Yeah, okay, so I see one person here. Can we get a mic over here? Um, Thank you to uh, all four speakers, very inspiring. And I could see a thread which I would like to unpick a little. Uh, to start with Caroline Lucas, you, the thing that stuck with me what, from your speech was collaboration, that actually a future was possible with collaboration rather than, if you like, conflict or dissent. It's a strong feeling I have. And Leslie followed that on with the idea of cooperating within small state where you didn't look to conquer everyone, where you collaborated. And then when I heard Clive, which he was also talking about the right story, but I wonder if your party, which seems on track to follow the current disastrous crowd, if you come on board, you've already indicated that that's not going to happen, that the Labour Party won't let this discussion happen in any meaningful way beyond a control from outside. So the wish that seems to penetrate a lot of the discourse for reasonable collaboration, reasonable discourse, seems to be stopped somewhere within the Westminster power complex. Thank you. Thank you, and who's next? I don't actually see any. Um, there's someone at Corner River there. Uh, hello, good morning. Um, it's very nice to see so many people here in Edinburgh. Uh, through in the other hall, you'll find one of our stalls, and that's Edinburgh Women for Independence. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> A plug is always useful. Um, it's taken the organisers less than nine months, I believe, to get this together, which is excellent. However, following up on what the first speaker said, there is a complete lack of awareness of the uh, democratic changes that are happening in Scotland, in Wales and Northern Ireland. Quite specifically to the three guests from other parts of Britain this morning, what can you do to change that? There's someone in the front of the middle here. Hi, I wonder if you can answer this question. I don't understand why England continues to sell its council housing and its housing <laughs> association houses when Wales and Scotland have got their act together. Okay, we've got time for two more questions, and I will accept men this time. Um, although there's, so take one there, and let's go for one in the back there, and then I'll come back to the panel. Sorry, everyone else. Hi, thank you, everybody. Um, that was great to hear all those um, talks today. I'm doing a bit of research looking at um, kind of political domination, cultural domination within the UK, um, Scotland, England, and Wales. And what's come out of my research originally, I thought perhaps it was a domination by England of um, Scotland and Wales, and that's how people felt. But actually what's come out of the research, it's, it's more 
a feeling of London and the South East dominating not just Scotland and Wales, but England as well. So I just wondered how, if um, people agreed with me and what's coming out of my research at the moment. Thank you. Hi there. I grew up in England and moved to Scotland when I was 18. Um, I grew up in Leeds in Yorkshire. When I, I don't remember seeing an England, a, a Yorkshire flag in my childhood. Going back now to visit uh, family, to go on holiday in Whitby, suddenly you see Yorkshire flags in a way that you never did before. What's happening in England? following that question, not just in London and the South East, but about the identities in Yorkshire, in Cornwall, in parts of England, and how does that impact on conversation about the potential breakup of Britain? Okay, so we've got um, 10 minutes left, and I'm going to start with Leslie and go that way, and ask each of our panellists to give a two-minute response to everything and each other and whatever else I want to say. <laughs> okay. Speak Lexi, if you don't say, talk yeah, about yeah, all of it. Absolutely. Uh, so, yes, I'll just make a couple of things. Well, since nobody's sort of being Irish on this panel, I'll just swing the other way for a minute here. Um, and just say that I mean, the extraordinary thing is that last year in May, there were more Irish passports issued in Belfast than British for the first time ever. <laughs> now, you know, that, that doesn't mean, obviously, that, you know, total change is around the corner, but, you know, this is like a, 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 promise of, a process of political climate change, not weather. And the climate is moving in one direction in Ireland. It's not going to be easy. But a lot of the changes that have happened in Ireland, specifically the use of citizens' assemblies to manage to deal with the two big issues I never thought would be tackled in my life, which was equal marriage and abortion, that was too difficult for the politicians. It was handed to the people. The Irish are now pioneers of how to use democracy well. And that lesson has not been missed. Ireland will have to consider federalism if the Northern Irish to come on board with any sense of confidence. So there's a huge future for Ireland to have to think through what it's doing as well. But as it does that, that has implications obviously for us. Because in 2014, you couldn't mention Ireland because it was just full of grief, as an example. So, you know, that's a very, very different situation, and quite clearly, Brexit has made a big impact there. Ireland now, now has one of the fastest rising GDPs in, in Europe. So there's an alternative model sitting to our other side as well. The last thing I just wanted to say before handing on, a couple of things, this might be a bit controversial on the council housing. This concept of an Englishman's home being his castle is slightly missing in a tenemental country like Scotland. Because we share, we have to share. We have caught a thing called a shared close. We used to, in the day, have to do the shared road of cleaning the shared close steps, right? That was a bit of a minger, right? But it puts a framework of thinking in because no one person owns the roof. No one person owns the backyard. And I think you've got a problem here with a terraced housing in England which actually is to try and protect the individual identity of homeowners and create low density cities which aren't efficient. So there's a big challenge there to rethink the whole thing, I'm afraid, and it's the emphasis on individualism which Scotland physically does not embody. I think I, I agree entirely with what Leslie just said there, and this question of housing is, is crucial, really. The right to buy was uh, abolished in Wales, and I presume for the same reason in Scotland, because of the homelessness problem. You would take in housing stock out of the public stock and essentially privatise it. So that um, policy was reversed in Wales and Scotland in order to try to tackle homelessness, which has been described uh, as a lifestyle choice, hasn't it? <laughs> so so that's, that's the politics that we're dealing with um, here. Um, someone asked about um, uh, what can we do to change the, um, 
the lack of awareness of the democratic changes. And I think it's talk. We talk with each other, we talk across nations, we talk across communities, and we put the campaign for democracy and for independence. I think that's how we, we deal with, with that. The question of domination is a really interesting one, and of course it's not um, England. There are people in England, in certain communities in England, who are living in acute poverty situations. In some uh, cases, those communities in, in the north of England are very similar to many of the communities where I come from in the valleys of Wales. The question is about class and wealth and power, and it's concentrated in the southeast of England. And that's why collaboration and cooperation between the peoples in these different countries is the way to overcome that. We take that wealth, we take that power, and we share it between ourselves. And the fact that there's Yorkshire flags now, and a, a strong sense of Cornish identity, and for many other uh, places in, in England, it's because uh, they, don't, they don't want to be part uh, of this uh, dominated political situation either, and they want to see uh, better democracy. People feel left out and forgotten, don't they? And that's at the heart of this, and I think it's, uh, it makes sense for us in Wales and Scotland to work with those people in England to free ourselves. Thank you, I agree with all of that. I was going to come to the collaboration question first of all, um, and wanted to uh, pay tribute, perhaps unusually, to, um, to grassroots Labour Party members who did, at their conference, vote for a fairer voting system. Hurrah for them. Um, and, you know, a huge amount of organisation went on to achieve that result, they got the unions on board, and so it was desperately disappointing then to hear Keir Starmer say, I don't care if there's just been a democratic vote of our, our own conference, we're going to ignore it. And it's particularly disappointing given that it is so damn counterproductive for Labour in any case, because if Keir Starmer is serious about wanting transformational change, and that's, we can discuss that, but, but let's suppose he were, then he's going to need more than one term in order to do it. And he might be 20 points ahead in the polls now, but he certainly won't be after, no, no government is after, after a term of government. So if he wants more than one term, he needs PR in any case. So, I mean, it is just so blindingly obvious and so very frustrating. Uh, that we haven't got that. But the campaign continues, and I'm, and I'm sure it, it will. Um, what are we going to do to change the fact that there isn't a wider conversation about the democratic changes that are going on in Scotland and Wales and, and that kind of upswing of, of feeling in, in England too? And I just want to tell you that this conference actually is the start of a roadshow. You don't know that, Anthony doesn't know that, but I think it absolutely should be the start of a whole uh, UK-wide roadshow. Um, Well, we are absolutely going to take this conversation. I, I honestly think there is a massive appetite actually right across the UK for this conversation, and I think it would be really exciting. Um, housing has been well covered. I was just going to add, you know, just add to the perversity and the awfulness of the way in which houses in, in England are treated as, as assets, commercial assets, rather than actual homes for people. If you look at who's buying those council houses, 40% of them go to private landlords. So they are simply them being let out again by private landlords for private profit, which just underscores the whole perverse nature of, of housing in, in the UK. And that's the subject of, of another conference. Um, very quickly about the dominance of London and South East, you're absolutely uh, right. And, um, and I just, we are in one of the most centralized, in, the, in, in, in England, the most centralized countries in the, in the world. Um, and we massively need serious evolution. But I think there's a real problem that in England, people, or the people, are not trusted by political elites. You know, they're, they're scared stiff of what people might do if they had a bit more power. And so there's this massive uh, clamping down uh, against giving that power out more widely. But we have to take it back. Power is never given, it is taken, and we're going to go and do our best to do that. And the Yorkshire flag and the, and the Cornish flag and so forth is exactly, I think, a manifestation of the fact that people need a political voice. They want a political voice and a cultural voice. And it's there and it's growing. And I think it just demonstrates that everything that we've been saying, all of us, about perhaps the limits to where the UK is right now and what's going to come after it, just demonstrates that this is coming from the bottom up. It really is. And this is a really exciting moment.
So this is a dangerous bit for me. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to try and tread carefully. Um, so on the issue of the Labour Party, uh, th clearly there are lots of things I think about this and that question. Um, it does feel, it does feel that there is an, a, an anti, that there is a kind of a growing sense that to have your own thoughts and to do your own thinking and to ask the big questions about why we are where we are um, is increasingly verboten in the Labour Party. Uh, and it's not to be discussed because it might damage our prospects of election uh, and actual success. And that's problematic because any political party that isn't prepared to think about where it is now, why the country is where it is, what's happening in the economy, why these things are happening, frankly, doesn't have a very bright future if it's not going to ask basic questions about why we are where we are. <clears throat> so... <laughs> so it, it does feel that in terms of um, where, where the country is going, the history of the union, it feels like we put a cork up our bottom in terms of thinking a 70 year, five years of constipation and it's going to explode at some point and it isn't going to be pretty. So, you know, maybe, maybe this, this roadshow can be part of the process of allowing Labour to uncork itself and start to question <laughs> this, otherwise it could, it could get messy. And it does need to uncork itself. So I, I, you're not going to get any argument from there on me. But the thing I wanted to talk about was housing. And, and I think, <clears throat> look, there's a reason. Thatcherism was an English project. It was, it was from those, those forces I was talking about, the people who built the empire, who took that wealth, who extrapolated that wealth, and they brought it back here, set up the overseas territory so they could dump that wealth in tax havens. And we know we can get that back tomorrow if we wanted, those trillions that are there. They've done that, and then they told us to forget about it. <clears throat> and that project, that project, that, that, that English project is all about in many ways, Kojo Karam called it boomerang effect. That what happened over there has now come back here to the UK. And that rapacious, exploitative, extractive economic system is now feasting on all of us. And housing is part of that. The financialization of every aspect of our lives is part of that story. It's the story of empire and it's come back here. And it's all interlinked with the story of what Britain is and the people who are trying to hold this 75-year construct, 75-year-old construct together. And I think when you begin to unpick that, you begin to tell that story, then you begin to understand why we have the problems we do. And I don't think the Labour Party should be scared of that. It should embrace it if it's a genuinely democratic socialist party, which I would like to think it is, although I understand why we may sometimes get that. So. Oh, is that my, I want to thank all of our panel, but I, I do just want to say for a second that I'm particularly grateful to Clive for standing up to the whips and for coming here despite his party's authoritarian. Um, since the rest of the panel did their plugs, I'm just going to do mine. Um, I've uh, just started to deal with Faber and Faber to write a book called Abolish Westminster. So that will be available in all good bookshops come 2025. I look forward to you reading it. <laughs> um, I need to hand over to Peter McCall, who is uh, going to tell you what's happening next. So thank you to our panel. Shall we stay or go? <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, my name's Peter McCall. I'm one of the conference co-directors, and um, I'm really excited uh, to invite uh, James Robertson uh, to the stage uh, to, uh, to deliver a, a reading of a uh, shortbread history of Scotland. If you have seen James before, you'll be very excited, as I am. If you haven't seen him before, you're in for a real treat. James. <laughs> Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, just in the spirit of Tom Nairn, I would like to uh, just uh, get rid of a few historical misrepresentations. Um, it'll take one minute. Uh, this is a shortbread history of Scotland. 
uh, done entirely in cliches and slogans. Hail Caledonia, whiskey galore, make it in Livingston, Lochaber no more. <laughs> Glasgow's miles better, a Gordon for me, pure dead brilliant. You'll have had your tea. <laughs> Keep me a falcha, come a wall, Ben. Will you all come back again? Come in a how, off you no wheel. Jock Thompson's bairns in the land of the leal. Scotland free for a desert, the stag at bay. Pay no poll tax, Scots wa hey. <laughs> Lead on, Macduff, it wasn't me. <laughs> Up with the bonnets of Bonnie Dundee. A parcel of rogues, the thin red line. Granny's healing him for old lang syne. Haste you back, come on, get off. Muckle fat, some stupid bean off. <laughs> Here's tears, what's like us, made from girders. <laughs> Lovely biscuits, there's been a murder. <laughs> the blood is strong, Dunsire blue. Was your Wally Shakespeare too? Thank you. Just uh, by, by way of directions, uh, we, we have uh, next a plenary in this room, uh, which is on Tom Nairn and the future of the British state, uh, with the speakers Hilary Wainwright, Rory Schoolthorne and Pat Kane. In the breakout room west, which is which is one of the uh, the, the drawing rooms, uh, we have the Tories' economic legacy with Scott Lavery, James Meadway, Maggie Chapman, and George Kervin. And in the uh, east reading room, there's a breakout on the rise of Sinn Féin and the prospects uh, for a united Ireland with uh, me in the chair, Una Malali, and Daniel Finn. There are about 100 spaces in each of those, and we'd really encourage you to, to go attend them. Uh, for those of you who are from Edinburgh, uh, as Joyce McMillan pointed out to me this morning, uh, the uh, drawing room west is the one closer to Glasgow, so on that side. <laughs> so if you want to hear about the economic legacy of the Tories, go towards Glasgow. And uh, the rise of Sinn Féin is uh, in, in the east, so the one towards uh, Port Bello or uh, East Lothian uh, on this side. So I look forward to seeing all, all, all of you trying to cram into the Irish session, but I highly recommend the others too. Thank you very much. Your person I claim is Judge Law. Anybody was a good judge.
Okay, can I be heard? Can you hear me? Wave your hand if you can hear me. Oh, there we go. Isn't that beautiful? Um, thanks very much. What a brilliant event this is. It's so wonderful to see uh, so many of you. And it's so wonderful to see this hall in particular filled because as far as I can see, I'm very proud to say uh, this is the only session that has a title in it with the words Tom Nairn. So this is a room full of Tom Nairn nerds we're going to nerd out furiously, so this is your chance. Have you ever had a qu <laughs> have you ever had a question about Tom's complex body of work? M maybe don't lean on me or Hillary, but certainly ask Rory. He knows all the answers. Um, so it's, it's, this is really intriguing to me. It's a very brief introduction before uh, a brief setup before I introduce these people. My name's Pat Kane, by the way, singer, musician, pest. Um, uh, the biggest challenge of Tom Stott is in the title of this conference, The Big Hop of Britain. Um, struck me, it would be worth asking the question, does that mean the breakup of the British state? Um, to the extent that Tom supported the establishment of an independent Scottish nation state, which he did, it would have to mean that. And what would be left behind would be what was delightfully called in recent years, the R.U.K., which is about as broken and distorted as something could get. Um, the question, was the 2014 Indy prospectus more like independence in the UK, as some commentators have said, discuss? But you'd imagine that a support for Scottish independence would apply the break of Britain, uh, at least constitutionally and jurisdictionally. To the extent that Tom was a devolutionist and a federalist, which he also advocated and agitated for uh, at points in his life, as Willie Storer said earlier, the future of the British state is reform and modernization, not break up. But one thing that we should remember about Tom and his legacy, his intellectual legacy, is that he's the great critic of the backwardness of the British state. Uh, this is the Neon Anderson thesis, well known, but what it basically says is the, the national revolution that came in 1688 came too early and was ill-formed, you know, it was a deal between merchants and the upper and ruling classes. It wasn't like a bourgeois revolution uh, in the classic European sense. And that broken, backward model of the British state still seems in operation today, as if you look at Starmer's Labour, it's cleaving to a right of centre agenda, and one that which seems at the very least indifferent to internal constitutional change on these islands. Let's see, but I'm not too hopeful myself. And as for Brexit, well, I can just see Tom's eyes rolling at the, at the mention of Brexit. Uh, the unitary tendencies of the British state seem to have been reinforced by it. Uh, Westminster overrides the devolved jurisdiction of Scotland almost every other month. Will a forthcoming Labour government, if so, officially committed to Brexit, be more tolerant of devolutionary deviation or less tolerant of it? Uh, let alone another independence referendum. Uh, the future's murky in that respect, I think. But we're, you're all here today because of, I think, of one uh, understanding that Tom's writing, not just the punk rock 1977 prophecy of the breakup of Britain, but throughout his 60 odd years of brilliance, is a, is a very active guide to the uncertain future of the British state. And as I say, we have two fantastic people here to explore that. To my left, to my, is that my left? Yes, that's my left. Um, it's always been a problem for me, um, whether I'm on the left hand or the right hand. Uh, Rory Scothorn is a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies uh, in the Humanities at Edinburgh University. He's a historian of ideology, culture, and politics, focuses on left-wing radicalism, nationalism, devolution, and civil society in Scotland in the final third of the 20th century. I wish I could have studied that. Um, he's also a, 
public commentator on contemporary Scotland and UK politics for the LRB, London Review of Books, New Statesman, The Guardian, as well as a TV and radio tart. Hilary Wainwright, which, of which I know very well myself. Hilary Wainwright is a sociologist, political activist and socialist feminist, co-editor of Red Pepper magazine, a fellow of the Transnational Institute, author of several books including Labour, A Tale of Two Parties and New Politics from the Left and I think a fellow traveller with Tom on the left and the trials and tribulations of thinking like a Marxist or a post-Marxist for quite a long time. So, uh, a very simple question and I'm going to ask both of them at the beginning and then we'll develop it and then I'm looking forward to your questions, um, nerdish or otherwise. So the first question I want to put to two of you and I'll put to Rory first is really how does Tom Nairn's work help us think about the future of the British state? Rory. Thank you Pat um, for that introduction which I did not write myself, I did not use the word talent there. Um, I think the first thing is that the future, for Nairn, the, the whole phrase, the future of Britain, is an oxymoron, um, he, but he loved contradictions. Uh, he would have loved that. Uh, in Scotland, we even have our own phrase for these kind of productively painful splits in the soul. Uh, we call them Caledonian anti-syzygy, um, which is great because it's ungoogleable. Um, and, and we're fortunate enough to be discussing things like this uh, in a city that expresses those contradictions. Uh, Edinburgh is like an air and essay. You walk through it, you're walking through that early essay on Scottish nationalism, the three dreams of Scottish nationalism. You can go up to the old town, St. Gile Kirk, where John Knox preached, think about the Reformation, um, which Nairn talked about as a kind of doomed effort to bring heaven down to earth, this great effort to escape Scotland's reality, um, which left us with decades of chaos and misery, or as some people like to think. Um, some people like to think it gave us a democratic and rebellious spirit, but Nairn saw this as a democracy of the damned, a democracy, uh, an equality of, of helplessness before the almighty. Um, and he saw the next dream of Scottish nationalism as um, the Enlightenment, Scottish Enlightenment, another attempt to escape onto the abstract world of reason and ideas. And we see this around us in the new town, a kind of neoclassical grandeur, an abstract cosmopolitan style, not much very Scottish about it. And so we end up with 19th century romanticism, that uh, weird Disneyland that now occupies the old town, those Scots baronial Gothic fantasias uh, that conjure up an idea of Scottishness that is safely depoliticized. Um, in fact, even in the new time, we have some nods to Scotland. If you go over to Colton Hill uh, at the East End, uh, you, you see the National Monument up on Colton Hill, which was, they were thinking of building a monument to the Napoleonic Wars. Down London, they thought, well, we should have one to the Scots who died as well, so they put one on Colton Hill. But then they didn't finish it, so we've got one end of a fake Parthenon up on Colton Hill. Um, and this desire for Scotland to be represented within Britain has to be understood, the beauty, the grandeur of all that romance in the old town has to be understood as compensation, as a kind of spiritual salve for what Britishness really is, which is a complete lack of power. That unbearable lightness of being British is what Tom Nairn really thought his work was all about. Um, being subject of a nation with no real or distinctive culture of its own, one that has to rely on the appropriating the cultures of its peripheries or worshipping these kind of pet monarchs that we have. Uh, that is what Britishness is all about, Danairn, um, a, a country that doesn't really substantiate itself at any point. The dreamlike nature of this city has to be understood as well in the context of the Age of Revolutions. Uh, the National Monument was a monument to Scots who died fighting Napoleon, Britain desperately resisting this revolutionary surge across the world that actually applied the ideals of the Enlightenment that we see immortalized in the architecture around us, applied them to politics, tried to build political orders on the foundation of reason and universality and equality, the very things the British regime was setting itself against. This is the real nature of Britishness, it says, the romance, the joy, the feeling of nationhood must be safely in the past. That collective agency that comes from nationhood must be in the past. The present is for other people, it's for the people in charge. Leave them alone, do what they say. 
passively show up every four or five years, vote for them again, and then leave them alone again. That is what Britishness is. That's what Tom Nairn teaches us about the very political essence of Britishness. And the thing we have to understand about the future of Britain is that it's not future for us. It's not a future where the people have agency. It is a future where we continue passively receiving and then every four or five years endorsing the things the people in charge do. This is not how countries are supposed to work. This is not how modern nations are supposed to function. Now, the word for this is normally republicanism, a sense that people have power, a sense that ordinary people are the real founders of their country. It is what we lack, and we can see how badly we lack this in our two latest attempts to escape it, to escape our fates in Britain. Corbynism, which I enthusiastically supported, I'm still a member of the Labour Party for some reason that escapes even me. And Corbynism was founded again on the idea, the very unpopular idea in Britain, that people should be agents of their own fate, that people should control politics themselves, that should be, they should be active citizens, actively engaged in their political lives. And Corbynism foundered on those rocks of passivity that defend Britain's fortress. So did Scottish independence. And when it came down to it, this great movement of saying, we have the power to change things, came down to it, and other people told us it wouldn't work. Businesses, banks, the Conservatives, the Labour Party told us it wouldn't work, and so the people in Scotland said, well, okay, it probably won't. But they don't have that confidence in their own power. They have to wait for other people to exercise it and then agree with them. That is what the future of Britain looks like, as far as I'm concerned, as far as Tom Nairn was concerned. And the only way we can get out of it is by not just focusing on that one break from the order, this other break from the order, not just Corbynism, not just Scottish nationalism, not just the Preston model. We have to tie these things together because the only way that we'll have that confidence to use popular power, to really have confidence in our own agency, to take action against all those risks that pop up of economic collapse, of letting the Tories back in, of, of you know, losing your pensions or your mortgages. The only way people have confidence to overcome those risks is if they know that other people will act alongside them when they act. And for that, we have to stitch together all these small efforts to break away all over the country, not just in Scotland, in, in the city regions, in Wales, in, in England, in London. We have to work out a way of tying these together so they work in some kind of tandem, so that that agency is truly popular across Britain. And ironically, I think the only future we have outside of Britain requires us acting for once as an actual collective British agency, joining those things together, working through and against those institutions to try and break away. So that's the future of Britain for me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm dinging like a pinball machine with questions for you, but I will suppress that and go to Hillary, because Hillary, I guess you, you take all your answer to the question, how does Tom help us understand the future of the British state? You're sort of contemporary of Tom, in a way. Kind yeah. So sort of give, us your, give us your take. Does this work? Does this work? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, um, I, yeah, I want to start from what Rory and our sort of pre-meeting, um, sort of meeting, um, the planning of this, referred to as the psychedelic Tom. And in particular, um, Tom the Barricades around the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris in 1968, and then joining the occupation of um, the Hornsey Art School where he worked. I want to argue that the spirit of 68, in the sense of a deeply liberating notion of democratic change, continued to be one of Tom's animating beliefs. And in a way, it's that sort of underlying belief in a really... Um, liberating notion of democracy that is my sort of guiding sort of thought that I take from Tom. So that's what I want to follow through. I mean, as a junior member of the sixth generation of 68, a little bit younger than Tom, um, but ageing, and in a way we never thought we'd grow up. And perhaps we, you know, in one sense we haven't grown up no. because we haven't, I mean, growing up was always about accepting or being one of those people that accepted the existing order, being a grown up. You know, I mean, it's this whole phrase, I don't know whether Mandelson used it or Starmer, but, you know, we're, we're, we're grown-ups. So, anyway, I'm pleased not to grow up. Um, but I want to evoke that spirit now, the spirit of um, 68, to identify the allies. I mean, in a way, very much Rory's sort of thinking. The allies um, of that, that, I think, the transformative nationalism that has been emerging here needs. 
um, if the British state is to be no more. Um, and um, Tom summed up the importance of what was born in 68 in a remarkable book that, thanks to George Caravan, I have, and I really recommend. It's like a sort of necessary companion to the breakup of Britain, the beginning of the end, and it's been republished by Verso and is, is quite cheap and small, but every page just, you know, inspires us. Ice cream. Yeah, just inspires us. Uh, as did the first session, by the way. That first session was really good. Um, anyway, so um, I just want to begin with a quote that to me summed up the lesson of 68 that he identified. He, he marked that, that beginning, new beginning, um, as the emergence of a humanity which has rediscovered its true height and image without being driven to this discovery by physical need. Um, a, a new humanity which will never crouch again beneath any fossilized tyranny in the name of order. And it's that, that sense that the crouching must end, which is kind of the theme of what I want to say. Um, so, um, obviously there's no shortage of tyrannies in 1968, East as well as West. But the use of that, the objective fossilized, evokes the entrenched powers of British, the British hereditary uh, rule and the deference it induces. So, also at the same time, Scottish nationalism was already in 67 beginning to disturb the political order of UK with the election of the SNP Winnie Ewing in a by-election for Westminster and the rise of the SNP. So Nairn was increasingly coming to believe that a new form, but a new form of nationalism um, that, that, that was emerging and beginning to discover and testing out the true weight, the true height and image of their humanity. Um, but it would not achieve these heights through the SNP. The inspiration of the barricades pointed to the need for a very different kind of party, a movement party, enabling people to prefigure self-government through their own organisations. Um, this was the promise, but certainly not the reality, of the Scottish Labour Party, which Tom joined and was, was active in. In a way, it was maybe Rory will know more, but it was one of his main sort of engagements with day-to-day -day politics. Um, so maybe this experience led Tom to focus on analysing the enemy in order to think more strategically and identify allies. In particular, he focused his attention on the English, and he saw in the movement of the new left the work of E.P. Thompson and Raymond Williams um, that was mentioned earlier, and the history workshop. Um, he saw this in his history of below. Oh, sorry. He, he saw this in this history um, from below, Sorry, um, he saw in it the, that it fostered a new yeah okay no it's okay <laughs> okay a new political culture and outlook to some extent balancing the simultaneous growth of sectarian Marxism uh, in England and he saw this as being in a way the source of a new kind of collective um, consciousness which uh, in his view. Um, would, emer would produce a national populism distinguishable from the habit of authority and the sink of difference. I love that concept, the sink of difference. Of that. So, so this was important. And then he talked about how this could mobilize, be the basis of a political mobilization, um, a, a, a popular mobilization that, that would be needed for any real political change. Now, I think the political opportunity for such mobilization is, has developed a bit more unevenly than Tom perhaps envisaged, although, as we know, one of Tom's features and absolutely inspiring features was his constant openness and, and curiosity, so that, you know, insofar as he, he didn't take account of something, it, it wasn't due to dogmatism, probably just time. You can't, can't know everything. So for me, in a way, the first opportunity through which that sort of um, spirit of 68 found an open-ended uh, experimental political form was through the Greater London Council. In, and in a way, it was a completely different image of London. I remember I come from Leeds, kind of proudly, although Yorkshire nationalism is a bit kind of, can be a bit right-wing. But, um, you know, that, that notion of London, it was always, I remember, you know, it was always the idea of going up 
to London. And for Christ's sake, London is down, you know. And, and I couldn't understand that. And that was sort of London as the capital, London as the king or the queen or whatever, you know. You go up to the monarch. You know. uh, but, but, but London as, as, a, as an ordinary city to be governed democratically um, was completely different. And in a way, um, County Hall was a kind of mini British state. It was a sort of totally fossilized hierarchy. Um, you know, it was, it was run as a province, you know, an arm of the, of, the, of the imperial state. It didn't have an army of its own, which was a good thing, but it was run on completely hierarchical command and control model, the command and control model of the army. So we were all officers, and in theory, without a principal officer, we could do nothing. I remember my first week, I was wondering, I mean, the building was sort of based on that hierarchy, so there was a, a member's floor, and, you know, you couldn't... I, I remember wandering onto this member's floor because it was rather sort of slightly more attractive, you know, and I wandered up there, and, and, uh, and somebody sort of very tall came up to me and said, you know, have you got... Are you a, prin are you a principal officer? No, what's a principal officer? So, well, you can't come up here without your principal officer. Anyway, so this was what it was like. We broke it down internally and in our relation to the people. Power resources, in effect, sovereignty shared with the people through a variety of social movements. In that sense, we, we completely shook it up. No one crouched anymore. The crouching stopped. Um, but then the chains of the British state closed us down. I remember there was a final party after abolition, and um, we were all on the, on the members' floor. Everybody, cleaners, you know, researchers, organizers, all there, we were, we were celebrating and mourning. And then at midnight, these police came with dogs and literally closed the door with a chain. And that sort of symbolized the notion of the British state finally controlling. And we have to say it also, um, it also illustrated the, the role of the Labour Party as the sort of policeman of the British state. So that Neil Kinnock and so on, they were completely hostile to the GLC. In a way, they prepared the way for abolition. Yeah. Um, so I think in a sense that there's a rediscovery now of the potential resources of the local state without romanticizing Preston or anywhere else. But I think perhaps the most important development we'll hear about later is Jamie Driscoll, the mayor of Tyneside, who um, PC plods Dharma you know, acting on behalf of the British state, blocked from standing for mayor. And, and again, this sign that the crouching is ending, Jamie stood and is standing as an independent candidate for the mayor of Tyneside. And that sort of sense that the PC plod Starmer cannot, he cannot actually repress, you know, the crouching is ending, is evident in all the resignations of the Muslim councillors, you know, resignations all over the place that are not are not just sulking, but are people saying, we know what we're going to do, We've, we believe in self-determination, we'll carry on as councillors or whatever. And I think also another sphere of that kind of refusal to crouch was feminism, which I think Tom would have, you know, would have in discussion, brought into his analysis. But it was a kind of, that the, the importance of feminism in, in refusing to defer to all the institutions of the British state and, 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 and social life, private life. That was a sort of precursor for any wider kind of democratic awakening. And I think Raymond Williams, I do think, you know, the, the dialogue that, that um, was suggested this morning, sorry, I've got to find my quote from him. Um, it's crucial because, yeah, he, um, he talked about that spirit of self-determination. He said in the long revolution, that what he could see, what he was describing, was the rising determination almost everywhere that people should govern themselves. Um, and then he describes that process. And I think the importance of Tom is that he saw the political, the importance of political change for that rising desire for self-determination that we saw in the women's movement uh, and in many other movements, the student movement. So I think that, that, that in a way, I'd say that the, the breakup of Britain and the sort of final political awakening, has, it almost involves the breakup of the Labour Party. I think that the role of the Labour Party as a, 
as a, as a sort of policeman of the British state, has been crucial. Um, and I think that the kind of cooperation that, that both um, Caroline and now Rory and others have been talking about is crucial. And you can't cooperate when you're crouching. In a way, crouching is a very sort of individual kind of sad kind of posture. And so cooperation involves that sort of opening up and the idea of some kind of roadshow. And just to end with a quote from um, Tom's beginning of the end. Uh, well, this is a quote. He quotes the, 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 one of the slogans on the street. I take my desires for reality because I be believe in the reality of my desires. And I think, you know, that in a way, if we believe in the reality of our desires for democracy, this must be the theme of cooperation, collaboration over the coming year. Well, maybe more, but it's going to take some time. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, we're going to come out to questions quite soon, but I just want to take uh, Chair's prerogative and ask a question that is ineluctable to me. I can't deny it. As I understand Tom Nairn's work, and one of the things that's most powerful about it is that he um, legitimates nationalism or legitimates the, the construction of a nationalist project as a way to deal with modern times, as a way to deal with market forces, as a way to deal with geographical challenges. Um, it's, it's a kind of tool for democracy. Um, and I just want, I just, what's just been not missing, but um, maybe not on the forefront is that what Tom's work did was to enable, certainly my reading of Tom over the years, was to enable me as a sort of left progressive person to use the nation and to use the idea, to use the idea of the Janus faced aspect of nationalism where you look to the future by drawing from the past. Um, and so, so what about, are we not talking about, or should we be talking about the fact that we have a polity, we have a parliament that has two is run by two independence-oriented parties that has agendas for um, national self-determination. Um, it has conjunctures that it's looking out for. It isn't, isn't that a part of Tom that legitimates that kind of nationalist project? And isn't that one of his intellectual... Isn't that one of the reasons why we go to him? I mean, I remember reading Tom in the LRB. In fact, that was almost his routine. You would give Tom a subject and he would eventually tell you, by the way, don't forget about small nations as, as motors of change. So do we... It, and, it, and then the, the tricky question from the kind of bottom-up plural sources of change that you two are talking about is that how do they relate to a, a, a putative new state that if it existed would break up the old state? What is that relationship between you know, radical pluralism from below, and the fact that people have na nation-state uh, aspirations for really good progressive reasons. What's the, what, come to that first, Rory, what's the link between the two? I mean, I think one of the things that Nairn really emphasised, and when he talked, about, I mean, he began talking about nationalism, and as you say, legitimising it, initially he was pretty hostile. Yeah, I know. Um, but but, but the by, by the 70s, on, yeah. he's coming around to it, and, and I think towards the, the, the 90s, he's really talking about nationality politics. Please, his, his yeah, please is explain that, that. Is that nas nationalism or, or the politics of national identity has to be normalized to the point where we realize that it's not something that just some people are doing. Absolutely everyone is doing nationalism, except for a small minority of people. Yeah. I mean, anarchists don't do nationalism, no. which <laughs> and although quite a lot of them do it to a surprising degree. But <laughs> generally, when Tom is saying, look, there's some exceptions here, it's, it's the anarchists and so on. But yeah. he says even Trotskyists are doing nationalism in, in Britain because they're kind of saying, well, forget about all that focus on, the, on seizing British state. Yeah. And that's a default identity. His important insight is that all of these people, no matter who they're accusing of doing nationalism, are also doing nationalism. It's just sublimated. And yeah. this is part of his critique of Britishness. It gives you a plausibly deniable nationalism because it is strange. It is a weird kind of nationalism. It doesn't conform with all those other ones which have actually been used to make some progress in the world. Britishness almost uniquely has used nationalism to stop anything from happening ever. And, and I think if there's a, well, at risk of getting anyone to applaud me, I, I do want to say that there's, there's an argument that British nationalism was used in the post-war era to do some good things, so don't get too fond of me. Um, I'm still a member of the Labour Party, you know. Um, and, uh, but I think, I think one of Nairn's points is that, okay, if nationalism is inevitable, 
we need to find a... Uh, he was also conscious of the pitfalls. He said it is morally, humanly ambiguous. And the, the key thing there is that the reason Nairn saw nationalism in Scotland as his kind of breakthrough mm. is because it's a small nation. It's a small nation that, frankly, even if it had a state, couldn't do that much damage with it. Um, there's frankly not enough of us to, to do very much. I mean, we've done a lot of damage in the past. I completely accept well, one that. Well, remove, one could remove damage, though. What's the third rail of Scottish nationalist politics is, is trident removal. Yeah, absolutely. So and there's a geopolitical dimension yeah. to breaking up, breaking free of the British state, and then, but then the consequence of breaking up that imperial self confidence we are on Security Council, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, yeah. is, is properly disruptive. Yeah. And, and the, other, the other key thing about... Scotland for Nairn, especially in his early kind of discovery of, of, of nationalism as a, as a legitimate force, is he becomes very interested in the idea that, that Scottish identity is not that deep rooted. He doesn't see it as this really exclusionary, uh, deeply ethnicized thing. He says almost because Scotland has suffered so much turmoil and upheaval, because it's been stripped of so much of its kind of ancient, you know, falsely medieval national consciousness by industrialization, by petitionists, by empire. Um, it's a very interesting kind of nationalism. It's a nationalism that is lighter, it is more open. Um, and he's, think, he's talking about this in, in the early 1970s. He's talking about what we now describe as Scotland's distinctive variant of civic mm -hmm. nationalism, mm -hmm. which does for a lot of people feel quite open and inclusionary. Um, there's a lot of pitfalls to that. I know it can be reflected in a kind of nihilist smugness. Um, but I think he sees the important thing is if you're going to be nationalist, you need to be conscious of it, and in doing so, you can start to fashion your own nationalism. You can start to think of it in terms of something that is not inevitable, something that you're not delving into your own activism, but you are consciously creating uh, an open national unit that is open to everything, that is creative, and crucially, the nation is a collective form of agency. Well, you are once a member of the National Collective, Rory, so... Thank which you was dedicating that, itself yeah. for creatives for an independent scholar. Yeah, so exactly. You yeah. walk your talk. Did. What do you think about this? Because there's, there's a kind of ethnic, civic, nationalism distinction which, which many of us like to deploy and people like Rory like to deconstruct. Um, but where does, where does that version of nationalism that Tom has sit with what you're talking about, which is, you know, it sounds almost counterintuitive sitting in Edinburgh, but the GLC is a counterforce to the to the pile, the pile of roll across the road. So where does, where does that idea of Tom's idea of nationalism fit with what you're yeah, talking about? Yeah, I think about? I'm trying to sort of argue that actually what is important is this underlying idea of democracy. Yeah. And that's in a way, I, although I very much agree with what Caroline and Clive were talking about in terms of stories and a different narrative about English, English history, um, I think a precondition of almost interest in that is a democratic awakening, uh, so that it's in a way as a result of involvement in the women's movement or through the, a kind of struggle like the GLC or, or, or the Tyneside experience that lead you to think what are the, what are the kind of historical um, narratives and, and, and framework that we can refer to. I mean, and so that in a sense it's, it's those you know, you talked about nationalism in um, Tom's thinking as being a tool, not, not the only tool, and he was never dogmatic. So in a way, all the time as you sort of prepare for this, you kind of imagine a discussion with Tom. And I, I think he, the idea of democratic awakening that then comes up against this, like, you know, the Jesse, we came up against the chains and the police, uh, the implements of abolition. You know, that, and that led to a, amongst most of the people involved, a kind of greater interest in the issue of political reform, constitutional reform. And so it, it doesn't necessarily lead to an English nationalism, but it leads to a, a powerful confidence. It was, you it was talking about the importance of a, a... You can't sort of stop crouching unless you believe in, in something to look to, to, to build, and something out there, something creative. So that confidence is, is often um, rooted in, in a number of, of democratic struggles, not necessarily a national one. Um, I think in the case of, of Scotland and Wales, I think the national one is a kind of framework in which these other forms of democratic expression um, find a, a basis for collaboration. 
And in England, I think it's, I think the kind of movement for political reform, I mean, we saw it with Charter 88, that was a, a movement, a huge movement, the numbers, Anthony will remind us, but it was huge. Uh, and that, it, it, that, that was a kind of expression of all these other kinds of democratic awakenings. So that's why I'd really recommend um, reading the end of the beginning, the beginning of the end, sorry, the beginning of the end, okay. to understand this deeper underlying input, democratic impetus in Tom. Okay, before, before I go to the audience, are you, are you, is, is people have questions, yes? Some nodding in, in the audience, good. Or disagreements, or disagreements. that's so, okay, noted, noted. Um, do, you, do either of you think that that bit of contemporary Scottish nationalist politics that looks to European membership, European Union membership, um, reflect a kind of, well, what's the relationship between Tom Nairn and this kind of politics in the British state? Well, it's, we need some kind of state, you know, and we, and we may as well have another source of security. So the, so the idea that it, it's, it's some, the e EU membership is a kind of replacement for the umbrella of the British state. It's like when people used to say, as I said in my intro, you know, the, the, the 2014 prospectus was independence in the UK as much as, as much as it was independence and anything else. So is there, is there that aspect of Scottish political identity that um, would, it, would it have that level of, irre of irreverence of standing up against, what was the phrase you used? Standing up against tyranny, tyranny or? Oh, indifference. Indi yeah, yeah. Um, is there, a, is, there a, is there a different fuel for Scottish independence that needs to be provided such that you don't just flip from one state to another state in the course of being a wee country that can only do so much? I mean, is there something from below that needs to come to make that a different set of choices? Uh, I mean, I think um, confederalism is essentially the word you're looking for, and, and, a, yeah. and a kind of richer, more philosophically, politically fleshed out idea of confederalism. So um, a, a, an idea of bottom-up sovereignty, which is contingent on everyone being able to realize theirs. So the idea that the state is not the end point of your political identity, yeah. but it is a, a, a part of a wider confederation of identities, all of which are able to secure each other's conditions. I mean, it's, it's, it's Marx's line about the condition for the free development of each being the condition of the free development of all. Um, that idea that, that there are conditions of self-determination. You cannot just self-determine with nothing underneath you. Mm -hmm. And so you need those broader mm -hmm. umbrellas, those broader, you know, being part of a, a wider economic unit is a necessary condition of self-determination. Having the resources that are pooled across borders, uh, having flows of people across borders, um, these are essential conditions of a meaningful, open, creative form of self-determination that cannot end at the nation state. And I think any meaningful Scottish nationalism has to absolutely resist a kind of isol isolationist, um, e even, even if you're critical of the European Union, you have to have an alternative. You have to have some kind of wider territorial configuration that is part of those conditions of self-determination. Yeah. And in my last conversations with Tom, he would, his European context for Scottish progress was very clear in his mind. Um, we have um, uh, 16 minutes left for questions. Could people put their hands up, please? And I'm going to do the same and sort of take uh, female voices first, uh, just right there. If, just right there. Would you put your hand up further, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, two quick questions. One for Rory. Um, so I understand, I understand your point. Um, so even you twice mentioned that you're a Labour Party member, so I'm very intrigued as to where you see the opportunities are within the Labour Party for the kind of arguments about creating a federal, federalist state, for example, or these kind of constitutional changes. And the other one is, um, which I would also, I would have asked a question to Caroline, I think she's back there. But again, Hilary, you've raised this, is this, this question, obviously we can cut off my accent, I have an English background. Um, this notion that you could create something called an English story, or English stories, or English identity, does this mean people who feel English in England, because there are surely lots of people in England who don't, wouldn't identify as being English. And so this, this sort of elision between English and England I find very problematic because 
That's not how we would say it in Scotland. And I think in Scotland, if we started talking about Scottish stories, so this idea of civic nationalism, um, I'm not sure what that would give us as a political message or even to communicate something. I mean, it is, it is as, um, as was said, is that, you, you know, you can be here for three months and you can identify as being Scottish. Not a problem. No one's asking you what your story is about it. So I'm just very intrigued as to what, what's really meant by this, what's the usefulness of trying to identify English, English stories and an English identity. I think that's a great question for both of you, actually. Uh, so do you want to, quick, and then just over to Larry, you go for On the Labour, Labour no, the story question. Oh, the story. And then, and then pick up the Labour one if you want. Um, I think what you need are, uh, you need some kind of carrier for stories. Um, th these, these things have, again, conditions. Um, and, and there is an infrastructure of, of narrative that is absolutely essential to any of this stuff working um, is the media. And, and in order for us to, to reflect those, those uh, to, to you know, appropriate radical English traditions, to, to generate some kind of a democratic identity, wherever in the UK you have it, and there has to be some format for it to take place, be popularized. And what we are really struggling with today across the left is working out how to navigate that in an age of, of, of just kind of total attention economy where you're constantly battling for eyeballs, where it's incredibly fragmenting. Uh, it's very hard to get any kind of single story, even one that contains plural ones. It's incredibly difficult just to cross the boundaries between subcultures in a kind of uh, community where any sort of physical collective infrastructure is competing with a total lack of scarcity. I mean, one of the reasons that you could generate national identity in the past is because everyone was reading the same things. Everyone was watching the same news programs. Uh, and now it's incredibly hard to find that monopoly on communication, which can be highly problematic, um, dict dictatorial, but it also has a huge power for the left to communicate itself in one way, in a way that really gathers people together. And I think overcoming that, I have no idea how to do it. I think it's very, very difficult. It requires some kind of artificial scarcity, that's all I will say. Um, you need to create some kind of sense, find some kind of medium that everyone needs to use the same thing on, yeah, but I don't know how to do that. Uh, yeah, story? the national, maybe, <laughs> yeah. I could come in on stories yeah. before you maybe go back to the Labour Party. Well, you can talk so, to it, because you've written books about what the Labour Party should be like, so you can talk about mm -hmm. that as well. <laughs> um, okay, so on stories, I mean, I, I think uh, that in a way there, one of their importances is they, they help, in, in the case of people in England, it, they, they, Democrats in England, they, they strengthen our independence, our sense of independence and confidence from the existing state. I mean, I'm just reading novels now about the regicides, about the, the killing of the king. And, and they, they kind of, they make you then look at the present Charles and think, hang on, you're a bit lucky to be alive, you know. And, and it sort of, it gives me... Um, you know, a sense of, of confidence that, that somehow the monarch is, is a, a, a you know, rather contingent fact and could be, could be different. And even if it doesn't lead to beheading, it's, you know, that notion of change um, is reinforced by being aware of those stories. So I think the stories are crucial to the, the consciousness, the democratic consciousness, which implies confidence and independence that would lead us to to confront the British state uh, and to be um, to welcome its breakup uh, as a result of struggles that may not be rooted in nationalism, mm -hmm. but end up facing that that fossilized tyranny that we've got to overthrow. We need a considerable degree of confidence, and that includes confronting the Labour Party. You know, because I all I can say about the Labour Party, because I, I yeah I wrote this book, a Tale of Two Parties, and and in Conf in Corbyn we saw that reflected, but we saw which party was dominant, and, and it, I, I sort of stick to my notion of the Labour Party as a, as a police, a policing, a custodian of the British state, and, and Sama particularly as sort of PC plod, and, you know, I, that's all I can say. So, in a way, I look forward to the breakup of the Labour Party, ultimately. Okay. I mean, I have spent many happy hours reading Tom Nairn be completely and beautifully vituperative about the British Labour Party, so... Given it, it looks like they're coming as a result of the sheer uselessness of the incumbents. 
Uh, and given that we've already set out a kind of some of the menu of constitutional changes, you know, confederalism, a kind of new kind of populism, as you talked about, creative populism. But what, what are the prospects for a Brexit legitimating Labour Party, uh, Labour government, it, it's softening on any of these issues at all? I mean, what are the, what are the kind of forces that would change that, do you think? I'm, I mean, I, I despair, but you're in the Labour Party, you tell me. I think if everyone in this room joined the Labour Party, oh. uh, it would it would oh. it would begin to change something. I mean, oh. the thing that happened. Sorry, this is gonna. I'm gonna get kicked out after this. <laughs> the thing that happened after Jeremy Corbyn now. resigned is that all the left left, and then the rest of the people voted for Keir Starmer. I mean, half the left voted for Keir Starmer. I mean, one of the fundamental things about Labour Party members, they need to stop being suckers. Like they need to stop to falling whom? for the to rubbish. Whom? To, to the, the people, I mean, we know that Keir Starmer was carefully cultivated by a, a, a group of you know, people who were actively hostile, who were planning to get rid of the left. And if we just had a slightly better culture in the Labour Party, if people would be conscious of this stuff, Keir Starmer would not have been elected leader. And so a lot of the problems are inside the Labour Party, but it is not helped by people. I mean, the reason I'm still in the Labour Party is because I think this. It is not helped by people leaving when they hate the Labour Party. Part of being in the Labour Party is hating the Labour Party. And if you don't, you're not doing it right. Um, and I think, I mean, I think this is about everything I'm a member of, but I do think it's very important for people to think, we don't have many other options currently. I know that we hate to hear this, but there are two options in Britain for government. Uh, that is one of the reasons the British state is so powerful. And, and the only one that is even slightly open to us is the Labour Party. And if you want anything to happen, you have to be inside it if you want Labour to do anything. You, you, you cannot, I'm sorry. And, and if there's something that's going to shift the Labour Party on these things, it is agitation within the peripheral Labour parties. The Welsh Labour Party is doing some genuinely very interesting work on this stuff. The reason the Scottish Labour Party is not is because within the Welsh Labour Party, there's loads of people who are nationalists. Yes. And in the Scottish Labour Party, all the nationalists have quit. Okay. Oh, I'm quivering. But there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a question over there. The lady, this, this, the lady in the white jumper. Thank you. Uh, Rory... I am not the only person in this room that used to be a Labour Party member, voted and paid her dues. Believe me, there is no question that I or anybody else are going to go back to that corrupt, <laughs> lost party. We may not change the Labour Party from the outside, but what we can do is challenge the Labour Party and keep challenging it. It may not change, but as we challenge it, we will expose its flaws, its failures, and that's how we will change votes in Scotland. And, and just, just to note that one of Tom's, what part of Tom's biography is setting up the Scottish Labour Party with Jim Sellers and I think Neil Ashton, who I believe is in the and, audience. And look what happened well, to them. Just note. No, it's true, but, but I mean, personally, I've been using the tiny sliver of constitutional advance called uh, additional member system to vote SNP Green for all my <laughs> political life. And just eventually we've got there. You know, so, I, so there's, it's just this kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Tom would look upon a Green Social Democrat SNP government and think that's probably a good outcome of certain sets of arguments that say we need a better, we need a better democracy. So they maybe have all gone there. They have, they have, and, and, and for a moment, it made a lot of sense. I mean, the, one of the reasons that the Labour Party has now paid attention, well, tried for a moment to pay attention to Scottish to constitutional change is because the SNP were threatening them. And, and I think there is a dynamic between some kind of confident territorial politics electorally challenging the Labour Party and Labour actually accepting some of this stuff. But at the end of the day, the people who do this stuff, who accept stuff, are in the Labour Party. It was the Labour Party who legislated for devolution, it forced by the pressure of the SNP. So there has to be some kind of dynamic there. It can't just be one side or the other. Please let the next question not be about the Labour Party. Uh, yes, thank you. Rory, can you hear me? Um, you Please. Talk, can you hear me, Kate? Okay? Yes. Um, you're talking about internationalism. Yes, effectively. But that, there's like a hint of patriarchy about it. I think it's outmoded. I think that's, we don't want that in Scotland. We're not interested in uh, kind of 
internationalism. We're not interested in it. We want to go our own way. We don't want to be part of a big umbrella. So what do you actually mean by internationalism? Well, the idea that there are no boundaries and there are no... We're all the one. I'm not, I don't mean that. I'm not, I'm well, that's, the labor, that's a Labour party. I agree, culture, and I think, I think, I think Labour's fantasy that mm -hmm. we should all pretend nationalism is nonsense as soon as it threatens the integrity of Britain, mm -hmm. I think that's outrageous. I do not agree with that at all. Uh, I believe in a confederal Labour party, not an international... Not, well, I believe in an internationalist Labour party. I'm an internationalist, but uh, you know what I mean. Right? Yep, yeah. Yeah. fair enough. <laughs> well, do you want? Do you, um, I mean, uh, you know, to be a nationalist uh, by virtue of being part of the West, the Westphalia nation state system is per force to be an internationalist because I mean, you don't really get recognised as a nation out with these kind of. But is there a, is there a different internationalism? I mean, is there a different internationalism? We've had internationalism since the first, first, second, and fourth internationals. But is there a, is there something that you can perceive maybe amongst young people? Um, which is quite interesting. So that's quite an interesting thing. Do, are they thinking globally, internationally, or are they thinking nationally? And maybe come to you as well about that, actually. Well, I Rodan. can't speak for young people. But, well, just, um, I'm but sure you're running red but, paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're mainly yeah. under 30. So, um, yes, I mean, I think the internationalism that the, the young people that I'm working with recognise is one that's not really about states. It's State. about, it's about um, movements that are not just you know, talk, but movements that are actually sort of winning things or struggling around mm -hmm. issues, whether it's um, precarious labour, um, whether it's racism internationally, whether it, it's, it's those sort of, whether it's feminism trying to create day-to-day -day alternatives. So it's, it's about a, an international um, sort of culture, but a material culture that's yeah. actually building alternative institutions that will require some kind of political expression, but those, that political expression could be municipal, could be national, you know, like Barcelona. I mean, that sort of idea of links between kind of radical cities that are in turn supporting social movements. I think, so I don't think the vision has to be about states, although the whole idea of, which is key to Tom, I think, is of shared sovereignty. I think is important because it completely changes the notion of a state. Yeah, and, and this is a sort of final point, and we were talking about this before on, on our Zoom call, prep Zoom call, that if Tom was a young man or woman, and we'll talk, Tom was a young person in, in your early 20s, mid 20s, and he was standing here right now, and he was wanting to be as, uh, express all his interests, which is in aesthetics and politics and culture, what are the points of light that he would be that you think he would be fastening, fastening on to? I mean, I'm particularly thinking about the demographic differences between younger and older generations around a whole set of questions. But if he was a, and I'm, I'm just asking you to be his rep on earth, just for the, I know, no, no pressure, but what, 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 just, what would you be looking for? Do you, do you, do you, do you um, I, I think, um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a silly question, Pat. but, but no, okay. it's a good, po it's a good populist okay. question, which I'm sure you all want to know the answer so, to. So I, I think he would be highly skeptical of of the obvious fixes. So, right. so his his instinct, you can see very clearly, in his work is to find something that the left is getting excited about, or take as common sense and go, actually, here's what's wrong with it, um, which made him slightly unpopular. Um, but I do think he would be fixating on the things that people are getting interested in, things like the Preston model, things like what Andy Burnham's doing in Manchester, things like maybe the, you know, the deal between Welsh Labour and Plaid Cymru, between the, the s and the Greens, and he would be going, okay, how do we prod the contradictions of these things? How do we, how do we find the, 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 the ways in which these new things, clearly new things, unsettle the whole system? And how do we follow, uh, not, not just the promising things, but follow all the uncertainties that come from that? And, and his main instinct would never have been to like, I can't, I can't pick a particular force or agency that he would have settled on, but he would have said, let's find the things that make everything more uncertain and follow that bravely, fearlessly, mm. into the uncertainties and the contradictions of those things and try and widen those gaps. So wherever uncertainty pops up in the British order, widen it. Don't try and find closure and resolution and, and an easy kind of end to the problem. Try and make it bigger and bigger because that's the only way we get out. We're nearly done. Uh, 
I don't know whether you can make this publicly available, but in one of our earlier discussions, uh, we, we discovered a review that Tom had done of 2001, A Space Odyssey, in the magazine Bananas. So I think we should remember Tom as someone who was a fuel for the Scottish independence movement, a, a deep source and resource, but he's also a world-class, global, restless, cosmopolitan, intellectual, and if we steer ourselves between those two, Scylla and Charybdis, uh, I don't think our end point will be what we don't desire. I think it will be what we do desire. So that's half 12. Could you please give your applause to our participants, please? And thank you for your questions. Hello, folks. Um, my name is Jamie. I'm one of the organizers. We're now going to break for lunch, so if you could be back in the assembly rooms by 1.40, go and get a breath of fresh air or a coffee or a sandwich, and we'll see you in about an hour and a half.
You're all terribly well behaved. Silent. <laughs> can we, I've got the thumbs up for, from, from the folk for the folk at the back so we can start. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to, to uh, after your lunch. I hope, I hope you managed to get a bit of a leg stretch and, and a, a wee wander. Um, my name is Maggie Chapman. I am the Scottish Green MSP for the northeast of Scotland region, and I'm delighted to be chairing this session uh, this afternoon on where next for the SNP after Sturgeon and for Labour and Astama, how, how we see our, our different political futures shaping up. We have four wonderful speakers with us this afternoon, and we, we, we've just had a little bit of a conversation about how we organise this. Um, we, we decided that senior in Scotland are going to be magnanimous and let England go first. <laughs> just, you know, they, they might as well get, get the one opportunity today to do so. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who is Jamie, Dr Jamie Driscoll. Jamie is the independent mayor in the north of Tyne, and importantly, I think, I think uh, we were just having a chat uh, over lunch. He's an independent mayor, and as elected uh, representative and progressive, that's pretty unique. So, you know, we can do it, it is possible, and Jamie's living proof of that. Jamie, over to you. You know, it's not very often in front of an audience who see me on the far right of a panel. <laughs> Democracy is the operating system of our society. We often talk about it in the abstract, but it's the way we make decisions, it's the way we get things done. I'm an engineer by profession, I was also a software developer. And our current version of democracy stops us doing a lot of things. It's the equivalent of a oper computer operating system that won't let you run an ad blocker that just lets everything be commercialized. We actually have the same operating system, more or less, that we had when London was the center of a global empire that spanned a quarter of the earth. And that colonial mindset is deeply embedded in those institutions. And speaking as someone who represents, who's in power in the northeast of England, it feels a little... Uh, please don't take this as any offence, but this audience will probably remember MS-DOS as an operating system. <laughs> well, there's some big fans of it, apparently. And that user interface, you had to know the right codes to be able to get in and do anything. That's why British democracy works at the moment. There's a number of ways you can tackle an upgrade of an operating system when you're designing it. One of them is called bloatware, where you just add on module after module after module. You can do anything to restructure the thing from the start. And that is what happens at the moment. If you think of the Shared Prosperity Fund, which replaced European funding in name only, it's only 60% of the money. Well, that has this system where Whitehall says, you're going to get some money. We're not going to tell you the rule for spending it. Can you work up the programs? We want to spend by the end of this year. We developed our program. We, we hit their deadlines. We had it in July. It was supposed to be spent by the end of March, that financial year. They didn't sign it off to December because the way I did it in power, I said to my team, look, just do something that's good, that works, and I'll stand between you and Whitehall because I guarantee no one else have spent the money anyway, and they'll be glad that something's just happened they've got to point to, which is exactly the way it worked. So to, to finish the tortuous metaphor of operating systems, what we need is open source democracy. That ability for communities, groups, trade unions, businesses, to say, we've got this idea, can we use the existing democratic institutions to help this work. If we do that, we can start to change. The other thing we need to talk about in democracy, though, is what's in scope. It's pantomime season, but frankly, I think if you talk to lobby journalists, it's pantomime season all year round. Who's up? Who's down? Who um, spoke out of turn at an event in Scotland, Clive Lewis? Um, all of that sort of stuff is going to be an issue. And it's a false binary. 
the left, the right, the like to paint it on a spectrum. The big fundamental difference in politics when you talk to people comes down ultimately to one thing when it comes to the administration of public finance. Where do you believe wealth comes from? What do you believe wealth is? There are those who believe that a burgeoning financial sector with rising asset prices is wealth. And then there are those who believe healthy, educated people who feel they have a stake in society where they think the law works for them, people who think that is wealth. And you look at any financial shock, natural disaster through history, the countries that rebound fastest are the ones who've looked after their people, not the ones who've worried about numbers in bank accounts. Since the 2007 crash, we've had a Prime Minister, or around that time, Gordon Brown, a lot of time for Gordon Brown, but Gordon Brown became Prime Minister, unelected by the people, had to resign so he couldn't get a coalition. David Cameron was not elected by the people, he got there through a coalition, and um, he's back again, of course, but he had Brexit referendum resigned. Theresa May, unelected by the people, resigned. Boris Johnson, unelected by the people, convicted, then resigned. <laughs> Theresa May, unelected, uh, Liz Truss, um, that brief acid trip that lasted about seven weeks. Um, Theresa May, unelected, oh. Liz Truss, unelected, disappeared. Yeah, it's hard to tell the difference sometimes. Um, resigned. Rishi Sunak, not even elected by his own party, and if there wasn't a general election coming, you know he would have to resign. Why is it that no one can operate even on their own terms? It's because nobody has addressed the fundamental problems since 2007 that have led to austerity, and it's the belief that GDP is more important than well-being, and that's why nobody can deliver a damn thing that works for the people of our countries. I'll give you two examples of what I've done. Not the job creation, not the opening new railway lines, all the big stuff, which is good. One is the adult education budget. This is training welders and chefs, forklift drivers. I got that devolved in 1st of August 2020. And we spoke to the people who deliver courses. We spoke to local businesses and said, if people have done a course, will you guarantee them an interview at the end of it? They said, yeah, we'd love that. We spoke to the people who'd been on courses, and crucially, the people who dropped out of courses, and said, what with your barriers? It might be, well, I didn't have Wi-Fi at home, or, well, I've got to pick the kids, up, or I've got a zero hours contract, and I don't know what my hours are from one week to the next, so I can't go on them. We have increased the number of courses delivered from 22,000 a year to 35,000 a year on the same budget by running free flexible courses that work around people's actual barriers. You get a 50%, when was the last time you heard any branch of government get a 50% increase in value for money? And we did it by listening to people, by getting them involved. That's what democracy should be. We work with teachers in the classrooms. We funded a project where teachers can actually be protected and have conversations that go as a team and peer review another school in a different area, affluent to deprived areas, urban to rural areas. One teacher said to me, I've refound my teaching mojo. It's about getting rid of public services being seen as league tables and data and moving it back to the people in the front line who deliver them. So let's move on to today's question. What next? Labour are going to win by default next year. That's my opinion. But let's look underneath that. In Tyne and Weir, actual election results since 21, this is pre-party gate, when Tories were polling over 40%, to 23, this year's local elections, in absolute terms, the Labour vote fell by 2%. Fewer people voted Labour this year than in 2021. 40% drop in the Tory vote, so it looks great on the polls, but people are staying at home, or electing independents, or Greens. I mean, I left the Labour Party in disgust at Keir Starmer's remarks that you all drink scotch. <laughs> For comic effect only. Um, but 
if we look at internal democracy in the Labour Party, which uh, will not litigate that, but I think that's a pattern of behaviour. Someone asked me, says, uh, is this um, McCarthyism? And I said, no, in McCarthyism, you've got a public hearing and a chance to refute the charges. <laughs> do voters care about this? Though? Well, actually, some do. You've got to look at Ken Livingstone in 2000. Uh, voters do care about politicians fiddling expenses, politicians stitching things up. They do care about democracy. Why? Because most people understand that it's a pattern of behavior, that behaving in a democratic way is a trait, not a series of isolated incidents, just as bravery or honesty or cowardice or dishonesty are traits. If that is how someone governs now on things that aren't important to the country, that is how they're going to, how are they going to behave when there's important things coming up, which is what we're seeing unfolding in Gaza. A Labour government, sadly, and it's with great regret I say this, is not going to fix the million children in destitution. It's not going to fix the seven million people waiting for an operation in the NHS. It's because they are not going to tackle the thing that needs tackling, which is that the vast majority of our money is part of a wealth extraction model which takes money out to the foreign billionaires on our infrastructure, our utilities, our financial models, our outsourced public services. And until somebody does that, there's never going to be the ability to allocate resources that put education, health, welfare and well-being ahead of the agenda of those who just want to see bank balances rising. Now, what comes after that? That's a discussion for another day. But what's the answer? How do we deal with this? That catch-22 of, well, we need proportional representation, but how do you get proportional representation without proportional representation to vote in the people who want proportional representation? There is an alternative. Local elections. We are seeing more independence, more Greens, more community independence winning across the country. And next May... I'm running again as an independent in the Northeast. And someone asked me, as a journalist asked me, said, Jamie, why are they so terrified of you? Why do they need to block you? I think it's because this is what the journalist says, it wasn't me. I think it's because you've shown there's a different way to run things. And you've shown it works. And one of the things I'm going to do from May next year is bring the entire transport system back under public control with rail, <laughs> buses, metros expanded car club so you can have access to a zero emissions vehicle without needing to own one, bike hire and secure bike parking, free travel for under 18s and massively increase the people using it so that the emissions fall because there's fewer cars on the road. Now you get someone wins in the northeast of England next year who shows that they've rejected the Westminster model but people have voted for it, that's a general election year. What message does that send to our politics? There is a way through. There's always a way through. So let's have a bit more freedom and a bit more democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Jamie. We all forgive you the Scotch comment just, just this once. Just this once. Our next speaker is Francis Foley, who joins us from Compass. Um, Francis is Deputy Director at Compass and has written and spoken extensively on democratic engagement, empowerment, and renewal. So, Francis, welcome and thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here today. So, for those of you who don't know Compass, um, my boss, Neil, sometimes describes it as a mad experiment in being nice. And it's actually turned out some interesting results. So, in 2011, we made the decision to move outside of the Labour Party and open up to people of all parties and none, which has basically turned out uh, with people uh, hating us from every different side. So uh, the SMB think we're Labourites, the Labour Art think we're Greens, the Greens think we're somehow in cahoots with the Lib Dems, and the truth is we're kind of all of those things and none of those things. Um, and to 
pick up really a bit where Jamie left off. I'm going to speak today about three key things. So firstly, I'm going to say what I think democracy in the abstract needs uh, with a little bit of a salute to Tom Nan. Then I'm going to say a specific prescription for maybe what Britain in 2023 needs right now. And spoiler alert for those of you who know what Compass do, it is PR. And then finally, I'm going to say what I think Starmer and the Labour Party more generally could do to embrace and adopt constitutional democracy. So, above all things, I think democracy actually needs space. And to pick up where Clive left off this morning, and at the risk of kind of overextending sort of scatological metaphors, Britain is truly in a constipated state right now. And that basically also means that none of those juices are flowing. Nothing is happening, nothing is moving internally within our body politic. Or if it does, it's only ever convulsions and distortions and contortions. And I'll come on to more of that in a second. What else does democracy need? Well, I think it needs agility and flexibility. I think it needs the courage to kind of innovate and do things differently. And for people to see the broad expanse of things that are possible, like Jamie spoke about. I think it needs feedback loops and responsiveness. I think it needs politicians who kind of feel accountable to people. And as John Goddess likes to say, it, it needs um, people pulling levers with strings actually attached to things. <laughs> Whereas in Westminster, a lot of the time, it is this marionette politics with nothing happening down below. I think to, to kind of pick up on, on the legacy of Tom Nairn, who was obviously a massive fan of Gramsci, and for those of you who know anything about Compass, it would be remiss of me not to mention Gramsci in the first minute of speaking. Um, we have a joke at Compass that everybody has to drink as soon as someone mentions Gramsci, because it's really at the core of everything we do. And there are a lot of often used phrases, phrases about Gram Gramsci, but actually my favourite is that all people are intellectuals, it's just that some people are allowed the function of being an intellectual. And I think we could do well to remember that when we think about democracy, because let's be honest, progressives haven't always got that right. I think a large part of what happened after Brexit was that people lost trust, that progressives saw people as capable, as acting in good faith, and as expressing genuine concerns and genuine desire for power and agency. And PR is the specific prescription for right now. It's not about saying, you know, it will solve all things, it's the land of milk and honey. It's about saying it's a really important tool to crack open a system that's clearly not working. So let's talk a little bit about why I see sort of PR as kind of this first stepping point. Well, you might say here in Scotland, well, we have PR, and of course that is true. But I would say it's only half the battle there. So in 2015, when the SNP had this landmark landslide victory and won 53 out of the 56 seats in Scotland. At the same time, 1.1 million people in the UK voted for the Green Party and 3.8 voted for UKIP. Both of those sets of people got one MP each. I think it's no accident that a year later you saw 17 million people voting for Brexit. And I think that's because when change is blocked, it comes out in another space. It will never be denied, it will only be converted into a new form. And I think, maybe slightly controversially, that the independence referendum and Brexit are actually not so different. different. And I think this is where progressives sometimes have misinterpreted what happened over Brexit. Both were a demand, and in fact, a kind of real call for um, agency, power, and control. And I think we do, could do well to remember that when the right of the media, especially people like Nigel Farage, want to claim that victory for their own. And I think, you know, actually controversially, that PR vote that's happened in, uh, uh, the PR that's uh, benefited Scotland so well hasn't actually been great for the SNP. And maybe we can touch on this later. Because monopolies are never good for power. And I think, in general, we should be thinking about how we break open monopolies and encourage more uses to flow and more light in. So I see PR as the tip of this beer. Um, somehow I can never get around these slightly violent metaphors, but bear with me. Um, we need to sort of crack open that system, and I think that is the biggest thing that we could do at this particular moment. Because the main problem in the UK is, especially for English, nothing ever seems to change. It's not that people don't want change, it's just that nothing ever seems to, and we're told again and again by the elite and the establishment that nothing will, no matter what you do. 
So in some slight controversial uh, way, you know, I voted for Remain, but part of me understood that what Brexit vote was about was, that, you know, people were offered a very blunt instrument, but they used it to great effect to overturn the tables of what the establishment wanted and what they thought was possible. And I think we need to answer that call. Um, one of my favorite journalists, John Harris, said the day after the Brexit referendum that the UK was basically so imbalanced that it had fallen over. And that really stuck in my mind as an image of a body kind of sprawling on the floor, sort of slightly, <laughs> slightly jittering, which is how a lot of people felt, whether they voted leave or remain the day after. So to come on to the prescriptions for this, um, PR is about sort of changing the system and breaking that system open. But I think most important, what Starmer's uh, Labour Party could take on board really strongly is this idea that how, the how of politics is everything. It's not some second order issue, it's not a nice to have. It's actually at the root of everything that politics is about. And so I would say, slightly controversially perhaps, Keir Starmer is actually conforming to the electoral logic of first past the post right now. People like to say, oh, it's because he's nervous, it's because he's a lawyer, it's because he's been captured by the right of the party. All those things may be true. Uh, <laughs> he is the right, potentially, right? But actually, I think a more interesting way to look at it is the structures and systems that incentivize and reward the way that he operates. So first past the post does reward people working at the margins. It rewards the small target strategy. It rewards, you know, as is the famous phrase, carrying that Ming vase over the slippery floor, really desperate not to drop it. And let's not forget these are structural and systemic things which Keir Starmer is operating within. You know, I really wish that he could see that if, he, if the Labour Party in general could break open and break out of this, they might find that there's a, an upswell and a well of confidence there that they tap into. Because recently Keir Starmer talk, started talking a lot about security. I don't know if you've noticed the kind of beautiful, mashed up phrase of securonomics has become very popular. And I think he has put a finger on the bruise there. But what I would say is the answer to security, to, to that insecurity that people feel, is confidence. Now, you don't get confidence by making yourself smaller. As Hilary Wainwright amazingly said earlier, you don't get confidence by crouching. You get confidence by making yourself bigger. And the way to do that is to lean into the logic of progressive alliances, of breadth in politics, of having the debate, and spotting who your key allies are. So, just to close, I would say there's two things that I really want the progressive left, no matter where you live in the UK, to really take on board in relation to democracy. One is that operations and organizing are the key of what we, the, the cornerstone of what we do. You know, I, I love coming to conferences like this. I'm passionate about ideas and I love that to and fro in that discourse. But unless we operationalize those things, unless we plan for power, unless we take organizing seriously, things are not going to change because we have some heady headwind working against us. And that means building institutions, you know, sometimes the boring work of building institutions, which I think you guys in Scotland have done much better than we have in England. Because, as I sometimes say about, you know, we're often, it's a horrible term, but we're often termed on, it comes to be on the soft left. And what I say is like, the soft left needs to learn how to play hardball, you know? We need to put stuff in place that's actually gonna make us powerful and make us hard to ignore. And then, secondly, I would say, that actually you need to give people the experience of a different kind of politics. It's all good to talk about it, but actually it has to feel different. So for me, that starts with PR, it starts with cooperative politics, showing, not telling, a different way of doing things that I think Jamie and Andy Burnham are doing amazingly in their own constituencies. But I also think it goes to things like citizen assemblies, which has been discussed often today, and I've facilitated a lot of citizen assemblies. And the most important thing is that it builds our democratic muscle and our democratic faith in one another, that we see people acting in good interests with a lot of knowledge, with a lot of experience. And I think that's incredibly powerful. And, you know, you have to practice it so people know the difference democracy makes. We know that populism is on the rise and it offers easy answers to difficult questions. But democracy has to feel different to people in order to be something that people value and take seriously. So I'll just close by saying what Compass are doing in the next election, which is against every grain and is, I hope, quite countercultural. So we're often showing up the cracks in this system. We target these monopolies of power. So all parties in the UK operate like monopolies, a lot of them incredibly centralized um, and top-down, with the possible exception of the Greens. Um, 
But we are kind of wrong footing those monopolies by doing grassroots bottom up politics. We have 40 local groups across the UK, and they decide the candidate that they will back at the election. Usually the best place progressive to win, and the candidate that supports systems change, starting with PR. And I think what's interesting about that is, you know, we've done door knocking, where you knock on people's doors and you appear with three traffic light rosettes, and people are just <laughs> completely bamboozled, and that's way into a conversation. Isn't it mad that I open the door with a red rosette on, and immediately you know what to think of me? Immediately you've you know, conjure up some ideas of what you think I am and I'm not. So we're trying to do things a bit different, we're being a bit playful, and we're trying to work around things to show up the way that the system concentrates power. So the final thing I'll, I'll leave you on is this idea of democracy is more than elections, but we have to use elections to sort of revitalize our politics. And if we go right back to the start of like what the body politic might need at the moment, well, I think in the UK, especially in England, it needs a bit of a zhuzh, it needs a bit of like, you know, it needs galvanizing, it needs energizing. And so what we're doing at Compass is trying to build that um, appetite and agency for systems change by confronting the politics of where we are right now. The campaign is called Winners One, which gestures to that unity, but it's often about that agility. And I think the more that we gather in forums like this, the more that we try different things, we could build that capacity that people really need to feel to make democracy at the heart of everything they do. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that, Francis. I think talking about the how of politics is, is so important, and we've had quite a lot of discussions about not only the ideas, but also how to, how to make them a reality. So, so thank you for, for highlighting that. Next up, we've got Joyce McMillan. Joyce won't be a stranger to, to many of you, I'm sure. She's a well-known columnist, theatre critic, and political commentator. I often walk past her. She's very, very studiously focused on the cabaret in the garden lobby in the Scottish Parliament, commenting on, on what she's seen uh, around her that day. And I, I'm always amazed that somebody, usually me or, or somebody else, isn't doing something completely ridiculous in the background of, of the cover. So watch out, watch out when, when, we, when you're getting broadcast from the Scottish Parliament. Look at who's in the background and what they're up to. But Joyce, thank you very much for joining us today. And the podium is yours. Um, well, um, thank you very much uh, to the organisers for, um, for involving me in this, this wonderful project in which I played a, a very small advisory role as, as part of the, the preparation committee. But this has been absolutely marvellous today. Should we give them another round of applause? Because it really is outstanding. Um, I'm also feeling so much as if I'm seeing my life passing before me, not only lots of faces from the campaign um, for a Scottish Parliament back in the, the 1990s, but also lots of ideas from that time about how you revitalise democracy, about what we mean by democracy, about the aspirations we had then um, for trying to use the Parliament or the idea of a new Parliament uh, to build a new democracy um, in Scotland. Um, I remember there, there was a wonderful um, um, pamphlet that, um, published at the time called To Make the Scottish Parliament a Model for 21st Century Democracy. And what we've achieved is not that, but the effort was well worthwhile. And the incremental movement we've made, I think, uh, while we're all very aware of its, its shortcomings and limitations now, I think with hindsight we can see um, that it was a massive step in the context of Britain's very, as everyone has said, constipated um, constitution. So I'm, I'm remembering all of those times and it's been absolutely fantastic. And I'm also remembering another feature of that period, which was Charter 88 um, and the not only UK-wide but islands-wide uh, movement for constitutional change and the fantastic dialogue um, that, that, that we were sometimes able to achieve at that time between all the different parts um, of the UK and Ireland about the kind of democratic future that we wanted. I've always found that the most incredibly fertile and interesting um, debate. And I think, you know, those of you who have heard the contributions from Ireland today and the, the contribution from um, Leanne Woods this morning would agree with that, that there's a terrific synergy and energy there um, about how these islands need to change if only we could find um, ways of animating 
um, and moving that. But to come to the subject of this session, um, the SNP after Nicola Sturgeon um, and Labour under Starmer. It's a huge subject which touches on almost every aspect of politics that any of us cares about um, at the moment, and I will try um, just to highlight a few points about it. Um, one of the things um, that I think we should never forget is the number of similarities between these two parties, even in their current widely different situations. Yes, the NP at the moment is an incumbent party coming, or not perhaps coming to the end, you know, in uh, after um, a long, long period in government and a very um, trying one. Labour is a party which hasn't been in power for the last 13 years, 13 years of Tory misrule. Some of us are sadly old enough to remember that slogan from 1964 when I was 12. Um, but um, 13 years of Tory misrule have certainly taken place and they've left Keir Starmer's Labour, that kind of moderate Labour that doesn't frighten the horses, all the rest of it, um, in a very strong position to win the next UK general election under the first past the post um, system of course. The SNP, on the other hand, um, suffering from the new popularity of Labour, from desperation of Scottish voters to get rid of the Tories and seeing Labour as the fastest um, route to that and all the other um, pressures that we know. Um, so uh, they're very different political situations at the moment, but we should never forget the kind of twins aspect of uh, particularly Labour and the SNP um, in Scotland. These are both broadly, or at least um, nominally, social democratic uh, parties and broadly socially liberal parties. Um, they're striving for social democratic change of a kind that is gradual and not disruptive on the whole, both of them. Um, and uh, neither party is what you would call revolutionary. Neither party is really socialist. Clive Lewis expressed his hope that Labour would be a democratic um, socialist party um, this morning. But really, neither the SNP nor Labour has been socialist in any full sense of the term for a long time. They are aspiring to the kind of social democracy that we see working well in, in many other um, countries of Northern Europe, as Leslie, um, Leslie Riddiff was pointing out. Um, this morning. And when it comes to many, many of the social problems, you know, the chronic social problems, including areas like housing, employment, the possible impact of AI, um, if you look at SNP and Labour positions, they are often very, very similar. Their responses to those problems are often very, very close together indeed. And, you know, um, talking about the, 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 um, the, the small differences idea, it's that, um, it's that um, 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 egoism of small differences, I think, that leads to a lot of the bitterness um, between Labour and the SNP in Scotland. That, of course, and their big disagreement over the Constitution. But nonetheless, it's striking that a lot of the aridity of the current debate, a kind of stalemate that we see in the Scottish Parliament, is to do with the fact that there's, a, there's not, you know, really big policy differences between Labour and the SNP as the two strongest political forces in that Parliament at the moment. What there is, is a lot of personal bitterness and a lot of ad hominem argument and general sort of shrieking about how people are unfit um, to play any part in politics and that is never edifying. Um, I'm leaving the Tories out of this um, discussion at the moment because I think Douglas Ross as still the nominal leader of the opposition in Holyrood is increasingly um, slightly marginalised from the important debate. Um, the differences between Labour and the SNP are also extremely important though. Um, apart from uh, the, the impact of incumbency on the SNP, which of course um, creates its own problems, the SNP for the last 13 years have been effectively through the block grant from Westminster administering austerity imposed first by the Cameron Osborne configuration and then by the, the kind of clown show series of, of conservative governments we've had since David Cameron's re resignation in uh, 2016 and, um, and since, of course, the debacle of Brexit, which has had an extremely negative effect on Scotland as an, an exporting economy, um, which it always was in a slightly, 
slightly statistically greater way in England. So it's, it's, um, it's been a particularly difficult economic time for Scotland, followed by the pandemic, followed by um, the various other stresses that face modern government, the demands of um, trying to uh, meet the challenges of climate change, all of that. The SNP has been dealing with all of that under the pressure of the current Westminster settlement for 16 years, and particularly under Conservative government for the last 13 years with very strict limits on public spending and although it has a little wiggle room in terms of its own tax raising powers obviously it's never popular to use those those too aggressively um, and you're constantly confronted with opposition parties who say you should be spending more money on everything while never seeing um, where you should raise the taxes in order to do that so they're in a difficult position um, they've they've i think handled it um, um, reasonably well. I mean, everyone can argue about how good the SNP's performance in government um, has been, but I think history will see that they handled a difficult situation with some grace and some really important ameliorations um, of the of the really uh, difficult social policies um, that have come from Westminster. And you know, I'm particularly keen on the Scottish Child Payment Initiative, which according to some of the... which according to some of the, the, the really major observers of social trends in the UK is having a game-changing effect on Scotland's position in terms of the amount of poverty and destitution um, that we're seeing in the UK at the moment, which is shameful and which still exists in Scotland and which should not exist anywhere in a country as wealthy as this. But nonetheless, in that kind of way that a devolved government can within an unsatisfactory settlement, the SNP there have made a really major initiative which from day to day, from today to tomorrow, is making real differences, particularly to women trying to bring up families and balance household budgets, sometimes as single mothers, in desperately difficult conditions. Any of us who listen to people in, in those sorts of situations know what a difference it's making. And, you know, these are things which should not be written off just because it's not the revolution and it's not the full achievement of Scottish independence. But the other big difference, of course, um, between... Um, between Labour and the SNP, apart from the whole number of issues that arise from incumbency, is the fundamentally disruptive um, nature of the SNP's central policy. Um, the idea of the SNP is to disrupt this British state, perhaps not in any kind of um, negative way, perhaps in a way that, you know, under the right conditions could be extremely positive for all of the parts of the United Kingdom and for these islands um, generally. But nonetheless, it has pledged itself to a disruption of the British state in a way that distinguishes it fundamentally from the Labour Party and from PC Plod, as Hillary um, um, so memorably described the Labour Party, and particularly the Sarmer Labour Party, as kind of policeman um, of, um, of the current British settlement. The SNP will never be that, and it's interesting actually that at the moment that shows up most clearly, and it has ever since um, um, the SNP took up this position as a sort of social Democratic Party back in the 80s and 90s, it shows up most clearly when it comes to foreign affairs and international matters. I think all of us will remember um, the kind of shock wave of Alex Salman's denunciation of what was going on in the Iraq war when he called it an unpardonable folly and frankly electorally, the SNP never looked back from that moment. It was a view that was shared by so many people in Scotland that it transformed the SNP into the natural party of the Scottish centre-left. And that was a huge achievement. And now, very different situation. Maybe the dimensions are different. Maybe it will not have the same electoral impact. But you can see again that Hamza Yousaf, like no UK politician, is free to say that he supports a ceasefire in Gaza in a way that Keir Starmer clearly doesn't do. So, but the political problem with that, of course, is that if you're a disruptive party which doesn't achieve that disruptive aim, or it looks as if it's going to take a very long time to achieve it, then many of your own supporters who want that and um, passionately and wouldn't be in the party if they didn't, um, um, become extremely frustrated. And that, as we've all observed in recent years, causes splitting, causes, causes um, 
new initiatives like the Alba Party um, causes people, and also causes a kind of culture of complaint against the leadership of the SAP, you know, which is full of sort of comments about people on gravy trains and stuff like that. Oh, actually, if you look at the lifestyles of most SNP politicians, I think there is little evidence that many of them are only in it in order to become um, personally rich. Um, however, those resentments are present and, and they can have a, a, a marginal electoral impact, even if the, the sort of uh, parties like Alba are not particularly popular at the ballot box, they can erode um, um, the, the vote for the SNP in ways that could change Scotland's um, political landscape going forward. And finally, that incumbency situation um, uh, raises questions about policy direction. It, it, after a long period of incumbency, there are bound to be tensions about policy decisions which have been made and about the general direction of the party. And egged on uh, by the right-wing press, who of course um, 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 love people who um, dissent um, from the SNP leadership to the right, there is now a cohort of people both inside and outside the SNP former SNP people and current SNP people who are attempting to push the party to the right, either on social issues or on economic issues or on both, and the SNP faces that difficulty. You know, the constant um, um, negative talk about the alliance with the Green Party, which of course is in realistic terms, almost essential for the future of Scotland that the SNP has very strong and clear uh, green policies, and yet there is constant abuse on the subject of that alliance. Who from? From some in the SNP, from some who have left the SNP, and from some who are, are, are simply opponents of um, any kind of attempt to tackle climate change and don't care what means they use um, to further that reactionary um, policy. So all of this makes it a very important turning point for the SNP. I believe, uh, but this is something we could maybe debate, that if it makes that right turn, ditches the Greens and moves in the kind of Kate Forbesy, Fergus Uni sort of direction, I think that will be electoral suicide. As Tom Nairn would have said, <laughs> for party attempting a really liberal, open, and civic nation-building process, it is absolutely fatal to adopt reactionary policies, either on social matters um, or on economic matters, because it takes away the content that makes um, their project of nation-building worthwhile for people who really care about well-being and who really care about democracy. Now, Nicola Sturgeon's leader of, of, of the SNP, I think, successfully established herself as a leader, however effectual or ineffectual you may assess her as being overall, as a leader who genuinely cared about those issues, issues of well-being, issues of a sustainable future, and maybe to a slightly lesser extent, issues of democracy and empowerment um, of ordinary people. Um, like any party in power, um, um, and the SNP has got internal problems problems now with control freakery and a general kind of uh, bunker mentality, like any party that has been bruised by the British media, both the SNP and Labour are now too frightened um, of the policy of division to allow the kind of freedom of debate that would be healthy within them, but you know, the accusation of division is so fiercely deployed by most of the British media um, against parties that it doesn't like, um, that that fear is perhaps understandable, but still, as several speakers have said today, essential to overcome it in the interests of open and free debate. Um, and I think there's one final point that I'd like to make, that although Labour stands in a strong electoral position at the moment, um, I think the debate over Gaza, which has been mentioned several times today, shows just how close to the surface some of those explosive pressures on the Labour leadership now are. You know, by kind of, in kind of technical terms, Keir Sarma has done a, done a good job in making the Labour Party sort of presentable to the British establishment. You know, they kind of decided that it's time for a change. And you can see the sort of British media establishment, people like that, giving a kind of nod to the Starmer government as, yes, it's time for a wee turn of Labour government. Here you go, Keir, you look like a reliable type, get on with it. Um, and, um, and um, you know, fair enough. 
But I think, and for all of the reasons that we've been discussing today, these explosive questions of disaffection and of people's demand for greater empowerment and of people's demand for a voice for the real diversity of modern British society are bubbling just under the surface of Labour Party now. They have surfaced over the issue of Gaza. And I think if and when um, the Starmer government is elected next year, we will see those pressures emerging in ever more interesting um, and disruptive and potentially creative um, forms. Um, so that's, uh, I think, where we stand at the moment. And um, I'm just looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joyce, for, for that. I think that the, the egoism of small differences point rings very, very true, that the, the, the level of tribalism in, in our politics, I think, is so unhealthy and, and so, so toxic in, in, in so many ways. Um, our final speaker in, in the session is Alan Smith. Alan is a member of the SNP and is the MP for Stirling. He was, the M he was one of the Scotland's MEPs for, for several years, and uh, he, he and I, um, we, we, we ha probably, I won't, I won't share the, the stories from, from some of the campaign trails in 2014 and, and 2019, but, but I, th I think it's fair to say that and, uh, within his role as the a MEP when Brexit happened, I think really um, hit, hit the mark, hit the tone of, of how we were feeling here when, when you said those words, you know, to, to, to Europe, leave a light on so we can find our ways home. So, Alan, over to you. Well, Maggie, thanks, uh, thanks very much uh, for the introduction. Thanks not for sharing the stories of the 2014 and 19 uh, election campaign uh, when Maggie was a fantastic candidate for the Greens for the European Parliament. The SNP, of course, sat with the Greens in the European Parliament, and it was a great shame. Maggie, that you didn't get into Brussels at that occasion. I'm delighted, and I have to say very proud of the SNP Greek cooperation in our national parliament in Scotland. <laughs> so, I, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly here as super sub today. I'm, I'm, I'm channeling my inner Mike Russell for you, uh, and so I'll keep it to a four-hour version uh, of my remarks. Uh, but uh, it, he's been called away to the SNP's National Executive Committee meeting, and I've stepped in, uh, but he does send his best, and he did uh, very much want to be here today. Because I think uh, celebrating Tom Nairn's contribution to Scottish politics and, and indeed UK's politics and Europe politics uh, is, I think, a very salient thing for us to do. But I would take some issue with the, the, the title of today, The Breakup of Britain. I have to say personally, and I have to say in the SNP, the breakup of Britain is not actually what we're about. We're about the independence of Scotland. And, and I think... And in much the same way as the, the, the ceasefire vote that we had down in the House of Commons this week was presented by a UK media of what does that mean for Labour, that wasn't why we were doing it. We were doing it because we think there should be a ceasefire in the Middle East. <laughs> I, I, I'm often struck, uh, since I've been uh, investing the corridors of Westminster, uh, since I was thrown out of my first parliament, and, and, and thanks, Joyce, for your reference to SNP politicians not being too comfortable and on a gravy train. I, I can assure you, having been thrown out of my first parliament, I really am working hard to get thrown out of my second. Uh, so so it, 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 is, it does strike me down the road that I have to say that perspective isn't a synonym for a difference of opinion. We see a lot of this stuff from a different place. And we see the EU referendum in a different context because it was intricately linked to the independence referendum 14, uh, six, eight, 16 months earlier. So in England, the EU referendum is seen as a standalone event. In Scotland, it's seen as an integral part of our national discussion about where Scotland wants to be in the world and where we want power to lie and who we want to work with. So there is a lot of wrinkles to this stuff. And I think the UK and Britain is going to break up. And that is a process that's going to need to be managed. But it's going to break up precisely because of the centripetal and centrifugal forces that Tom Nairn identified many years ago. And they have been accelerated by demographic change, by the, the, the way that our economic situation has altered by COVID, but also by the interplay of the independence referendum from a Scottish perspective and the EU referendum from a UK perspective. And it's worth those of us from SNP, Green independence perspective, to remember that 
The people of Scotland rejected the change proposition twice. In independence, we were offering, in, in the 2014 referendum, we were offering change, and we lost. We had a significant majority, majority uh, we were 55% against, a significant minority in favour, but we still lost the change proposition. And in the 2016 referendum, much as we have a warm, fuzzy feeling about it in the SNP because it endorsed our pro-EU sentiment, the people of Scotland endorsed the status quo. And it was the people of the UK that endorsed change. And I think the interplay of those two psychological aspects of those referendums, the people of the UK by a majority of 52%, and if we want to do it by home nations, it was 2-2, uh, much as that's not the arithmetic situation. They endorsed the change proposition, but they didn't necessarily have a blueprint for what that change was going to be. And the lesson for me out of Brexit is you need to know what you want and you need to have done your homework. And that is where we still have a UK that is negotiating with itself about what its relationship with the EU should be and the wider world. And I'm struck, always struck, because I, to my roots, I'm pragmatic. I want to find solutions. I don't greatly like ideology in my politics. I want to find real world solutions. And when you've lost 4% of your GDP by doing one thing, and I appreciate GDP is not the right measure of stuff. I've been saying that for the best part of 20 years. But if you've just had a hit to your economy by doing one thing, signing up to a trade deal that is going to recover 0.04% of that GDP should not make you giddy with excitement, as it does so many of my Tory colleagues down the road. We need to look at the elephant in the room, and the UK as a whole needs to get real about the fact that geography matters, trade finds the nearest way, and as we've seen in Northern Ireland, as we've seen in Ireland, we need to get real about our relationship with the EU, and I really hope that the UK finds a way back into the EU single market and the customs union at least, and then the political family thereafter. And I can say that hand on heart as a member of the UK-EU Parliamentary Assembly, which oversees the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. I'm the Europe and EU accession spokesperson for the Westminster Group of the SNP down the road. And my job is to work on getting Scotland back into the European Union, but also simultaneously at the same time to work on solutions to have the UK having as close and deep and functional a relationship with the EU as possible. And if people down the road don't believe me in my sincerity of that, it's because I want to see the UK have as deep and close and functional a relationship with the EU as possible because that's where I want Scotland to be and that'll make our proposition easier at Carlisle. And I think the European aspects of the independence proposition are absolutely fundamental. Absolutely fundamental. And in terms of the, the, the title of today, the, the, the SNP after Sturgeon, uh, Nicola was and remains a rock star politician. She's a friend of many of us in the, the party. <laughs> It won't have escaped anybody's notice that it's been a tough time in the SNP lately, and it's been a, a, a personally very difficult time for a lot of us, because the SNP isn't just a political party. I, I, I was speaking to an event in Cumbernauld last night, and, and we're family, a great big dysfunctional family, but we are, we, we are a family, we've got a cause. We're not just about winning seats and taking power and managing well, though all of that is important, all of that is, I think, crucial to delivering independence. But we've got a vision. We've got a cause, and that cause is independence in Europe. And that's where this, this conference is so well-timed that uh, just on Friday, just yesterday, the Scottish Government published Independence in Europe, the, white, the seventh white paper, on how we've done our homework and how we know what we want and how we know what we're going to propose to achieve it. And if you've not read this document, I really would urge you to because it's really fundamental. We have done our homework, we do know what we want, and we're putting that to our friends across the European continent to make clear that, well, yeah, there are still pro-European voices within these islands. And I think that would be good for Scotland. I think that will help deliver electoral success. Uh, support for independence with all the problems that the party's had lately. Support for independence, and we don't have the monopoly on in independence within the SNP, but we are the, the central nervous system to deliver it. And our proposition matters and our partnership with the Greens matters, and other members of the Yes Movement matter as well. But what matters is winning, and support for independence is bumping around 50%, depending upon who you ask, how you ask, when you ask. But support for EU membership at the later poll was 72%. Now, the difference between 50% and 72% is called winning, and, and, and I'm quite in favour of winning. I quite like winning. I don't back losers. And I think with that aspirational vision that the UK is not as good as it gets, that we can have a different economic model, a different social model, a different model of international solidarity. We don't want to be independent, to be separate and apart. 
That's the Brexit Britain. We want to be independent and make our own decisions at home and join with our fellow, uh, fellow colleagues and friends in the wider European continent towards common effort. Because climate change, organised crime, uh, war in various places aren't going to be dealt with by one country, however big or however small. They're going to be dealt with by coalitions. And the EU is solidarity in action. And Scotland's natural place is within that, and I think that's what's going to deliver, in large part for a lot of people, a reason to vote SNP at Westminster election and a reason to vote for independence thereafter. So I'm excited and I don't feel downbeat about the party's prospects. I, I, was, I was late this morning, or this afternoon, because I was out campaigning in Corton, uh, as we always do every Saturday morning. I'm up the best part of 200 doors this morning, actually talking to the people out there in the real world who want some hope, who want to know that politics isn't all about WhatsApp messages and iPads and ferries. It's about bigger stuff than that. It's about dealing with the priority of the people of Scotland. And within the Westminster context, and I'm not, I, I don't know any secrets about our manifesto to tell you, but uh, the SNP in Aberdeen at the last conference we had, we've agreed our strategy to deliver an independence referendum. We've agreed our strategy for the Westminster election. And I think we're going to need the biggest, boldest, and most ambitious aspirational manifesto for a Westminster election the SNP's ever produced. And that's what we're working on. And we're going to obviously have the SNP to become an independent state within the European Union, page, li page one, line one. But we're also going to be looking for the devolution of section 32, the Holyrood Parliament. We're going to be looking for the devolution of employment law to the Scottish Parliament in order to mitigate against the gig economy, trial shifts, precarious employment, the fact that so many people in work are in poverty. We can do this differently, and as we've demonstrated with the child payment, we can do things differently within a devolved context, so let's do that. We're also going to be putting forward ideas about devolving energy to Scotland, because I'm getting emails from pensioners who can see the brazier doing wind farm from their houses, wondering why on earth their electricity bills are going up through the roof. And it's because the UK has delivered a broken energy market. And in Scotland, I think we could do better. We're also going to... We're also going to... Because we're going to need, and we always do need to find oxygen within a UK context in a Westminster campaign, because there will be those who are desperate to present the UK election as who's going to be inhabiting number 10 Downing Street after this election. We're never going to be that. But that's all been a pressure on us. But by saying what we would do with the powers we presently don't have, I think we should nationalise the post office in Scotland. We don't have the power to do that presently. But if you think that's going to happen from a Labour UK administration, do stick around. I've got a bridge to sell you. <laughs> so by demonstrating what we would do with the powers we presently don't have, as well as wanting to get back into the European Union as an independent state, I think we get oxygen in a UK context, we'll hold Labour's feet to the fire in terms of the paucity of their ambition, and we'll thereby demonstrate why an SNP vote at the Westminster election is important. So the party's had its reveals lately, and that's been tough. But it will end, and that will pass. And I think the fundamental issues that are rattling around Scottish politics, which is yes, no to independence, and leave remain still to the EU, we've got the answer. And I think we've got the ball at our feet, and I think the people need hope. And I think to deliver a progressive left-wing agenda within a UK context will be an appealing prospect for a lot of people. And I would slightly disagree. The only thing I would disagree with what Jamie said, that Labour might win by default in the UK. I actually don't think that's a foregone conclusion. I think that's the top end of expectation, I'm afraid. Because this is going to be the dirtiest, grubbiest, nastiest UK campaign you've ever seen. It's going to be about war on woke. It's going to be about gender neutral toilets. It's going to be about little boats. We're going to see a deeply populist Westminster budget shortly, with some deeply retrograde, to my mind, proposals. But they will be popular in parts. And we've got a UK government that is banking on a low turnout, a scanner factor that says you're all the same, I'm not voting, why would I bother? As we've seen this week, there are deep, deep fault lines within the Labour Party. We've been accusing the SNP of wished for Indy. You know, wait till we win independence and then we'll sort that out. And I have to say I don't see much evidence of that in the real world, but it's out there. But the Labour Party can genuinely be accused of wished for government. And I don't think that's going to hold in the ferocity of the Westminster campaign that's coming to us. So I think uh, a hung parliament is a not fantastical proposition. I think the prospect of us having the balance of power is an option. It's a possibility. 
and we'll need to see where the numbers fall, we'll need to see where people vote. I feel very upbeat about our prospects, and I feel very, even more upbeat about the prospects of ultimately independence in Europe. And I think it would be good for progressive politics in the UK as well, because look at the map. If we have an, an Ireland with sovereign within the European Union, Scotland sovereign within the European Union, Northern Ireland in a status that keeps it basically within the EU's ambit, I think that buttresses the UK into the European continent in a significant way that will mitigate against the delusions of separatism and going it alone and exceptionalism that we've seen from elements of the current UK government. And I will work with anybody south of the border towards progressive ends. We're the third biggest bloc in the Westminster Parliament right now. When we were putting the ceasefire vote forward, it was a genuine open offer to come and join us. And the fact that the Labour Party has got itself into a position where it's against a ceasefire at Westminster but will vote for a ceasefire in Holyrood is a matter, I have to say, of deep regret to me. Because I, I, I came from the, a Labour environment, as many of us did when I was at law school. I volunteered for the local Labour MP. It grieves me to see the Labour Party having such a paucity of ambition that it does at the moment. <laughs> which is why I'm a Nat, and which is why I think the SNP can, within a Westminster contest, be that gilding up factor that we want to see. So I'm excited about the prospects, but excited even more about the discussion and the questions and comments that we're going to have this afternoon. So it's great to be with you. I'll be here for the rest of the day. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Alan. I'll, I'll pick you up on, on, your, on your point about pragmatism at, at another point. But, but I think the point you make about cooperation being the way we get things done is something that we maybe don't hear enough about in our, in our politics, so, so thank you for that. We've got some time for questions now. I'll take two or three questions um, initially and then give each of the panelists 10 seconds or so to answer, because I'm feeling generous. You know, We've got some, one right, right in the front here. Uh, thank you very much for all your contributions. It's uh, woken my brain up a little bit more on Saturday afternoon. Um, I have a very simple question. What are your views of compulsory voting? Thank you for that. I'll take another couple of questions at this, towards the end of the front row. Right, thank you very much for stimulating uh, contributions. I just wanted to ask, pick up Jamie's point about um, the operating system, open service, open service democracy, and how do we persuade L Labour, if it gets into government, to be um, to make democratic participation, to make uh, the the ruling theme of it the way it works, the way that Mrs. Thatcher said, the solution to everything is the market. So let people power be the solution of a. Of a the next government. How do we persuade them to do that? Thanks for that question. We've got a question over, over there. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, I guess my question picks up a bit on Jamie and Francis's intervention, which is around some of the dynamics of Starmer and authoritarianism. And, and one thing that I thought was a bit absent, uh, was touched on by Jamie, but kind of absent more generally from the discussion was um, in relationship to Starmer's really, really problematic politics around race and racism. And I was wondering if you could kind of um, talk about that a little bit and the implications of what that might be like in a kind of Starmer government. And in relationship to that, I just want to also really contest Francis's kind of whitewashing of the Brexit referendum. I think it's really dangerous on the left to talk about that as if racism wasn't a really constitutive aspect of that. And I think it'd be useful to have a bit more reflections on that because I think that's had, it's, it's impossible to, to kind of understand the kind of depth of kind of authoritarianism I think that we're facing without understanding the kind of role that racism has played in that referendum. Okay. Th thank you. I will take those three questions because that last one was kind of two, two in one. Sneaky. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll let the panel answer, if, if you can be brief, and then we can go back to, to the audience again. Uh, Francis, I'll start with you, and we'll just work our way along. Yeah. Cool. I'll take the last one first. And just to be really clear, um, my attempt wasn't at all to whitewash. I was trying to say that 
I think, in fact, I think to your exact point, I mean, of course, racism, racism was part of it. That was, I mean, clear to anybody who's paying half and high. And everything that Clive said earlier about having to, a moment of reckoning and things is really important. What I would just add, what I was trying to bring across was like 17.5 million people or whoever, like the point I get wrong sometimes, but they didn't just vote because they're all bigoted racists, right? And we, we heard a lot of that in the aftermath. And I actually thought, you know, I saw this post on Facebook the next day, and of course it was the, you know, the post on Facebook the next day, right? And so it was very emotive. But one of my friends had said something like, I didn't think that 17 million people in the country were fascists. And I thought, the only people who are going to benefit from that are the far right, because they look around and think, okay, well, yeah, all of those people who voted were with me. And I was like, well, no, hang on. Let's just really understand what happened there. And I think... You know, we were having some conversations last night um, over dinner about the complexities of those votes, like what people were actually saying in it. And the point is, right-wing media will always play back that people were bigoted and racist because that's what they want other people to believe. They want that block to feel bigger than it is, right? And all I'm asking is, you know, I come from Oldham, which voted 70% to leave. I know people of many different racial and ethnic backgrounds who voted to leave there. They had complicated and often very nuanced reasons for why they voted the way that they did. I'm just asking progressives to go out and do the work, right? Ask the questions, right? Really, really work it out. And of course, contest racism wherever we can, but build that confidence amongst progressives to do that through a sort of reciprocal listening campaign, which I think still needs to keep going, given that it's even seven years afterwards. Um, just to pick up a couple of different like, the good questions. Great question about compulsory voting. I, I think uh, the problem is I think a lot of people in this country understand their votes don't count. You know, 70% of votes don't count. You might as well put your vote through a shredder in a lot of you know, places. And I think we, we do wrong the kind of force. I, I would rather, rather than forcing the argument, I would rather make it actually, you know, people know what's in their right interests. And if they thought their vote actually counted, they would probably go out and do that in high numbers, right? In countries with proportional voting systems, generally the turnout is much higher. It is in Scotland as well. And also goes back to the question about doing the work. Make people feel that they're part of it, that, that, that is not just a kind of mark on the ballot box, but it's something much deeper and bigger. And if people, if it's just a tick box exercise, people understand that as democracy. And I still think we've got a lot of work to do to say democracy is more about, more than about representation, it's more than about elections. And I think Scotland are much further along the path than we are about that. Um, and just finally, um, on Titus's really good question about uh, democracy being the solution to everything. Like, give more people the experience, right? In, in Canada, one in seven people have been asked to take part in citizen assembly. That's a pretty incredible figure, right, for a country of sort of 20 million people. And because they've been asked, they've had to sit up and think, well, I could, could be me, right? Big lotto sign. It could be you, right? You could be called on to participate. And I think we need that culture of participation because, you know, that expectation yields more interest, more engagement, and ultimately maybe answer some of that. Great. Thanks. Francis. Thanks. Um, yeah, um, um, well, I, I, I don't think I've actually got much to add on the subject of race, in, particularly in the politics of Brexit. It was clearly there. It's not the whole explanation. I suppose all I would say is that when you look back on this period of history, we will be shocked by the extent to which the most florid um, um, aspects of Eukenia, if you like, um, you know, the, the, the sort of imperial dreaming, <coughs> sorry, the negative, uh, um, the imperial dreaming, the negative attitudes to foreigners, the exceptionalism and so on, um, the extent to which our government, our governing party came to be in the grip of that kind of ideology and how much that ideology was enabled and furthered um, through our media. Uh, during this time, even though perhaps it was never originally held by that many um, uh, British people, uh, will become a subject of historical comment, I would say. I, I think you know, we have to occasionally remind ourselves in terms of the present Conservative government just how bad things have got in terms of that debate. Um, in terms of uh, Labour making, putting democratic participation at the centre of everything, well, I feel as if we've got a bit of previous on this in Scotland. Um, back in the days of the Labour Lib Dem coalition at Holyrood, um, um, after all the um, civic agitation and campaigning and work, really hard work, most of it completely unpaid, uh, that went into the, um, into the setting up of the Scottish Parliament, I remember uh, sitting there and being told by a couple of um, of, of, of Labour ministers in one of the early Scottish governments and their civil servants um, that they were going to cut off the money 
to the Scottish uh, Civic Assembly because it wasn't needed anymore now that we had a parliament. So I think we should never underestimate the desire of professional politicians once they get into office to kind of shut up um, any kind of competition um, that is coming up um, from the grassroots. It's a characteristic of all parties, I would say. Um, back in uh, uh, 2019, just before the lockdowns, I had a kind of wonderful um, um, 20 years on reunion with some of the people that I worked with on the, ca on the um, committee that advised um, the, the then Scottish office, um, Henry McLeish and so on, on the setting up of the Scottish Parliament, sort of veterans of the, the movement for a Scottish Parliament. And we got together to, to give a kind of a report card um, to the Scottish Parliament. And one of the things that we regretted most deeply was the failure of successive Scottish governments to reform local government and to really um, re-empower and reform and in the ways that Leslie Riddick has been campaigning for for years, really strengthen the role of grassroots local democracy in Scotland. Um, any, any student of democracy in Europe knows that local democracy is the basic building block. If people don't believe in democracy at the local level, then they're not going to have the confidence to be terrific democratic citizens at national level. So, you know, I think all political parties, including the SNP, um, all political parties in power are difficult to persuade on the subject of mass democratic um, participation. Um, but, you know, I wish all the best, genuinely, to all those grassroots activists across the UK who, if we get a Labour government will be trying to push them in that direction. Finally, compulsory voting, not a fan really. Um, it's a, a bit of a, a sort of um, intrusion into people's freedom to, 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 to tell them all to get lost. But um, um, I do think that what we do need urgently in the UK, and I'm pretty shocked that it really hasn't happened up to now, is some kind of debate about how different voting systems across the different assemblies in the UK and in local government in the UK now are working what they have achieved and what they haven't achieved. Idealising PR as the answer to everything gets us nowhere, but I don't think anyone in Scotland, or very few people in Scotland, would now want to go back to first past the post. So, you know, there's a huge debate to be had there, and it's not being had, and so much experience in Wales, in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, and in local government. Thank you, Joyce. Adam. Still working? There we go. I uh, can rattle through very quickly. On, on compulsory voting, I, I would tend against it because I think it's basically illiberal. Uh, if people are not enthused to vote, I think there's, we need to tackle the reasons for that. And that feeds into points about citizen assemblies and people power. If we're in a representative democracy, it's quite important to make sure that the democracy represents the people. And it doesn't at the moment. In, a, in, in the, w the Westminster context, which is why the SNP's policy is STVPR for all levels of government. Uh, when we were still part of the EU, we had four different electoral systems for the four different levels of government that we had, and that needs to be remedied. And uh, the countries that do have compulsory voting, I think people tend to register protest votes, they tend to vote for populist parties. Uh, we see that particularly in Australia and Belgium. Uh, so I'd, I'd, I would it would tend on how do, we, how do we make democracy more appealing and more representative than make it compulsory to participate in a broken system. Uh, the, the point about racism and Brexit, and I, I, I spent a lot of time pre and post the 2016 referendum reaching out to people who voted remain, but also those who voted leave. And, and the racism was part of it, the xenophobia was part of it. I don't think it was the driving factor for the vast majority of people who voted leave. I think the people who voted leave were endorsing the change proposition. And we saw this, in the, you might remember, in the last few days of the voter registration period in the 2016 referendum, the, voter, the deadline was extended a few days because so many people were signing up to take part in the referendum. And David Cameron, what, whatever happened to him, uh, derping that uh, this is a fantastic thing that proves it's going to be a success where those of us who lived through the independence referendum you don't check out of the democratic system for 40 years and then check back in to endorse status quo. So, so all of those people were checking back in to vote leave because for the first time, particularly in England where so many votes are perceived as wasted, quite rightly, I have to say, their vote mattered for the first time ever. So where does that disappointment now go? And, and that, that keeps me awake at night, I don't mind admitting that there, 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 was, a, there was a cry for change that hasn't been delivered. And, and that's where I think reform of the electoral system, getting rid of the House of Lords, uh, all, all of that stuff 
is all the more important because people feel rightly cynical. I think that's enough for me. Thanks, Alan. And Jamie. Hi. Yeah. The, well, let's do this in order. Um, the Brexit referendum, my experience of talking to people, overwhelmingly was the reason those people who voted for Brexit did so is because they thought, no one is listening to me, I want to teach you a lesson. That was the overwhelming feeling. Um, and I, I can't remember how many doors I knocked on. Only once do I remember talking to someone who I considered overtly racist. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they didn't think of themselves as racist. But the question was also, was how does um, Sakia view this? Um, I have no privileged insight into another person's mind, but I think, for him, racism is a second-order issue, and I think his politics, he's essentially a Rawlsian liberal. He believes that, well, look, everybody has an equal chance in life, and if we can get there, then that works. And if you're someone who's ended up as the director of public prosecutions um, and knighted, you think, yeah, that's a wonderful model. That's a failure to understand what racism is and how it affects people. And to give you an example, um, there are, I know of complaints who've gone in, uh, in the Labour Party, and um, if they're to do with anti-Semitism, quite rightly, they are dealt with seriously, but if they're to do with Islamophobia, they get brushed aside. And if it's to do with anti-Gypsy traveller Roma racism, they're not even taken seriously. And I think some of that is a look at the polls and think, oh, well, that's actually quite popular. We'll not stamp down on that. Um, and that really worries me because that said, there are certain things which should be fundamental on a moral basis and not simply how can we play this to get an electoral advantage. <laughs> The question, um, how do we manage to change anything uh, on a big basis, um, particularly in the Labour Party, um, how about mass hypnosis? <laughs> um, I've run Citizens Assembly on Climate Change and we uh, have implemented the results. Um, after May, fingers crossed, I'm re-elected, um, we'll hold a Citizens Assembly on Transport to directly involve people in those tricky payoff choices, which you have to do, prioritization of road space, how you want to uh, allocate fare, and who pays for things. Um, let's get the people directly involved in that. That works better. It's also, by the way, as a politician, it's great because you can say, hey, look, this is what people said. <laughs> you don't blame me for it. Um, but then, actually, Joyce mentioned something. She was saying that Hamza Youssef's the one politician um, who, as a national party, obviously mayors have, I have, um, Andy Byrne has, Sadiq Khan have all called for ceasefires. Um, but can I just say that Keir Starmer is free to say he supports a ceasefire any time he wants. <laughs> He's the leader of the opposition. It's up to him. He doesn't have to just fight to anyone. If it's the right thing to do, he should do it. Um, and on compulsory voting... Anyone who's been around politics, when I was in the Labour Party, uh, I went to so many CRP meetings where, where nobody turned up. But as soon as there's a contested vote, the room's packed, isn't it? People will turn up to vote if they think their vote counts, if they think it matters, if they think it's close. Part of that is changing away from safe seats and marginal seats. That's an issue of the voting system, a big advocate of PR. PR doesn't get there enough. It's what powers, at what level, if you give powers significantly to local government, people will vote more in local government. If they think, well, it doesn't matter what happens, central government control the purse strings, it's just about emptying the bins, they're not going to turn up and vote. If you give them some significant power, they will turn up to vote. And um, by the way, that would significantly help our electoral system because do you see a great deal of talent on the Tory front bench? How much talent do you see on the Labour front bench? Now, the job I do, I actually run a region of England in one sense. Um, and it's incredibly difficult work. I have the advantage that I was 48 before I was a politician. I ran a business. I have a degree with a very strong mathematical basis as an engineer. Um, and if you've come through, you can have great ideals and great strength of will. 
but you can very easily find it hard to administer. You need people a chance to have had cut their teeth if they're going to be good, effective politicians, pragmatic politicians, able to get things done. And we need a far more plural source of power so people can actually be judged on their track records and not judged on, on how well they perform in the media. And the reason I think um, I'm not a massive fan of compulsory voting is for all those reasons, but also as a politician who spent there enough time looking at the rejected balance, um, I think we would just see an awful lot more penises written on ballot papers. <laughs> Thanks very much for that, Tony. I think that's probably a good place to end the session. <laughs> can, can I just say thank you once again to Francis, Joyce, Alan, and Jamie for that really inspiring uh, discussion. We could have gone on all afternoon. And I'll invite Peter to tell us about what's happening next. It's the moment you've all been waiting for. It's uh, James Robertson uh, with the census. Yeah. Yeah, just a wee bit of context about this. Um, during the dinner break, I was handed this piece of paper by a journalist who worked for one of the Sunday papers, and this is an exclusive. And it's going to be in, I can't say which paper, that would be giving too much away, but it's going to be in the paper tomorrow. Uh, you'll remember that the Scottish Government delayed uh, carrying out the census during the COVID uh, emergency by a year, uh, for reasons best known to them, but um, anyway, they did it. And so it's been taking a wee bit of time to get some of the information through from the census, but this is a story that's going to run in one of the Sunday papers, I believe, although you never know, it might get spiked, so you might not hear it anywhere else than here. So I'm just going to read exactly what the story is supposed to be tomorrow. A substantial majority of Scots, it has emerged, speak a language about which questions were asked for the first time ever in the most recent national census. Figures released today reveal that 4.48 million people, or 84% of the Scottish population, talk fish. <laughs> Some, most, or all of the time. This means that pish is second only to English in terms of common usage. <laughs> a spokesman for the General Register Office for Scotland said that it was important to qualify this headline figure as some significant statistical discrepancies underlay it. For example, while 76% of people over the age of 16 said that they could talk or write pish fluently, and 65% said that they could immediately identify Pish when they heard it. A mere 21% admitted to being able to understand Pish spoken or written by others. <laughs> the council areas with the highest proportions of people who talk Pish were the cities of Aberdeen, Dundee, Edinburgh and Glasgow. <laughs> Rural areas had the lowest proportions of talkers of Pish. But this might be due, the spokesman said, to greater distances between inhabitants <laughs> and high levels of taciturnity among farmers. <laughs> Professor Ranald Fowlis Wester, director of the Institute for Talking Pish, commented, I have been talking pish all my life. <laughs> and it is gratifying to see firm evidence of what I've suspected all along that I am not alone. <laughs> Indeed, it is clear that most of my fellow citizens talk pish to a greater or lesser extent. I call on the Scottish Government to give pish official status, <laughs> to legislate for the teaching of pish in our schools, colleges and universities, and to oblige the BBC to broadcast pish. <laughs> At least at least six hours per day. It's already been done. The Tory MSP Findo Gasket said, these figures are deeply disturbing and no credence should be placed in them. If concessions are made to talkers of pish, the floodgates will open and we will have talkers of shite, bollocks, <laughs> and mints, all clamouring for equal representation. I talk mints all the time, but I don't expect anyone to take me seriously. 
No Scottish Government Minister was available for comment in any language. And I regret to inform you that that's taken up most of your break. Um, so uh, just, just uh, for clarity again, uh, the uh, next plenary in this room uh, will be uh, uh, Can Britain Recover? Can England Recover from Great Britain? Uh, with Moya Luthien McLean, Alan Little, Hardeep Matthew, uh, Richard Wynne Jones, and chaired by uh, Andy Barnett. Uh, there is a uh, breakout on Tom Nairn and the monarchy with Scott Hames, Ray Burnett, Leslie Orr and Will Storer and that is in the uh, west uh, drawing room, so the one on the Glasgow side, so Glasgow for the monarchy. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the other breakout is international relations and nationalism in the 20th century with Jen Stout, Myrto Satsika and Henry Porter and that's in the west uh, or the east uh, drawing room. I'm tripping over myself but I hope you enjoy that and I suggest we, we push back 10 minutes so those will start at 25 past. Thank you.
uh, uh, important and significant panel. Um, and we'll, I guess to introduce the speakers very briefly, uh, Alan Little needs no introduction. Um, uh, Hardy Mathau. Mathar, sorry, this is, I've been corrected, this is fatal to correct me, is the editor of Byline Times, and if you don't subscribe to it, it's a monthly paper edition, as well as a daily online, you should be doing so. It is the paper, the current paper, of expressing the future, of delivering truth, uh, uh, certainly to England, and we hope to the UK, and then perhaps to Europe. Um, and, and um, I don't want to get out your name wrong. Harder. It's Moya Lothian McLean. A rising star uh, and, and presenter for Navarra Media, a columnist. And Richard Wynne Jones, um, who is one of the leading scholars of England and Englishness, uh, and is to be congratulated for your patience uh, in being able to deliver to us. Uh, this strange and uh, peculiar thing. And um, we're all going, what we're the plan is, I'm going to ask everybody to speak from the lectern for about five to seven minutes to keep it short, then to have a discussion within the panel, and then to put it out to questions. Uh, and I'd just like to start, I was thinking about how to present this last night, um, and I haven't warned the speakers of this, but I just want to exploit my chairman's role to put the question uh, in as focused a way as possible. I came up here in, in 2014 to campaign for the, to, uh, on the day of the, um, the referendum with Adam Ramsey, and I canvassed for it. And that vote, if that vote has succeeded, it was an attempt to, uh, uh, to it, was, it was pitched against the Anglo-British state. Um, and that's a strange thing because uh, the independence that was asked for, there was going to be a shared crown, there was going to be a shared currency, and there was a single market that was shared. So what, are the, what was the difference? One of the expressions of, that, of the difference that would have resulted from independence would have been that in the European Union, the seats of the European Union, there would have been Scotland, and sitting next to Scotland, there would have been England. And that England would have been diminished by the loss of the referendum vote. Now, if you fast forward and imagine what it's like now, since then we've had Brexit. Brexit is not, as famously said about Welsh independence, is not an event, it's a process. And actually it's only just beginning and it's going to get worse and worse. We're caught in the Brexit of vortex. And Scottish independence in this context means, as we've just been hearing from Alan Smith, rejoining the European Union. It means Scotland becoming part of the European Union. And at that point, there's a very interesting question comes up. Because why was Brexit won? It was because of, we heard in this brilliant stellar first panel of the importance of narratives. The Brexiteers had a narrative for England which is about being Great Britain. And the Remainers, led by Cameron, Blair, and so on, didn't really, they were shifty. They didn't have a narrative. They didn't have an alternative story. Here in Scotland, you have an alternative story. So if we, if we move fast forward, if you imagine, we have the second referendum, Scotland storms back with 70% support into the European Union. What then happens next? Well, in my, in my book, what will happen is that England, now, now it has lost that narrative of Great Britain, will or should, as Caroline Lucas sort of, uh, uh, sort of set out for us in a very imaginative way in the, at the beginning, um, will be able to go back into the European Union. And that England, in that context, will have been in again. We will have grown that England will not be suffering loss, it will be suffering a positivity. So the question of can England recover from Great Britain is can we help, including you in Scotland, England, to shed one story for another? And that is the question that I would like the panel to address. Alan. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me here. It's a great uh, treat to be part of this. Um, let me start by declaring um, an interest. I moved to England shortly after university here in Edinburgh and growing up in Scotland, and uh, England was my home for much of my adult life. And everything I'm going to say about England in the next few minutes, I say out of affection and admiration for a country in which I was very happy, in which I came to love. Uh, we paid tribute to Tom Nairn for obvious reasons. There's one other voice I'd like to mention who was very influential in my young life when I was trying to establish myself as a journalist, and that's the great Neil Asherson. <laughs> Neil's writing was, for me as a young journalist, uh, some kind of guiding light because I think he gave me permission to be Scottish and internationalist at the same time. And um, I think all of us owe him a debt. Uh, and I never felt more Scottish than when I got off the train in King's Cross uh, and started my life in England. Um, so there are certain constants, I think. I've been discussing the UK constitution in England with English friends for nearly 40 years. And there are certain constants that I would like to um, share with you. One is that for the 45 years of my adult lifetime, it has been events in England and choices made by the electorate in England that have propelled the United Kingdom closer to dissolution than it's been since the mid-18th century. And I think of the 80s and 90s in particular. I moved to England in the 1980s from Glasgow. I ended up living on the south coast of England and witnessing this explosive economic regeneration along the south coast of England, the big industries were dying, but the people who worked in those big industries were using redundancy payments to start their own companies because the economic opportunities were there and they had not been there in the Glasgow that I had left and the, the contrast made a very strong impression on me. Um, so in the 1980s, England, somebody said in the previous uh, plenary that uh, the Brexit vote was a frustration that nothing changes. Well, for, for the first 20 years of my adult life, everything was changing. And an English electorate was, vote, it was voting enthusiastically for radical change for the vision of future offered by Margaret Thatcher. Scotland was voting in ever greater numbers to hold on to what was best of the post-war settlement, the Atlee settlement. And we could see, we it was very clear that the two countries were diverging very strongly in their sense of the kind of societies they wanted to be. So that's the first constant, it seems to me, that this change in England that has um, pushed the divergence in national visions. Another constant is how little this is understood in England, and especially in Westminster, Whitehall, and the traditional London, UK, London-based UK media. The former senior civil servant, Kieran Martin, who some of you will remember as the author of the Edinburgh Agreement in 2013, uh, that agreement between David Cameron and Alex Salmond to set the ground rules for the independence referendum. Uh, he worked for David Cameron in the cabinet office, and he no longer does, he's now an academic. But um, uh, he told me that he, like me, asks his colleagues and former colleagues in London, why? Why is it that the union is such a good thing? But it's, you take it for granted that it's such a good thing. And I encountered this as well. That, um, in 2014, colleagues in London would say to me, it's looking close, isn't it? Are you worried that yes might win? And I would say, no. <laughs> and they would say, what, you're not worried? Or you don't think yes will win? And I said, well, I'm impartial, so of course I'm not going to... Uh, and the, the most offensive thing really was the assumption of consensus, the assumption that because I was one of them, I must share their, their view that the, the union is unambiguously a good thing. And Kieran Martin says he asks his colleagues, why? Why is the union unambiguously a good thing? And the answer they give him, he told me, was, well, it's obvious, isn't it? And he says, no, it's not obvious. Can you help me? Can you define it, please? And he says they never can. And that seems to me, to those who want to see the union survive, the most corrosive thing, the lack of a strong, convincing, persuasive narrative that all the peoples of these islands can, can, can join with. Um, this is a long pedigree. My old friend Owen Dudley Edwards, who I see here, told me once uh, that the young, the young Queen Victoria, uh, when she first expressed an interest in her Scottish ancestry, was told by Lord Milburn. It's very straightforward, ma'am. They were all called James, they were all murdered. 
So what I hear in London when I try to engage on this question on the future of the Union, principally is boredom and irritation, a desire for Scotland to stop whinging, Scottish aspirations and ambitions being dismissed as grievant culture. This is the thing that is prim primarily my experience over 40 years, but there's something on top of boredom and irritation, and that is a pr profound sense of hurt. The project of Scottish independence is often characterized as a divorce. After decades of discussing it with friends in London, I reached for a different metaphor, partly in jest, but you'll understand what I'm saying, and it's that of an adult child announcing to its overprotective parents that it wants to move out of the family home and get a place of its own. So the, the, there are four phases to the reaction. Phase one, incredulity and ridicule. Don't be daft, you'd never survive. Where would you get your meals from? Who'd do your washing? Phase two, hurt. How can you treat us like this? Especially after all we've done for you. <laughs> Phase three, petulance. Go, go, off you go. We don't care. Subtext, you'll soon come running back. And phase four, which I've yet to come across, is reconciliation and acceptance. Please understand that I'm not making a case for Scottish independence. I'm not, I've never argued publicly for it or against it. But I'm trying to impart something about my experience of the condition of English thought on the matter of the Union. I used to live in Russia. I lived in Paris. I've done a lot of work in Turkey. So I've been interested in how former imperial powers accommodate themselves to ordinary nation statehood. And it seems to me that the matter at the heart of this question is how England does that. In 2014, when I was covering the independence referendum, a friend in London who presents a radio program, or did at that time, stopped me in the street and asked me how it was going. And he too said, you know, are you worried? Is it going to be yes? And I was very um, neutral. And he said, um, it was, he said, uh, he said, my show goes to the Edinburgh Festival every year for a week and we present from there. We'd have to stop doing that. <laughs> and I said, why? It would still be the biggest international arts festival in the world. It would still be on your doorstep. Why would you have to stop? And he said, well, we just would. <laughs> so I saw this again and again in my friend in London. They felt the idea of Scottish independence as something personal. They felt the losing Scotland, as they put it, would in some way diminish them personally. And, but there is another way. There was once a Dutch empire in 1958 the Guardian's international editor, Anthony Hartley, visited Amsterdam, and he was impressed by the quiet confidence of the people there. This is what he wrote. They have learned to live in Europe as mere Europeans, mere Europeans. <laughs> and let's make no mistake, that is the way we ourselves and every other ex-colonial power will have to live in the not-so-distant future. The Dutch had given up an imperial delusion, given up any sense that they had a civilizing nation in the world, had somehow downsized their sense of who they were to a European scale. He said, the first, he, he said he contrasted this with post Suez Britain and what he called the narrowing of horizons, a sense of frustration among his own compatriots, whose assets of self-respect and conscious international virtue were considerably wasted. So for generations, it's been easy to use the terms England and Britain as though they are interchangeable. You can never use the words Scotland and Britain as though they are interchangeable, or indeed Wales. At the end of 2016, I was doing some year-end reflective pieces. I found the Brexit bus, one with the 350 million pounds written on the side of it. And I spoke to the driver. It was now being used to ferry York City football team around the country, by the way. But the, same, the driver was the same. And I, I said to him, so where did you travel to? And he said, everywhere. We went, we went the whole country. We traveled around the whole country from top to bottom. We started down in Devon, and we went all the way to Carlisle. So it was a small but revealing glimpse into a new national identity. I think Richard will deal with this, but his excellent book, Englishness, uh, dissects this very well. Uh, a new national identity that has emerged over the last couple of decades, a more explicitly English national identity, and one that is not confused with Britishness. But while Scottish, Irish, and Welsh nationalisms reject British statehood, English nationalism does not. It remains powerfully emotionally attached to the idea of Britain, even though increasingly England is perceived to be unfairly treated by the UK in its post-devolution iteration. So I think this perception is bound up with notions of greatness 
and Anthony's book, The Lure of Greatness, deals with this. The idea that providence has carved out for the British a special destiny in the world still has powerful political traction in England. Richard quotes Tony Blair from 2007, the year he left office, saying, this is Tony Blair, this is a blessed nation. The British are special. The world knows that. In our innermost thoughts, we know it. This is the greatest nation on earth. That sentiment was at the heart of the Brexit campaign popular appeal. So can England recover from Great Britain is the contentious title of the session. I have yet to find any real indication that it wants to. But to return to my original observation, it is events and choices made in England over the last 40 years that have driven more powerfully than anything we do here in Scotland, the process by which England and Scotland have diverged in their respective senses of the kind of society and polity they want to be. And just look at the age demographics, the huge majorities for independence that are stacking up among the younger generations in Scotland. The danger for those who want to see the union survive in England is not Scottish nationalism, but a failure in England to understand the nature of the UK as a union state and to find a settled and comfortable place within it. Thank you. So when I was thinking about what to prepare for this session, I was going to go for a journalistic approach, which was to do with my work. And then sitting in my hotel room last night, I decided instead to say this. So I'm a Londoner. I'm the Sikh Punjabi daughter of immigrants, and I am British. My parents were born and raised in countries of the British Empire, Kenya and India. And Great Britain was a country that they, like so many other Commonwealth immigrants, uh, wanted to come to and were proud to come to and build their lives in. Now, I never bought into the nature of greatness of Britain. Um, I acknowledge that Great Britain means something to me with regards to my parents' history, which is a history of empire and it's a history of this country. And it was the British National Party that had its headquarters, disguised as a bookshop and a meeting room opposite the house I grew up in, in South East London. And it was the union flag that the BMP members carried when they rioted with the police outside my living, ro living room window uh, following the murder of Stephen Lawrence in nearby Eltham. And of course, it was this same union flag that is a symbol of repulsion and panic-inducing uh, fear because of its association with the violence of far-right extremism in this country uh, for the generations of people of color who went before me and had to deal with that violence on the streets. And it was called Britannia that was in the air when New Labour came to power when I was a child. And Jerry Halliwell wore a Union Jack dress at the Brit Awards when the Spice Girls performed. And it's good old British uh, goodwill when I, I think of when I see strangers patiently queuing or mucking in, helping each other out on a packed train. And it's good old British spirit I think of when it comes to the NHS. And so what is it to be English? What is Englishness? And for me, these are central questions which have never been easy to grapple with or to answer. And perhaps unlike the other nations of the UK, England doesn't have as distinct a sense of its own identity, which, is, which it is aware of or which it is embracing of. In my view, it's a country that still doesn't want to look at its imperial history, and the United Kingdom is really the last expression of England, Britain's imperial project. I personally believe that if the people of Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland see their futures as independent countries or united with other independent countries because being part of the UK is not serving their interests, then I think that is their right. But what I also want to recognize and bring to the table today is that I am conflicted uh, because the notion of the very diversity of the United Kingdom, this notion that there are 
different nations, multiple identities. So there is uncertainty, almost an ambiguity and fluidity which comes with that with regards to our identity. Uh, that is something which, in a complicated way, appeals to me. Uh, I don't think this multiplicity and this difference and the fact we have these different nations, I don't think in practice that is borne out. Uh, I think our political system is still dominated by Westminster, by London, by the Southeast, and I don't think it does work for the other nations uh, in this union. But again, this notion of diversity, multiplicity that the UK represents seems to matter to me. And that's not because I don't want to just be, just be English, because I buy into some exceptional notion that we can't just be English, we're Great Britain, because we're exceptional and we have these great myths. Because as I said, I'm the child of the children of the empire. And so I see through those myths uh, <laughs> more than most and m much more quickly. But I am honest about the fact that this notion of being English or Englishness, it, it does perturb me because what does it mean and how would we even go about starting to develop it? And so for me, Englishness isn't an identity that I've ever really felt part of. And I mean, I am only speaking for myself, but uh, I could venture a guess that of course there are other young people of color, people from diverse backgrounds, uh, people who want to embrace multiplicity, uh, be various things, probably feel that same way. And of course, for me, that there are many personal reasons why I perhaps don't feel embraced or embracing of Englishness. And that is for me to, of course, explore. But I also think it's, it's a bigger issue than that. I don't think that that identity of Englishness has ever been presented to me in a manner that is uh, outward looking, diverse, about multiplicity, about plurality. Even though, of course, it does have that within it. I don't think Englishness is, at its heart, uh, really inward-looking and little England, but I'm trying to say that I don't think their broader sense of Englishness has ever been presented. So if it's being argued, perhaps I need to connect more to my Englishness and be more English, you know, what does that mean? Is that a personal thing? Is it something we need to develop collectively, which, which perhaps it is? And how do we go about uniting people from different regions, from different backgrounds, from different generations? Fundamentally, how do we bring people together with a form of Englishness, perhaps a civic uh, identity form of Englishness? And I have these same questions when it comes to my Punjabi Indian roots. I have many conversations with people when it's like getting in touch with my Indianness. So, so what does that mean? And I guess why I'm asking these questions is to bring a sense of contradiction and uh, complication to this issue. I think any sense of Englishness then would need to embrace and take further what I feel Britishness uh, has come to represent for many of us who may feel excluded by Englishness and Britishness will have its own flaws. And one answer for me lies perhaps, you know, not in politics, but in culture. And in a, in a sport I'm not massively interested in, but have been following in recent years because uh, of the national team that I really relate to. And I'm so proud of how diverse they are. I'm talking about the England football team and it is has been a big success and it's embracing it's embracing unity and diversity solidarity and tradition and evolution and we have Harry Kane and we have Marcus Rashford and they're standing together and taking on those young men who wanted to take the knee uh, was one cultural war that this government could not win and I think that is really saying something and so as the England manager, Gareth Southgate, said in an open letter he wrote called Dear England, when those players were being condemned by Priti Patel and Boris Johnson for wanting to raise awareness of structural injustice and racism, he said, I feel this generation of England players is closer to the supporters than they have been for decades. Despite the polarization we see in society, these lads are on the same wavelength as you on many issues. But beyond the symbolism, we of course would need to look at what it is to create a deeper sense of identity. Can that be discovered? Is there a deeper Englishness within us? 
more to the point, is that something we want? Because the last point I want to focus on is this notion of multiplicity, pluralism, multiple identities. So Englishness, for me, doesn't embody that multiplicity. I was born and grew up in London. I live there. For me, it, that city does do that, but that's not England, and England isn't London. You know, it shouldn't be uh, dominated by London. And so, in a way, Britishness has been a useful, broader idea that it's been easier for me to get on board with, because to my sense, it suggests more of an outward-lookingness uh, and a greatness through diversity. But even that idea of Britishness, great Britishness, is, is an idea, not really a reality, because Call Britannia was a new labor rebranding exercise. It didn't really go under the surface. And global Britain is no feasible solution to post-Brexit Britain on the world stage. And we're not really doing anything at all about trying to strengthen the United Kingdom and, and Britain and that, that sense of being uh, something broader. So regardless of anything that we might talk about with regards to does Antti's mentioned, you know, do we need to go back to England, be England and embrace England and then go back to the EU? And I guess in a way, regardless of that conversation, which is a valuable one and a big one to have, I think this conversation about what, would in, what is Englishness? What would it be? How does, how, how does it bring everyone along, along with it, with all the complexity of that? Um, that's a conversation we need to have anyway. And what does it mean to be British? What's the relationship between being British and being English? And even more importantly, I think in this age of weaponization of identities and the blood of tribalism and the stoking of people's baser instincts with division, we need to speak about how we can encourage unity and understanding and multiplicity. You know, different aspects of ourselves that sit side by side. For we are all much more than we might think of ourselves, and we need to be expressing and living those bigger, deeper versions of ourselves in whatever way, collectively or personally, that may be. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope what I'm about to say runs on quite nicely from Hardeep's comments. I'm going to start with a little story. In 2021, Labour MP David Lammy was very cross about his census options. Uh, Mr Lammy pointed out that in the census administered to England and Wales, there was no category for him, a man of black heritage, to describe himself as English. Welsh respondents from ethnic minority groups could express this specific national identity. They had the likes of black Welsh and Asian Welsh to choose from, but while white people in England could claim their identity as white English, there was no such option for non-white groups. And this is what Mr. Lamy said at the time. Why can't I describe myself or my children as English on our census forms? Black British, yes. English, no. You can be white English, but you can't be black English. I remember thinking at the time, God, why would you want to be? <laughs> but beyond an immediate, obvious ethnic exclusion there, I think both my sarcastic reaction and Mr. Lamy's observation tapped into a much wider, knottier problem. Because Mr. Lamy and I, despite our differing political views, are both children of empire, the British Empire. Our present in, presence in England, the physical country, is a direct result of Britain, the imperial project. I'm a half black Jamaican, white British mix, with two Scottish surnames from each parent. Uh, Mr. Lamy is a black British man, or black English he'd rather be identified, the son of two Guyanese parents, which is a former British slave colony, and sent a lot of money to Liverpool and Glasgow. So what is our Englishness without Britishness? What is England the country without Britain the union and the ghost of empire that we refuse to exercise? And here's why I say that. 
The way I see it, the idea of England as a lone regional entity separate from Britain has been basically frozen in amber since about the 18th century, except for cultural occasions, which is maybe why weak cultural tropes about what people seem to fall back on when they think about England as a political body, as our nationalised identity boiled down to two world wars and one world cup. And only the world cup was really achieved as an English feat. So it's also instructive to me, for one time in my life, to look at the far-right English nationalists. How are they, these people, articulating this mythological country and concept that they are insistent on defending from some imaginary enemy? You know, they must, they must have a really good idea of what it to them means to be English. And I think last week, we got a great example. So a bevy of far right descended on the cenotaph, a British war memorial dedicated to fallen soldiers in an imperial war. And what did these uber nationalists have to say about England? How did they define England? They said, we were born here. Is that it? Is that all England is now? And of course, the far right are not reliable arbiters completely of English identity or what England the country is, but there isn't really an expression of England on the left, I don't think, and I should know, having been on it for all my life, um, because English nationalism is so associated with the right, whereas Britishness is the terrain to be fought and negotiated for when you consider the left. So I think England itself tied itself to the imperial project of Britain, that England the country is almost inextricable from it and will need to be recreated in a way that, say, Wales or Scotland, other members of this union, the Great Britain, will not. So Wales and Scotland have calcified these distinct political, cultural, and even legal identities and systems that can be separated from Great Britain, even while a back and forth relationship exists between the union and the individual nation. Both nations obviously were eager participants in the project of British Empire, Scotland particularly, I'm living proof of that, um, but there were still live nationalist movements that from both the left and the right to hold onto a Wales and Scotland that existed beyond Britain, that wasn't captured solely by this hollow conception of a country existing, of a political identity existing that boils down to just, well, I was born here and I live here. So that isn't to say that an English political identity doesn't exist. I think if we look at Brexit, and I think Richard will speak particularly to this, there is a clear association between identifying as English and a rejection of a wider international union. But for me, what I see is that English political identity seems restricted to a sense of grievance. That's what it means to be English at the moment. And a feeling of being left behind, which you hear capitalised on a lot by English politicians in Westminster. So Britishness, I think, means England hasn't really had to define or develop itself in a positive, progressive way. It stagnated financially and politically because it has profited from being Britain. And as other panelists have pointed out, we are very wedded in England to the idea of being British for reasons I hope I've covered. So I suppose for me, my question is less, can England recover from Great Britain? But how can the left in particular rediscover England or even resurrect it? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you will hear from my accent that I'm not English. All I can say is we Welsh have been watching the English for a thousand years with some alarm. And so, um, and so I hope I have something to contribute to the conversation. I should start by saying it's a huge honour to be part of this event to celebrate the contribution of Tom Men, a great mind, but also in my dealings with a modest and undignified man. Uh, given how little time we have, I, I want to avoid digressions. However, given that this is primarily a Scottish and maybe an Anglo-British event, I just wanted to say that Tom wrote with great intelligence and sensitivity about Wales as well. He was also a very influential figure in Wales, and in particular, I'd like to salute his uh, friendship with and impact on John Osmond, who's sitting in the front row here, one of the, the most, I think, the most important public intellectual in Wales for the last 30 or 40 years. Um, 
Uh, in thinking about what I was going to say, uh, I was struck um, by the extent to which Tom's twilight years were overshadowed by two political developments which would have been hugely disappointing for him. The first is obviously the failure of the independence referendum in 2014, and the second then is the uh, failure, as he and I would see it, of the uh, Brexit referendum in 2016. I don't really want to talk a lot about those events uh, per se, but I do want to stress in a slightly different way from the way that Alan Smith did in the previous session, I want to stress the extent to which those referendums were interlinked. I've written uh, about this in a book with one of Tom's old students, uh, Ailes Henderson from Edinburgh, uh, in a book called Englishness, which, uh, which is available for sale uh, uh, in the back there. And that's got all the arguments and all the evidence, crucially. So um, if, you, if you want to kind of delve into this, all I'll say is that it was in the wake of Indy Ref that the Conservatives very deliberately and very successfully mobilised anti-Scottish sentiment in their 2015 general election campaign in England. And it was that success that allowed David Cameron to see off the threat of UKIP on one flank and Lib Dems in particular on the other. And it was the victory that that ensured, that, that then led to Cameron feeling obliged to call the Brexit referendum, a pledge he almost certainly never thought he would have to fulfill. And we all now, we know what happened next and we have to live with what happened next. Now, obviously, um, these, these events would have been hugely disappointing to Tom Nairn, but Nairn's thinking, his method, allows us to make sense of both, of all of this. In terms of understanding how grievance about Scotland and Europe could turbocharge a populist English nationalism bent on restoring the tattered prestige of the British state, but also relatedly we can understand how Brexitism has morphed into the crudeness and indeed vulgarity of muscular unionism in the periphery of the UK state after 2016. I, and another slight digression, it's also worth underlining, I think, the extent to which Tom Nairn's theorising about the relationships between national identities in these islands and about the ideas and values that align with national identities, all of this has been borne out in the public attitudes data that we've been collecting in the period since he was properly active in this field. In my own view, Tom Nairn offers, also offers pointers uh, as to what to look for next. It's plainly evident, I think, that English nationalism has overreached itself. In its rush to restore the archaic constitutional and parliamentary traditions, which Tom Nairn says, uh, these are the features of which English ideology is most proud, it's not occurred to them that the, again quoting Tom Nairn, the aged organs may not be able to take the strain. <laughs> and we are seeing that, are we not, every day, that the uh, aged organs of the UK state are just not able to cope with what they've unleashed, unleashed. Neither can the myths and fantasies of our island race's history of buccaneering seaborne capitalism to write this book, I had to read Daniel Hannan. <laughs> I feel my pain. Um, you know, that nonsense cannot counter the realities of Ukraine's much diminished economic status, let alone offer solutions to the reality of uneven development and the massive obscene inequalities we find across the UK states. It's also the case that the bombast and self-deception of the post-Brexit UK state, parliamentary sovereignty and all that, is now confronted by the reality of the existence of polities in Scotland and in Wales. Polities that cannot be eliminated, at least democratically. These institutions, we can run them down, but they represent real democratic advances compared to the time when the breakup of Britain was first published. Britain may not have broken up in the interim, 
but nationality politics, both in periphery but also in the core of the state, remain central to the state's interminable and I think probably terminal crisis. The problem, of course, and here I think we need to be brutally realistic, is that the progressive side of politics in England, with Caroline Lucas as an honourable exception, I thought that was the best speech I've ever heard on Englishness uh, by an English politician earlier today. And I think I've read them all. Uh, with some a very few honourable exceptions, the progressive side of politics in England is still not engaging in trying to develop an alternative vision or version of Englishness. Instead, at the leadership level, we see a thicket of union jacks. You will not see a, 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 a senior UK level uh, Labour politician without a union, at least one union jack, usually more behind them. Reminding us perhaps that the phrase muscular unionism was first used to describe the approach of Scottish Labour. The alleged resource of hope, if I can quote Raymond Williams, the alleged resource of hope is the alleged popular enthusiasm for regional devolution in England, which far too many on the left seem to regard as a way of avoiding or bypassing nationality politics altogether. A self-deception, I'm afraid, that ignores the overwhelming survey evidence that regional devolution just isn't that popular. But also, in England, but also, if you ask people in England to choose between an all-England solution and a regional solution in England, England wins every time, even among those people who don't feel English in England. So, finally, can England recover from Great Britain? Yes, of course it can. Those of us who are Welsh, those of us who are Scottish, know how much our stories about ourselves have changed over the last 30 or 40 years. It's extraordinary the kinds of transformation that can take place. But here, echoing what Alan has said, there are precious few signs that it's happening yet in England. And indeed, I think the displacement activity around English regionalism on the left just slows down the beginning of that process. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd, I'd like to um, just have a little bit of a discussion within the panel. Of, that was a fantastic session. And um, I'd like to say this to, to my, my to what I would like to call my fellow English citizens, if I could. But uh, this is the, the point where I, I appreciate the way in which both of you, in different ways, were beginning to look at the experience that you've had of uh, being English and British, uh, and with that, the background from immigration. And one of the things about Tom and Tom's work is that Tom Nairn um, wasn't a nationalist. But what he recognized, talking, uh, and, and it was Stephen Maxwell here that, that taught him this from a, a traditional Marxist position, was that you could not get round the question of nationality, that the national politics was at, you couldn't leap over it, as he put, from being the individual to the internationalism, that you had to deal with this, what he called the modern Janus, that it both intrinsically was ambiguous, it always had this element of the reactionary, the past, but it was also a force that was needed to, make, to bring us towards a better future with other people. And in examining this process, he made quite, a, a, he used an image which I found very helpful. He said that nationalism, the trees of nationalism, all nationalism always think that they have come from within, that they are their own cause, that they look back to their own origins. But, but in fact, he said, because nationalism has come about over the last two, three hundred years, through the process, the uneven process of sometimes brutal capitalist development. Nationality is intrinsic to the development of the world, and it's the forest that defines the trees. 
not the trees. It's the forest which is the, and he was a man of the forest. And so the question I want to put you in a way is that if you, if you, it's unbearable for us, the English, Anglo-British, to think of our country as a prison of nations. We cannot be free if we are not allowing the Scots to choose their own future, or the Welsh, or the Northern Irish. So we, if we cannot be that, we have to embrace the possibility to encourage them to be free if that's what they wish. And in that encouragement, we will become English politically. That doesn't mean we are still British. I think Britishness will flourish. It will include the West Indies. It will include, it will include all of Ireland. When there's a very, very good video I would ask everybody to look at on, this, on the website from Fintan O'Toole, who's in America and couldn't come here. And he talks about the archipelago. He said, I am from the Irish part of the archipelago. And he talks about the importance of being part of a larger union of Europe and what that meant for Irish independence. And he has to use the term archipelago because he can't use Britishness. But actually, he is part of a large British culture, which will, of course, flourish once the imperial state is no longer there trying to hold it to itself. So... Uh, it's that sense of, don't you feel that it's not looking just for a better Englishness out there, but that there's a larger world in which we can freely be politically English if, if, if Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland choose their independence. Um, I mean, Northern Ireland would join Ireland. Um, so, but it doesn't mean that we're confined to that. It doesn't mean we have a single identity anymore. We are in a world of multiple identities. Yeah, I see. This one. Yeah. I, I think you're right, Anthony. I mean, I, I wouldn't argue that you, for example, are arguing uh, for a world against multiple identities. I, I wouldn't say you're saying we need to be English and recognize that, and that's going to be a monolithic sense of who we are. I guess my question, I mean, for me, it's, it, I'm conflicted. And so really, my sort of speech was an exploration of conflicting uh, thoughts and feelings within myself. Well, what the solutions are to that, uh, I, I don't know. But I guess it's how do we actually create a sense of plurality, a multiplicity of identities, and something bigger and all-embracing, which is also deep, in England. Uh, if we haven't been able to do that for many, many years, I mean, I, I guess you would argue we haven't been able to do that because of the union. But I, I, I don't see the link between those. Well, I, I would like bit, you to explain you say, the link you say, between look, those. Here is London. It is clearly multiple identity. It is clear. But London's, you know, and here is the English football team, which, you know, Gareth Southgate has absolutely propagated as a, as a multiracial, open, pluralistic, as, that, as an anti-racist. And, and yet, no, 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 they're not. So you're confining the... the, um, I, the I guess I'm, I'm asking you, in a way, it sounds stupid okay. to say, regardless no. of the union, why hasn't Englishness been able to cultivate an identity which is outward and multiple and plural. We're just beginning. But that's a question that isn't just about the union. In my view, I, I don't, I, you know, why, why aren't we already that? Well, the, the forces, the, the enormous, maybe, maybe, Richard, you would like to answer that? No, no, I'm just to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, Anthony, because can I... of the forces of history that are... Yeah. Well, I think the answer is because why is England not uh, cultivated that? Because Britain has stood in the way. The British state has no uh, motivation to cultivate this identity. And then the left have, as, as I tried to get at, have uh, sort of abdicated responsibility because, as I said, the Britishness has been the terrain which they fought for this multiple, multiplicity, pluralist, whatever, whatever word you want to use, this diverse word. And uh, I, I don't know if this was, was exactly what you were saying, but I want to stress, I'm not clinging on to being British. I would happily identify as English if there was an English me to identify as, if there was some sort of progressive English identity and tradition that I felt I could tap back into. But as I said, I, th I think it has been frozen for so long because we focus so much in England as the nucleus 
of the empire and wrapped ourselves in Britain as this cloak. It's, it's been this uh, sticking plaster. And it, it's, it's threadbare. It's, you know, the, the, the wound of England, the wound of Imperial Britain is now open to everyone and, and to mix metaphors, that life raft is falling apart uh, rapidly. Um, so it was funny because I was having this discussion yesterday about the, the way, how, how I switched between British and English, and someone said to me, who was not English recently, they said, oh, but aren't, aren't you English though? And I said, oh, culturally I'm English. And I've been thinking about it, and culturally I'm not English because what is there for me to cling on to there? Like, what, what now are cultural markers of Englishness beyond, say, the football team, which is one of the lone times we represent being English on, a, on an international stage? Um, all this, like, weak trope of fish and chips or whatever, which isn't even, English, if you want to call it that again. The Italian, it would, it, fish and chips has a, its roots in many, many countries that concurrently, you know, it was, I think it was also imperial. The em empire was thanked for fish and chips. Um, so but I identify as British because I am a product of Britain. But that doesn't mean the future that I couldn't identify as English or that we shouldn't do that. I just think the left, for whatever reason, has vacated its role in the last X decades in uh, defining an Englishness beyond, they've, they've left that, they've left that territory, they've left that territory to other people to talk about and discuss, and because of that now no one wants to touch it, it's like this fetid swamp. Um, I don't know if that was useful to Anthony at all. Because what it's been associated with is the problematic element. Yeah, I've got to say, when I first moved lived to England and observed England for so yes, long. Yes, yeah, I'm like an anthropologist among the English. When I first moved to England, I was very struck that it had a very strong positive story to tell about itself, not least because of the way in which so many diverse populations had moved to England and had, had thrived and done well. It, was, it seemed to me in the late 1980s when I lived in provincial England, as they called it in London, um, that uh, England was one of the most open, diverse and tolerant societies in Europe. I couldn't understand why that wasn't seen. Uh, look at this room, there's almost no diversity in it. And that's because no. Scotland because Scotland's never been a magnet for immigration. Traditionally, Scotland's uh, problem has not been immigration, not been too much immigration, but too little. Scotland's problem has been emigration. And I am Scotland's demographic nightmare because I had all my education here on the state, thank you very much. As soon as I started to earn money and pay taxes, I moved to London. And, and then I got older and perhaps might start needing to call upon the coffers of the state. Here I am back living in Scotland again. So all my high earning tax pay years were spent in England and all my you know, expense years for, this, for the state are gonna be uh, where it lived in my youth in, in Scotland and in my old age in Scotland. So that's tr traditionally been Scotland's problem compared to England. But here was this vibrant, diverse, tolerant, open society that I moved I moved to that was moving forward economically. It was embracing, you know, embracing Margaret Thatcher's vision of the future, but it was still, it still had achievements that seemed to me to be specifically English rather than British, including uh, the, diver the, the cultural and ethnic diversity and the tolerance and the openness, uh, and uh, not to mention you know, the, 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 the pre-British achievements of the English constitutional tradition, which were in, in the day revolutionary, rule of law, Magna Carta. You know, William Shakespeare, the English literary canon, all these things are, are pre-British English achievements. And I think England has a very positive story to tell about itself and can be, in a very progressive way, a bit of a shining light in the world. The trouble is, it's been hijacked. The English identity has been hijacked by a different kind of vision. Uh, and and you know, I observed this 35 years ago when I was first living in England and believed in it and came to love England and came to enjoy England for all the positive and progressive things that it seemed to represent to me. Can I, can I just, um, I, I, I was rereading um, Break of a Britain on the train on the way up, and uh, obviously it was published in 77, uh, and what's striking is that so many of the things that Tom Nairn says characterise England and English identity and nationality politics remain unchanged. So he says um, uh, one of the very characteristic things about being English is saying that you're not English, which, I, <laughs> which is like, yes. Um, obviously, my accent is, um, shows there's never any mistake about who I am. Um, also, regional differences within England are so large that never, nobody can ever talk about England. He, 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 talks about, he says, there's also, you find people saying, Britishness is inherently more progressive than Englishness. Although, obviously, Nairn's answer to that is, uh, you know, there are no black cats, there are no white cats, they're all spotted. He's always very clear that, you know, 
there's always a, a, a politics around progressiveness or, or, or its opposite. Um, so, I mean, to go back to Caroline Lucas's point this morning, um, when, when Tom passed, there was very, very little uh, attention paid south of the border. All of these things, which there was a little moment in the sun, maybe, but they've kind of fallen away and people need to relearn this stuff. And just a final, just a final thing on this. In terms of the research that we've done on attitudes in England, one of the most striking things that we found, I think is probably the most important finding in the Englishness book, is that if you feel English, you tend to have low efficacy. Efficacy is the term that political scientists use to describe a sense that somebody cares about your voice, that your voice matters. If you feel English living in England, you feel very strongly that nobody cares about you, your voice doesn't matter. But the problem that we still have, and that the progressive left, I think, still has, is that the solution, of that, the solution to that uh, at the moment is still what, uh, what uh, Anthony called the lure of greatness, okay? To, to deal with that laugh, lack of efficacy, we've got to turn back the clock to the kind of archaic British date that Tom described so well. And, and, the, and I'm afraid that the progressive left uh, south of the border, or east of the border in, in my world, hasn't really moved on uh, um, at all, really, since the mid-70s. Can I just have one quick observation? about regional diversity within England. I heard a great story on the radio a few months ago uh, about a survey in which English people were asked to identify England's second city. And people in Birmingham said Birmingham, people in Manchester said Manchester, and people in, in Liverpool said London. Well, we, we, we've got uh, um, about 20 or 30 minutes, so I, well, let's take some, should we take some questions or points from the floor? And as I think Adam set a very good um, example, we're trying to get a, at least a balance, a gender balance. I see that John, John Osman would like to ask something, which is fine. Just hang on. Right. Yeah, Can we start with John, down front? It's uh, not so much a question, but uh, a point I'd like to make, and I wonder if the panel would like to comment on it. Um, one of the things that's not really been raised in all of this, and which Tom uh, said a lot about, uh, was the monarchy, and the royal family, and all. you wrote a whole book about it, of course. Um, and it leads in my mind to the whole concept of citizenship which is what identity for a lot of people is associated with, especially here in Scotland, to my mind. Um, I've always felt as a Welsh person that Scots, in contrast to us, feel primarily Scottish in relationship to their uh, relation to their sense of being citizens of Scotland, which an idea in Wales has always been fairly kind of odd, you know, being a citizen of Wales. Um, I think young people in Wales now do feel that because we create institutions we never had them but in Scotland you you hang on to your institutions and uh, you felt Scottish in relation to them but coming to the English of course uh, the concept of English citizenship is doesn't really work uh, it doesn't really work for any of us, really, in, in, in Britain, because we're not citizens, we're subjects under the crown, aren't we? So there are no citizens in that sense. So how does identity then work? If you can't be a citizen of your country, you're a subject, how are you to relate to your country? And it seems to me that is a fundamental problem for the English. Somehow in Wales and Scotland, we've got over it because we've developed our own institutions and we can be citizens of our own country, despite the fact we don't yet have full sovereignty in terms of independence. But we still are citizens, even though they've taken that away from us to some extent through Brexit, but nonetheless. Uh, so that is, it seems okay, to me, a fund I won't go on much more, but that's a fundamental question which, in, 
which how do the English express their identity when they're not citizens? And by the way, they want to hang on to the monarchy like hell. Well, that, that, that's such a, a strong, clear question. I think we should respond immediately. Would you like to? No. Do, no? I do. I'll say something about the monarchy. It's interesting and, uh, because while there is a, de a tenure in Westminster and Whitehall and in, in large parts of the media landscape in London for the nature of the United Kingdom as a union state rather than a unitary state, the one national UK-wide institution that seems to understand what it is, paradoxically, is the least democratic institution of all, which is the royal household. The first thing the new king did when the queen died last year was go on a tour of London, Edinburgh, Belfast and Cardiff, and I reported on that, and I said that the, the, the new king will be aware that the, his mother's reign was characterized by the long, slow contraction of British imperial power around the world. The new king will be acutely aware that his own reign might well come to be characterized by the continuation of that pro, pro, process here at home and the, the dissolution of the United Kingdom. Well, uh, I said that in a piece to camera on the Royal Mile with the royal family marching up behind the coffin. And, um, but it seemed to me absolutely obvious that that's what King Charles was signaling, that he's going to put the future of the Union at the heart of his reign. Uh, and the royal household sort of gets it in a way that Westminster uh, and Whitehall don't. And of course, certain newspapers picked up on this and had a go at me, and, and columnists had backed me and rang unionist politicians to denounce me. Uh, but it seemed to me absolutely obvious that that's what the royal household were doing. They were saying, this is, a, this is a union of four nations, and we better start showing that we understand that. Otherwise, it's in... Um, so the great paradox is that the democratic institutions or the de institutions that are meant to be accountable to the democratic... Well, you know, the, the, the accountable in some ways to the people, just don't get it. Kieran Martin, who was at the heart of that government machine in 2014, uh, has written since. Uh, but the royal family, paradoxically, they seem to, they seem to have a, a feel for it in a way that the, the other institutions in London don't, simply don't, which is bizarre and weird, but it's, but it's evident. Can I just come yeah. in, Anthony? I mean, I, I guess what I was trying to get at before was there are impediments to that have existed in terms of the, this development of an Englishness or an English identity, which for me sort of go beyond just the union. So if we look at the monarchy, for example, I mean, it, it's really interesting that we have an institution that sits at the heart of our constitutional settlement, uh, our head of state is, is, a, is a monarch, and what, what is it that that institution represents? It, it represents uh, an imperial Britain in many ways, which uh, we still don't want to confront, uh, and the royal family itself, uh, I still don't think in any real meaningful way, wants to look at its history, uh, wants to look at the country's history and how that's caught up in, in monarchy, and so I feel, for example, that is an impediment to developing at the moment a sense of Englishness that sort of almost transcends the union, which is also relevant, because how can we say, and it's a big elephant in the room, we have uh, a royal family which represents inequality, uh, inherited power, uh, imperial power that sits at the heart of England and the other nations, and yet we never really talk about it. They, they certainly, the members of it, don't want to talk about uh, our past in any rounded way, and that is a big block as well. Yeah. Um, do, do you feel the monarchy is coming between you and your country? I, I don't have anything particularly insightful to add, except obviously England as a country cannot progress or even create a, a constitutional settlement that recognizes people as citizens while the monarchy still exists. The monarchy is Britain. The monarchy would have to be abolished in order for England to thrive. I'm a Republican. Um, <laughs> well, what I think is particularly interesting is that any sort of consensus among political thinkers that may have existed as recent as 2004, say, in terms of the Republican movement has now been eroded by the cultural wars that are ripping England particularly apart. So you look at 
There was, a, I think, a letter that was signed in 2004, which I cite that as a year, um, by various people who were across the political spectrum, organized by Republic, the um, Republican organization. And you would never in a million years have people, I can't, I can't remember exactly this, but it was people that names you recognize. And you would never in a million years have some of these names on that letter in the same space now, simply because they would, the monarchy has been centered by politicians in particular as a key part of English culture wars. It's been centered by the right, the conservative party, which has lurched even further, Frankenstein's monster, like, to the right, uh, a Labour, English Labour, which has also followed it, um, and they have now centred it as part of, you know, the great British values, we have to hold on to the monarchy at any cost. Doesn't matter what the younger generations who are meant to inherit the country think, be damned, the monarchy is at the heart of this. So, yeah, for England to flourish, then we would need to get rid of the monarchy full stop, but that isn't going to happen with our current political class. Um, and that's another point as well, that England, this is obvious, but England doesn't have a regional government the way that every other nation has a regional government. We just have Westminster. Like, that, that's it, which I think is an another block to these... Um, even addressing these questions in the first place. There's a consensus agreed by politicians in Westminster that yes, of course we have to keep the monarchy. And on the ground, there's you know there's no great swell against it, but there's not even that being brought up. And we're not fighting the terrain in the same way we might have been fighting it 20 years ago, because it seems even more settled that the monarchy is a question we're not going to be able to budge anyone on, which is very demoralizing for me. Um. Just, this is a slightly uh, left field, perhaps, and we're talking about um, England in the context of, of Brexit, but I, I think we should also talk about England in the context of devolution, because one of the things, and I don't mean regional devolution within England, um, which I've expressed my <laughs> slightly uh, sour views on already, but in terms of what does establishing uh, devolution in Scotland and in and Wales and Northern Ireland do. It makes England emerge by default, okay? And this has been going on, uh, and we, we have a British level which is still in denial about this. We saw that most obviously during COVID, when ministers in the UK government just couldn't say England when they were talking about England, and they, they were, you know, they can't stand the diminished status and we have a debate in Wales at the moment about evolving the justice system. We've got the highest imprisonment rate in Western Europe in Wales. I bet you didn't know that. Um, we're part of an England and Wales justice system that works extremely badly in Wales. And we're talking about uh, evolving it and the Welsh Labour government is in favour. The Labour Party more generally is very sceptical and it's the usual thing about Welsh devolution. But when we get there, it will mean that England has its own justice system for the first time since the 15th century. So what we're doing around the periphery of the state, and you know, I think the people in England are very slow to confront this, is we are creating an English polity <laughs> by our own actions. I'm not sure that people have caught up with that yet. I'm going to take one more set of questions, but I just want to uh, uh, add to this point. The Labour Party has just issued new party member cards, and Labour Party members, I think if Rory is in the room, he can confirm this, have the Scottish flag on their card, and the Welsh members have the Welsh flag, and English members have the Union Jack. <laughs> so this confirms the absence of English institutions. Uh, I was going to insist on another uh, uh, on, uh, for gender parity, but Neil Asherson has. Really? Yes. Waving. 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 Okay. Yes. The lady who's waving there, and then Neil. Those two, very quickly, very quickly, please. So you're talking about the measurement of Englishness. Um, Caroline Lucas made a really interesting point earlier on, and she talked about how. Um, in England, if the English flag went up over a church, this was fine, but if it was hanging outside of a council estate window, then that had a completely different meaning. So do you think that um, the concept of Englishness um, has been reduced um, by the extreme right? And what do you think that progressive English people should do about that? Thank you. Fine. And a, a very quick question from Neil Asherson down here. In the front. 
I just want to remark about Mikey. Uh, it matters a lot less whether we have a monarch or not uh, than the fact that Britain is an absolutely monarchical structure in which power flows from the top to the bottom, and that is completely un-European, uh, anti-Republican, and reactionary. You know, you can live with a bicyclist king you know, like a kind of wee Tory on top of the national hat. But uh, what you can't live with is an archaic constitution or apology for a non-constitution in which power flows from the top to the bottom. And, you know, you can judge it by the exceptions, like the Freedom of Information Act, which is a marvelous act, not least because the onus is on government to prove that, they, that there's some good reason not to disclose. And basically, the citizen or subject, quite right, has the right to uh, information from the government. And it's up to the government to establish that there is a reason why you can't have that information. Otherwise, you're looking at an extraordinarily archaic top-down structure, and it is monarchical. And that's partly why nobody knows what the law of state is, or who really has the final choice in giving orders in Britain, and this came out in the debates after Brexit. Th thank you, Neil. Uh, just as an anecdote about this, that the Brexit cabinet, uh, run by Michael Gove, uh, um, created a secret unit to combat the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, which was exposed by, by Peter Gagan and Open Democracy, uh, and has since, because of the exposure by Open Democracy, has been abolished, you'll be glad to know. So there's a, a, a contest around this. Uh, I'm afraid we're, we're nearly out of time. I just want to take, I'm going to want to go around. I'm very sorry. I know the lots is a great panel, and lots of people want to ask questions, but we're out of time. Uh, so I'm going to go th across the panel in reverse order starting with Richard, just to answer the very simple question that the lady at the back had asked. Yeah. So that there are two union, two forms of union, Jack, and how do we two so forms of English fly flag. the progressive yeah. one? Yeah. So I, I, think, I think the panel has, given, uh, has, has helped me answer this because there has been a tendency on the progressive side in English politics in particular to associate the English flag with the reaction stuff. The British flag is somehow more positive. We've just been reminded very uh, helpfully that the BNP fly the British flag, mostly fl flew, flew the, the British pla flag. The, you know, there is, this goes back to my Nairn point, there are no black or white cats, they're all spotted. There are dangerous things in Scottish nationalism, there are dangerous things in Welsh nationalism. You don't, you don't get a free pass because you're small. Sorry, <laughs> you know, we, we, need to be, we need to be vigilant about this stuff. But by the same token, Englishness is not inherently reactionary. There are some great progressive stories that you could attach to English if you wanted to. The issue is that nobody, bar a very few outliers, actually wants to do that. I don't have a glance for you about how we're going to remove the attachment of Englishness from this sort of far right nationalist sentiment. But I do think if it's going to come from anywhere, it's going to come from the resurgence of the Labour movement uh, in England at the moment, um, which as a young person has been very fascinating to watch. So if there is going to, we're going to, you know, create a new narrative around what Englishness can be that is attractive to younger generations, we're going to have to look at what younger generations in particular on the left are actually interested in, which, from my perspective, is the labor movement, is building this cool sort of class consciousness across workers again. So I think if anywhere there's going to be a positive idea of Englishness and an England in opposition to Britain created and a political movement that's actually organized, it's going to have to meld itself with that resurgence of the labor movement. Yeah, I, I mean, I want to echo what my fellow panelists have said. I think it's about, for me, it's because a conversation about what is Englishness, 
how do we explore it, isn't really being had. So I mentioned in, in my talk about Paul Britannia, this notion, so that this was Labour completely embracing this notion of Great Britain, and, and they, but they gave Call Britannia, which was very, very surface level. You know, it was sweeping all the difficult questions under the carpet effectively, and it, it in the end, paved the way in the years ahead to, to the Brexit uh, revolution, if you like. But there was a sense that there needed to be conversation about the identity of, of the nation, about what we are, that isn't happening, as, as, as Moya says. And I think we do need politicians on the left, in particular, for example, to have an honest conversation about it. They are very scared of doing that. Uh, there's a much wider conversation about why that is. Uh, the culture wars are uh, being waged not just by politicians, but by extremely influential tabloid newspapers and media outlets like GB News coming in and supporting those people. Uh, so they're up, and this is the war to we all swim in, and so the Labour Party is going to swim in those same toxified waters. But despite all of that, it still needs to find a way, I think, to start having a conversation about this. Because I guess just finally come back to what I was trying to get at, Anthony, was how do we get this Englishness? Where does it come from? How do we actually do it? And if the politicians themselves are not even talking about it when they have an elected platform to do so, then I think it's a really challenging road ahead. And it's challenging uh, because of not just lack of understanding, I think, about the nature of the UK, but also lack of interest in it. I, during the pandemic, just very briefly, during the pandem pandemic, I turned the radio news on, news coming from London, and it announced that there were five cases of the new Omicron strain of the coronavirus, two in Scotland and three in South Gloucestershire. And I rang, it's my organization, I rang, I said, you cannot equate, what, what it sounds like is, up there, somewhere called Scotland, it doesn't really matter precisely where. But when it's close to us, Gloucestershire is not good enough, it has to be South Gloucestershire. And, and I think that is, that, that is, that is a lack of, lack, lack of awareness of the nature of the state, but I'm very interested in Richard's point that the, the, the Northern Irish, the Welsh and the Scots are creating by default institutions of English statehood. I think that is, that is you know, the empire, the opposite of the empire striking back. It's the, it's, it is a, that is a very, very profound and important point, I think, that the institutions of English statehood are taking shape as a result of the, the, the devolution settlement. And what, what we've seen in the 25 years since the Scottish Parliament was created is the gradual, gradual building up of the institutions of Scottish statehood. And I think that's an unfinished enterprise. That is an unfinished task. And I think that will, that will eventually change the game. And, and, and for, for, certainly on this island, three nations are very clearly, it seems to me, emerging with institutions of their own. Thank you all. Can we thank our panel very, very much?
The point is that, you know, it, this is, yeah, great. Good.
I think I will start because otherwise we run out of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello, hello. Uh, welcome to the final session of the day. I hope you have a nice day so far. My name is Andrea Pisauro. I am a researcher in psychology, and uh, the reason why I'm here today is that I am uh, also the co-director of Europe for Scotland. And Europe for Scotland is a pan-European initiative which brings together citizens from across Europe who want to express solidarity to Scotland post-Brexit. And we would really, really like to welcome Scotland back in the EU. And our long-term goal is for European politicians to echo this sentiment, and a bit about that we'll talk about later. So the title of our session, that's the final session of the conference, is Can Europe be complete without Scotland? And of course it shares a question mark with the title of the conference. And Tom Nairn famously didn't want a question mark uh, after the title of his book and he fought against it. And probably he would have fought against the question mark uh, at the end of the title of this session too. And uh, we have an amazing panel uh, that I'm going to present in a moment. I will also have an exciting announcement uh, later at the end of the session. Uh, our session uh, covers uh, Europe, and of course a major uh, point of discussion at the moment is the upcoming EU enlargement and how to make sure that Scotland's aspiration to rejoin as an independent country is taken seriously in Brussels. Uh, and of course, it's worth discussing what uh, Scotland can bring uh, to the European project, but also how Scotland independence would transform the political situation in the rest of the British nations, and what implications that has for Europe. And crucially, from a European perspective, uh, what Scotland rejoining would mean for Europe and uh, how welcoming uh, one of the most ancient European nations would change Europe. Now, as I am Italian, I would also like to mention how important was for Tom Nairn his years in Italy. Uh, he came to Pisa in the mid-50s when he was only in his 20s to study aesthetics at the Scuola Normale Superiore. And uh, Pisa was really his formative intellectual experience. He shaped his worldview, and not just because he came to appreciate the Italian lifestyle, uh, but also because he could enjoy the vibrant cultural and political life of a very progressive city, such as Pisa. There, he ended up reading Gramsci. Of course, the communist leader and intellectual who died in a fascist prison 20 years before. And of course, Gramsci wrote a huge deal about a lot of topics, uh, about fascism, about society, about culture, but what was really important for Nairn was uh, understanding in Gramscian terms how nations came about and how international connections are crucial to their development. And of course, if Nairn had read Gramsci in Scotland, he could have missed the internationalist element. And if he went to Pisa but didn't read Gramsci, he would have missed to understand how nations came about. So as an Italian, I feel proud of how this uh, uh, intellectual heritage of the Italian left influenced this great Scottish and European intellectual. And I think that Scotland benefited from both these angles, and the conference really reflected on this. And on this, I would like to introduce our first panelist, who is uh, Neil Archeson. And of course, Neil has had a legendary career in journalism in the last, spanning several decades. He's also one of the leading experts on uh, Eastern and Central Europe history. He wrote several books about the history of Poland and Ukraine. And very importantly, he was also a good friend of Tom. And so my question to you, Neil, is uh, how much of an impact had Neil's argument against a part of the left milieu 
that was surrounding him, about developing independence within the European uh, forest, to borrow a term uh, that Anthony mentioned before. And now do we realize the vision from where we are, both from a Scottish and a European point of view? Over to you. Well, what a conference this has been. Uh, I'd like, first of all, to thank and congratulate the organizers uh, for this extraordinary job. The second thing is that the quality of what I've heard so far today has been really outstanding and important. And the original thinking, forward-looking, you know, it may look as if politics, particularly in Scotland, are in a jam. Nevertheless, listening to all this and thinking and watching more closely, you see that the tide is still moving. Now, um, <laughs> so let me ask you, uh, it's a curious request. Remember what's been said, not so much by me, of course, but by the speakers or the rest of the day, which has been remarkable. Don't let it go. A lot of wisdom has been transmitted, I think. Anyway, I want to start with a few remarks which are not strictly about Europe, but about the situation. Now, as I say, there is a jam, a problem at the moment in Scottish politics, uh, the project of Scottish independence and all the rest of that uh, has a problem with its instrument. In other words, the SNP has problems. Um, they're not nearly as grave as they've been <laughs> suggested, but nonetheless they're there. And um, the thing is that they, to say that the persistence of support for uh, independence, which um, has revealed itself to be independent, as it were, of the, the popularity of the SNP, the main instrument, is remarkable and interesting. Um, underlying this is, of course, this large penumbra of people in Scotland who, um, in a way, think of themselves as unionists, but in whom a kind of tiny spark goes on when they think, suppose my country was independent, you know, and they then say, well, what a ridiculous idea, you know, absurd, of course we can't do that, outrageous, disloyal, ruinous, and so on. But that spark is there, and the big prize, of course, is somebody who can get at it and turn it up and that, I suppose, will happen. Um, don't be deceived by the great priority uh, argument, which is that uh, when you ask people what their priorities are in politics, you know, independence probably comes about sixth or seventh. Uh, this is because independence is in a different area of reflection. It doesn't come with the same list of, you know, better health service, better prices, better pay, all the rest of it, better pensions. It's in a different category. So really, it's not comparing like with like. I've always felt it's a mistake. But the dynamic uh, is there, and it's coming from uh, the decay of the United Kingdom and the United Kingdom relationships. Uh, so it is going to happen. And my own feeling after watching this process you know, coming, stopping, going on again, stopping, dipping, rising again, is this. For heaven's sake, let's get it done. <laughs> and let's get it done, not just for the sake of Scotland, 
but for the sake of everybody who's involved, uh, certainly in the United Kingdom, so called, but also in what Finch and O'Toole calls the archipelago, which includes the Republic of Ireland. Uh, the funny thing is that the thing which has really begun to split the Union and really damage it is democracy. Uh, democracy, of course, is not just mm, a constructive force which builds up and liberates and all the rest of it. It can destroy it as well. And, of course, it undermined the Union. How is it done so? Because the moment that the good old Union, which really was this kind of almost casual arrangement um, with no particular democratic component in it at all, except for a minority of Scottish MPs at Westminster. Um, devolution quite suddenly changed the whole terms of trade, or put it another way, it switched on the lights, and suddenly we saw, oh my God, sitting in the corner, this enormous elephant, which was called population imbalance. And at that point, everything changes, because when you have a series of democracies, uh, one enormous one, 85% of the population to which it's responsible, uh, and then the three others, you realize that uh, the union clearly is not going to go on as before, and that the biggest one will be responsible to its own population, and that this is going to at once begin to influence uh, the course of politics in the United Kingdom and how it works. And so it has turned out. Brexit, of course, <laughs> the outnumbering involved in the vote on Brexit and what happened to the Scottish preference is well known, and it's an example. So that's democracy. It's ruled by a majority, which is what democracy is largely about, the priority of numbers, if you like, and it is washing out the foundations of the union now, uh, what has happened, as some scholars like Kieran Martin have said, is that it brought about a change. It's not a, the union no longer a relationship of partners, but a relationship of, well, law. It is a law, but this is what happens. It is not partners working together creatively anymore. And we have seen many examples of this, uh, above all by the attempt to regather powers which um, were shared with the European Union, now gathered to London rather than return to Edinburgh or to Cardiff. So, um, it is obvious now that an independent Scotland must, must get into the European Union, it must belong. Uh, it's easy to say that Scotland is a European nation. It is, of course, but it's not a European nation like all the others. It's easy to say, oh, we're just a wee nation like Denmark or Norway or something. That's not really true. And uh, Tom himself pointed out, <laughs> he said, uh, the thing is that in the 19th century, when so much of Europe uh, already fostering its own cultures and its own ways and restive under empires, rebelled and began to take up the idea of national independence. At that moment, Scotland, which had uh, on paper in many ways exactly the preconditions for such a movement, the 1848 springtime of nations, nothing happened. Uh, there are good reasons for that, but this isn't the place really to go into them. It would take too long. So um, what I want to say is that, uh, well, Scotland, you see, an independent Scotland, or Scotland now, has two intimate relationships. Of course, it's Europe, the European Union, and the wider Europe, that's one. But the other, inescapably, is England. We cannot leave England out of it. It would be absurd. Uh, the intimacy of relationships, personal, commercial, of course, uh, thought, 
custom, habitus, everything, you know, TV, whatever it may be, are absolutely intimate. And they have to be respected up to a point as far as possible. And that is why when, as I hope, Scotland, an independent Scotland, finally does get into the European Union, one of its first tasks, and a very special one, is to work and work to help prepare England or the rest of the UK, the residue UK, the relic UK, to get back into, a, first of all, a fruitful relationship, the European Union, and then into full membership, if possible. That has got to be... A, pr pr a prime task. Um, of course, it's quite a long work. Uh, Kirsty Hughes, uh, who just fought so valiantly to try and get people to understand more about the European Union, uh, has written uh, that Europeans are more aware of Scotland as presentable just as their dislike of Britain grows. And that's I'm afraid true. You know, here's a certain Westminster delusion that Brussels is simply agonizing and desperate for uh, you know, Britain to reapply to join. You know, that is not the situation. I mean, of course, it's not the situation in Britain, but it's certainly not the situation in Brussels either. They are fed up with, with Britain as a difficult and dece deceiving partner. However, that has to be overcome for Scotland to prosper in or out of the EU. But in the EU, Scotland will be able to do something towards mending that relationship, and it's crucial. So, of course, now, there's an immense historical connection between Scotland and Europe, uh, you know, um, Outgoing connections, well, there's uh, the long medieval connection with Scandinavia, the Scottish merchants, Scottish soldiers. Uh, Poland, very special connection because of the still rather little known in Scotland uh, colonies on the Vistula, along with thousands of Scots and their families who settled on the Vistula took part in the grain trade, uh, something which only really ended in the 16th century. And then the same, there was a second migration too. And here, by the way, I would like to just pay tribute to somebody who died a few months ago. And that was a wonderful woman called Mona Kedsley MacLeod. And Mona MacLeod uh, came from a family called the Garveys, and the Garveys and the Kedsleys were from a, a, another Scottish migration into Poland who uh, brought with them, they were invited for their skill in the new agriculture, new agricultural equipment, particularly uh, after the 1830 rising, and uh, to build up a modernized Polish agriculture on the big noble estates. And they stayed, and they sort of polonized, and uh, although no, I think none of the Scots actually fought in the first insurrection to regain Polish independence in 1830. Some of them definitely fought in the 1863, the January writing against the Russians. And they stayed there, those families, gradually, you know, always remaining Church of Scotland, <laughs> but nonetheless beginning to marry and beginning to, hmm, well, they spoke more Polish than they spoke English or Scots, uh, but eventually they came home in, in 1916 because the Russian government ordered all foreigners in the empire to acquire Russian passports, and that was too much, and the Scots then emigrated to Dundee and Aberdeen, places they came from. So there's that, and then there's, of course, the ancient relationship with France, with uh, so many Scots taking refuge in France, uh, so many Scots taking refuge in the Netherlands. And then there's income from Europe, 
into Scotland, which would be so important, starting perhaps with the Normans arriving, the Norman warlords, then followed swiftly by the Flemings with their brilliance at crafts and imports. Uh, it said, I don't know how truly, that they actually the Flemings brought onions for the first time to Scotland, to, up to then unknown. And then, well, I can think of so many, and then the 19th century Italians, who many people feel made Scotland a habitable country. <laughs> yeah, where else, what were you supposed to do if you wanted to take your girl out in the evening? Because you couldn't go to one of these hellish bars, you know. What, what were you supposed to do? And suddenly there were an ice cream parlor, you know? <laughs> Wonderful. So everything changed. Um, and then we, they have two, at least two, Polish influxes. One of the soldiers in the Second World War from 1940 onwards, and the demobilized mass who stayed here and made their lives here. And uh, then the second one, a more joyous one really, uh, following 2004, when Poland, now newly in um, the EU, disgorged a stream, a torrent of young Poles, many of whom came to Scotland and who filled so many needs, particularly the small business, craft service businesses. Wonderful. What a shot in the arm that was. And now, of course, alas, they've largely gone, thanks to Brexit. Um, so, and then after that came uh, in the, in the later 20th century, two Scottish initiatives at importing from Europe, culturally, which were of huge importance. The first was um, the visit to uh, Germany by Sandy Moffat and John Bellany, painters, and they brought back uh, German Expressionism, which exploded like a bomb in the Glasgow School of Art and created a whole new school, you know, the, the new Glasgow boys or whatever you like to call them. It was huge, what a shot in the arm. The, those two saw that expressionism was exactly what Scotland wanted and felt for, and they were right, and it really worked. And um, another one, of course, was uh, the Edinburgh Film Festival and Linda Miles' expedition, particularly to Central Europe, uh, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, uh, to discover you know, the new European cinema and to suddenly make Edinburgh the center of experimental, advanced, and exciting thinking about film. So that uh, sometimes I remember going into a cafe in Budapest in the Cold War times and uh, saying, uh, somebody said, you're from, I said, I'm from Edinburgh, you know. And uh, all these intellect bearded intellectuals looked up from their wee cups of black coffee they said, Edinburgh, Edinburgh. And for them, Edinburgh didn't mean a city in Scotland so much. It meant a culture, an adventure into film studies and new ideas of representation. So that kind of thing, this deliberate going out, finding in Europe inspiration, a huge cultural shot in the arm, that went on. And I hope it will continue in some way. Now, of course, as Tom said, Scotland is also a very untypical we European nation because of the absence of that nationalist uprising in 1848. But I think really that um, his explanation has something to do with it. He said it is partly because of the loss of a coherent national class of intellectuals which gradually dissipated as the old Scottish Enlightenment of the later 18th century began to fade. And the, the lack of that class gradually 
began to interfere with the current of ideas from Europe and to Europe, which had existed, you know, like David Hume, you know, frolicking in the intellectual salons of Paris, that sort of thing really came to an end. So, I think I want to end by saying Scotland must return to the European Union. Maybe more difficult than we think. It will happen, nonetheless. And it's because, in a sense, sharing sovereignty in the EU is the only way of guaranteeing the essential, so, the essential sovereignty of Scottish independence. And, you know, Scotland will then find its place where it belongs in Europe. You know, one, there are 27 members, of whom almost half have populations of under 7 million. And let me say one last thing. A lot of people talk about, let's have a confederation of the British archipelago or of the UK, you know, um, of all these countries getting together, these, the nations, and forming a link. And, uh, what one has to say about that is get back to that problem of numbers because the problem of numbers, and this is what Tom wrote about, the idea of confederations, and he was quite acid, um, as he certainly could be on paper. He said, any fool can think up a plausible kind of confederal scheme for the British, Irish, whatever it is, crowned or not by the monarchy, but as long as England remains what it has inevitably been, namely four-fifths of the population, there's no possibility of that. In other words, to reconstruct Scotland's intimate and warm relationship with England, Scotland has to not only get into the EU, but get the rest of the UK, specifically England, back into the EU as well, and then you can form a relationship in which population differences matter far less, and it can be cultural, manageable, and part of a brilliant and hopeful future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil, for this uh, uh, beautiful speech. And um, thank you also for reminding the importance of uh, Italian culture in Scotland. I can tell you that the best pizza in the UK is obviously in Glasgow. Uh, and uh, now I want to turn to a different chapter of Tom Nairn's life that, after going to Italy, uh, went to France to study. And uh, in fact, here, the next speaker did the opposite journey. And uh, I uh, want to introduce uh, as uh, Samake Roman uh, by saying not only that she did Erasmus, uh, as she will tell us, in Scotland, uh, but also that, uh, of course, there is this very strong historical connection between uh, Scotland and France that uh, uh, Neil was reminding us about, that also is present in our campaign because we have a very enthusiastic uh, group of French activists that campaign very hard for Scotland to return to you, and so I want to pay tribute to them too. And now to you, Asa, that you are a columnist uh, at the National. Uh, you are also an editor of the Review Ecosse, and you can tell us a bit about that project too. And you write extensively about Brexit, and uh, so thank you. And Hello, everyone. Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Uh, it's a panel about Europe. Uh, and Scotland's space in Europe, so I think it's only right to say a few words in a uh, European language as well. Uh, so thank you so much for having me tonight. It's been such a great day. Uh, I'm, it's, it's just been so stimulating. I think we'll need a few days maybe to digest uh, everything and uh, uh, really take the, uh, read the, the good substance of uh, what was said today and uh, take it forward with me. Um, so basically, I'm, 100% product of Europe. Uh, it was always part of my life. 
even without me knowing it. So for example, when I visit my mom uh, in central France in our, uh, and I, I go see her in our childhood, uh, childhood home in Issoudan, uh, I see my kindergarten pictures with uh, EU flags in the frame and a three-year-old me uh, with an awkward smile. Um, and today I'm here because of the Erasmus program. So I was a student at the University of Edinburgh in 2010. I arrived here, I knew about Scotland a little bit, I knew about monsters at the bottom of locks, I knew about, you know, uh, tartan and haggis and all these things. I didn't really know about Scotland. It was really a discovery for me, uh, a discovery of a country, a history, a culture, a politics, something quite different. It was also a discovery for me because I discovered my passion for journalism, and this is really the year uh, where I really become an adult, where I really question my identity, where I really um, you know, ask questions and uh, discuss my uh, Frenchness with other people. And I also realized that I was a European citizen at that point. So Erasmus, you know, it's not just about studying, I'm sure you all know. Uh, it's also about making lifelong friends, maybe meeting the love of your life, figuring out who you really are. Uh, and those moments where we transition into adulthood, the personal growth, for me, it's the real deal. And the best part, sometimes you hear some Brexiteers saying, you know, when we talk about free movement, we talk about Erasmus. It's just for, for the posh kids, basically, who want to have a, a nice time abroad. But it's not. Um, Erasmus made me who I am today. I come from a working class town in the center of France. There was no way uh, that my parents would have been able to afford tuition fees in this country. So Erasmus for me is a program that is breaking down social barriers in a very natural way. So now when we talk about Brexit, for me, it's a heartbreaking waste of talent, of passion, and enthusiasm for experiencing alternative. The doors that were once open for countless opportunities for collaboration and cultural exchange have been slammed shut. Um, so tossing away something precious, something special, uh, for me is, is really, really unfortunate. So the European Union, for me, it's obviously about the economy, it's about trade, the treaties, etc. But call me a romantic, I think it's also about the people and the influence it has on actual lives. Um, so when we ask if Europe can be complete without Scotland, for me it's more than numbers and statistics and geography. We're talking about shared ideals and values that bring us together. Um, and we've got to acknowledge the power of attraction of the EU. I think it's, it's, it's in its DNA. Uh, it's been in the DNA of the EU since the very beginning. Uh, it's always had this force to attract other countries. Um, and it's been drawing us together, not just for economic reasons, but for shared ideals and values that transcend borders. And for me, divorcing Scotland's destiny from Europe is just impossible. Uh, European leaders echo this sentiment as well. Uh, when he was a presidential candidate, uh, Emmanuel Macron in 2016 declared Vive l'Ecosse Libre et Européenne, Long Live European Scotland. Uh, other figures. Other figures uh, in French politics emphasized that it would be a mistake to close the door to Scotland, recognizing that EU enlargement is welcoming countries into a community, enriching the collective identity. Enlargement is about the country it's joining uh, as much as the community itself. And certainly from a French point of view, it wouldn't make any sense at all. The General de Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle, came here in the city in the 1940s to say that the friendship between France and Scotland was probably the oldest friendship in the whole of the world's history. So for a lot of French people, it would just completely make sense to welcome Scotland back in the EU, especially if the country wants it. So, <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to our conversation today with all the, the panelists uh, to reflect about the interconnectedness of our stories, the potential in unity, and the, the tragedy of missed opportunities that has materialized with Brexit. Can Europe truly be complete without Scotland? Uh, I think this is something we need to explore with an open heart, uh, and we need to recognize that the answers may lie in our shared commitment to a diverse, collaborative, and ever-evolving European community. 
uh, in the words of a great slate, uh, François Mitterrand, who was French president from 1981 to 1995, he said, France is our motherland, Europe is our future. So maybe there's some inspiration for Scotland here. Thank you. Uh, I now want to turn to the next speaker, who is uh, Joanna Kopaczyk, uh, who is a professor of Scots and English uh, philology at the University of Glasgow. Uh, she is originally from Poland, uh, and she has also made seminal contribution to understand Scottish linguistic history. Uh, and I would like to hear your point of view, uh, also in relation to what's happening in Poland. There was a very important election recently. Good evening, everyone. It's, it's amazing to be here. I've been listening to all the talks and learning so much from everyone and feel really inspired to, uh, to participate in this event. But I have to admit, I was a little bit puzzled when I was first invited to speak at this panel because I'm not a political scientist, I'm not a politician, I'm not a famous columnist. I'm, I'm, I'm a European citizen, yes, and I'm a, I'm a Polish lassie. Uh, any other Polish people in the room today? Yes? Well, if not, then I'm happy to represent. Um, so, yes, I'm a, I'm a Polish lassie who has made Scotland her home. And thank you. <laughs> and I have also made the Scots language my career. And yes, just to get things straight from the beginning, I did say the Scots language. Everybody's making a little bug today, so, so uh, here is mine. So Scots is not a slang version of English, or a working class dialect, or parliamo glesga. Um, and of course you can pursue a career in Scots, uh, or with Scots in focus, and I hope this is going to be less of a curiosity as new generations of confident Scots learn more about their cultural heritage. I'm a historical linguist, and I'm very proud to be able to teach Scottish and international students about the history of Scots at one of the ancient Scottish universities and be part of a grassroots movement for the official recognition of Scots as a minority language in Scotland. So watch the space, by the way. The Scottish Languages Bill, which the SNP put in their political manifesto, is now being drafted and will, be, will include the first official legal recognition of Scots. But I've been invited here to talk about whether Europe can be complete without Scotland and whether Europeans care about Scotland. In fairness, I represent the largest immigrant section of the Scottish population, and in fact, the UK population. Although the number of Polish people in the UK has gone down after Brexit, as, as Neil has already pointed out. Uh, and we may come back to this issue later in the discussion. So, yes, it's great to be given uh, a voice at this impressive event. And because we're sharing stories today, I hope you can indulge me, and I would like to share two very contradictory stories with you today, because one is about a complete lack of awareness of Scotland, and the other one is about how embedded Scotland is in the fabric of Europe and its culture. So the first one is about my aunt being really proud of me when I got a job as a researcher at the University of Edinburgh in 2014, that fateful year. She would tell everybody, oh yes, Joanna is moving to England to pick up an academic post. How are things in England? She would ask me when I came home to visit. So this lack of awareness that there was more to the British Isles than England used to be a frequent scenario. And people in Europe, certainly where I come from, didn't get news about Scotland, and that's a nod to uh, James Robertson reading uh, later on. Scotland wasn't an obvious point of reference when one talked about an English-speaking country. People knew about whiskey and maybe Robert Burns. Some of them watched Braveheart, like myself, at an impressionable age. Maybe that's the, the reason why I ended up here. I don't know, don't laugh. Um, but Great Britain was presented to people uh, like my aunt as a homogenous country, 
where everybody spoke English with the BBC accent, shopped at Harrods, and went for a stroll in the Hyde Park. So these were the topics in handbooks teaching, teaching English as a foreign language. That was the gateway into the English-speaking culture. The Union Jack, the London Cab, as well as a tartan tin of shortbread were rolled into one. However, things changed after 2014 and definitely after 2016. Suddenly, my family and friends were saying, so what is the Scottish independence thing all about? Aren't you afraid of all these nationalists in Scotland? Because nationalist is a loaded word, and there was a really interesting panel in one of the breakout rooms, and many of you are there uh, probably, uh, because this is really the, one of the major reasons why Europe needs Scotland. Scotland is a counterbalance to right-wing extremist, chauvinist, xenophobic movements, which have... Ha The movements which have hijacked the idea of nationalism and patriotism. Scotland is a beacon of civic nationalism and countries like Poland need your example. So that's my first story. The second one starts with Old Lang Syne. The famous song which you might be interested to hear is actually used in Japanese supermarkets at closing time. <laughs> As I've recently found out, it was, it was marvelous to hear it. But you know it with Robert Burns' lyrics, and I first learned it with Polish lyrics as a girl scout, sitting around the fire with my friends, and I had no idea it was a Scottish song, you know, coming back to my first story. But later, I realized that this is one example of how embedded Scottish influence is uh, in our shared European culture. Polish cities bear marks of Scottish presence from the early modern period on, so that's something that Neil was talking about. You know, Stadyskoty, Old Scotland, is a, is a district in the Hanseatic city of Gdańsk. In my hometown, Leszno, which is in central western Poland, there is a statue of Dr. Jan Johnston, or John Johnson, a second generation Scotopolonus, as he would uh, describe himself, who was a friend of Comenius, an influential early modern thinker. So Scots have shaped our European philosophical, economic, and political thought. We need the intellectual input of Scotland in today's Europe, and European partners need to be able to send students on an Erasmus exchange and to collaborate on research projects with Scottish academics. Scottish students should have the right to follow in the footsteps of the generations of Scots who studied in Padua, Utrecht, Paris, Geneva in the early modern period, and Tom Nairn. Uh, And, and Tom Nairn, who, who is our um, figure in, this, in the central of, of this uh, gathering today. So every time I go back to Poland, I'm astonished at how the country is changing and has changed uh, because of our recovered European links and our place at the decision table. I think Scotland deserves a place at that table too, and we will all be better off with the Scottish voice speaking in its own right on the European stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joanna. Um, and the last speaker uh, is uh, Ali Smith, who we heard from uh, before, who is, of course, uh, MP for Sterling for the SMP, but also a former MEP and uh, one of the most respected voices, uh, Scottish voices in the European Parliament. Uh, I must confess that uh, he was hearing his speeches in the uh, past European Parliament that I got inspired to campaign for Scotland's right to rejoin you. Uh, so over to you, Ali. Andrea, grazie mille, cher collègue. Uh, great to see you. Uh, thank you for the reference to me being a member of the European Parliament. I was uh, doing question time, a dreadful, dreadful programme the other night, and uh, I was introduced as for much of, the, much of the century, Alan's a member of the European Parliament, which, which is actually true, but at 16 years, I'm very proud of representing the whole of Scotland within our family of nations. And the fact that we're not there... The fact that we're not there anymore still grieves me deeply on a daily basis. Not because of myself, my own position, but because of the diminishing of opportunity, the diminishing of horizons that all of us have suffered, but particularly the next generations. 
I'm a product of the European Union myself. I, I, I did my Erasmus year in Heidelberg University in Germany. I, I did my master's at uh, the College of Europe in Warsaw. Uh, I was a rep on the Costa Brava in Spain, though you won't see that in any official <laughs> biogs, but uh, I've taken advantage of the rights to live, work, study, love everywhere across the European Union. And it grieves me deeply that those rights were taken away as if they were a bagatelle by people who didn't cherish what we had. I, and I... And I want that back. And I want it back for the people of Scotland. I'd also like to see it back for the people of England and Wales and Northern Ireland as well. And I think we can all work towards those ends. But the question, can Europe be complete without Scotland? Well, I'd, I'd say no, I would say that, wouldn't I? Uh, the European Union is not Europe. Uh, can Europe be complete without Norway? Can Europe be complete without Iceland? No, they're, they're very much part of the family of nations that we're in, but political structure that is the European Union is the foremost mechanism of that structured, ongoing solidarity and cooperation, which I think is a thing of beauty. A European continent that's more used to guns and tanks and bombs, look at the broad sweep of 2,000 years of history, suddenly since the creation of the EEC, then the community, then the EU, politicians and leaders are used to talking to each other, going on holiday and marrying each other in each other's countries, and moving the peoples of Europe closer and closer together bit by bit. But the EU is a peace-building mechanism. It's a democratic solidarity mechanism. Damn sure I want to see Scotland part of it. <laughs> and our, our sense of identity as Scots, and I, I, I'd, I'd say something a wee bit controversial because I, I find, particularly when this sort of stuff is discussed in England, especially at Westminster, the conversation defaults to personal identity within a couple of sentences. And the Anglo-centric British nationalism that we see driving a lot of UK politics, where England, Great Britain, UK are essentially used interchangeably, would never happen in Wales, would never happen in Northern Ireland, would never happen in Scotland either, but happens at the very top levels of the UK government, I assure you. And that's because I think Scotland has been used to, for an awful long time, being part of something bigger, being part of something that isn't just about us. We've always lacked the delusion of exceptionalism. Now that's, uh, we're, we're coming towards uh, St Andrew's Day, so as, a, as an SNP politician, I've got a lot of St Andrew's night dinners in my, in my diary. And I love the fact that St Andrew, our patron saint, never saw Scotland. <laughs> never heard of Scotland. Scotland didn't exist. St. Andrew was uh, martyred in Patras in, in Greece, and then uh, Regulus, who was one of the monks in the Basilica there, had a vision, and he was instructed by God to bring the, some of the relics of St. Andrew. He's supposed to get on a boat and go to the ends of the earth, and wherever he was shipwrecked was where he was supposed to take those relics and create a, a, a site of Christian ritual. And he did. He got in his boat, and he sailed, and he sailed, and he sailed, and he was struck on a on uh, a really blasted heath, a really desolate, awful place where, uh, you, you know the film The Lord of the Rings where there's Mordor and the orcs are in the mud and he, he found himself marooned on this desolate shore, or, or as we say today, Fife, uh, and, and, and he set up, he set up St. Andrew's Cathedral, which became, in medieval times, one of the foremost Northern European Christian pilgrimage sites. But it wasn't about us. St. Andrew, our patron saint, is also the patron saint of Ukraine, Russia, Greece, Cyprus, several other places, never saw Scotland, but it's such a fundamental part of who we are and what we are. The altar, the St. Andrew's cross, was because of, uh, in uh, 832 at the Battle of Athelstan Ford, King Angus II, who was commanding a force of Picts and Scots, had a vision. There was a lot of visions in Scotland's story. And he imagined, he saw God promising him victory and there was a cross of St. Andrew in white clouds against the azure blue of a Scottish summer sky. And he promised, this is, this is all true, look at this, this is it. And uh, he promised on the eve of the Athol Dunford, uh, um, I was going to say by-election there, for it, it, <laughs> battle, because that's how we did stuff in those days. He promised God that if he was victorious, he would make that his national symbol and he would found Scotland. And he did. So we have in a saltire the oldest national flag in Europe and hence the world because of St. Andrew and because of that vision. And our sense of who we are and what we are is about geography, but has always been rooted in a wider international context. Uh, 
William Wallace, when he was appointed the High Protector of Scotland, uh, I represent Stirling, I have to know this stuff. Uh, in, in, in 1297, one of the first things he did was write a letter to the Hanseatic League, essentially saying that uh, the English uh, crown doesn't speak for us, Scotland is open for business. Not quite stop the world we want to get on, but pretty much that was where it was, and that was the letter of Lubeck, 1297, an assertion of Scottish independence. Likewise, the declaration of our broth in 1320 isn't just a declaration to go into the ether. It was addressed to the Pope in Rome, who was the spiritual and temporal power in the European continent, and we saw ourselves very much as part of that. Scotland's independence isn't a thing in abstract. It's a thing that exists in relation to the wider world. It always has been. And that's where fast forward to, to the, the, the 2016 EU referendum, I think one of the reasons that Scotland voted so significantly for EU membership, and it wasn't unanimous, and we shouldn't pretend it was retrospectively, but we did vote significantly for it, was because it was somebody at Dunblane who was canvassing in it, and it just put it beautifully that, well, we'd been used to being part of something else, so being part of Europe was quite comfortable for us. Because we're not about identity politics. And I would say that, actually, the, the, the quest for independence, and I think Tom Nairn was well ahead of us all of this, it's not about identity. The identity is almost taken for granted in Scotland. It's about the political power and the accountability. And it's about the faith in people who are making decisions on your behalf to act with your values. And I, I, I promise you, I see that at Westminster on a daily basis. So getting back into the European Union is, I believe, an integral part of our quest for independence. It was underpinning everything in 2014, but it wasn't necessarily front of house. 18 months later, in 2016, it really was front of house. And Scotland's ambitions for itself were quite clear. So my party and others, and I know I made reference to this before, but really have a read at this. An independent Scotland in the EU, the Scottish Government has set out the question of the border at Carlisle, the question of currency, how we get back into talks, what the talks will be, how we'll do it, and what the advantages for us as a society to get into the EU are, but also what we bring to the European table as well our energetic resources, our marine resources, our enthusiastic, educated, literate population, and actually the spirit of wanting to work in a sincere cooperation in a permanent structure with our European friends and allies. Because we are European. We always have been. We always will be. And one of the things, because of our sense of ourselves, I am so deeply proud of, and, and this is where Brexit really jarred with me on a deep, deep personal level, I am so proud of the fact our definition in Scotland of Scottish is if you're here, you're one of us. Your, your, own, your own individual heritage, your own individual backstory is what makes you interesting, but if you're here, you're one of us. Scotland's tragedy for 200 odd years was that we exported our population. European Union freedom movement has started to reverse that, and if people want to pay us the supreme compliment of coming to live in the blasted heath that is Northern Europe where it's dark all the time and rain falls out the sky on a regular basis, well, here, come on in, you're one of us. And the Scottish Parliament legislated to change voting entitlement in Scotland from nationality to residence for precisely that reason. And that... That's a queer sort of nationalism. Uh, in, in Brussels, every time there's an election, the, the SNP sat with the Greens, uh, and hopefully will again. And I'd have to have a coffee with each of the newly elected Green MEPs and say, yeah, we're this, we're not that. I know the word nationalism. That's because the English language doesn't really have a better word for it. But here's what we are, here's what we do. Judge us by our deeds, judge us by our values. So. Is Scotland a European nation? Damn sure we are. And can we, do we need to get back into the European Union? Yes, we absolutely do. And for those who might be skeptical about the EU, and many on the left are, and with good reason sometimes, we've never had independence in Europe. We were represented in the EU by an arm's length sniffy Westminster apparatus that viewed it as quasi foreign policy over there to be dealt with by a minority. If you want to see what independence in Europe looks like, look at Ireland. Ireland grabbed it, and it became part of Ireland's identity, it became part of Ireland's political culture. And in the EU, the post-Brexit negotiations, for the first time in the best part of a thousand years, Dublin had the upper hand against the former colonial power because it was one of the 27. 
And if that discussion had just been happening across these islands, I have no doubt the Good Friday Agreement would have been binned. I have no doubt the special status in Northern Ireland would not have been maintained. So that European influence, that European identity has boosted Ireland's sovereignty. Because in our interconnected world, if the EU didn't exist, we'd need to invent something like it. And that's the sort of independence I want for Scotland. That's the independence I'm working on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alin. Uh, so we have time for a few questions from the floor, and then uh, there is going to be an announcement uh, from uh, Europe for Scotland. Let's try to keep gender balance. If you want that. Hello, I hope, yes, <laughs> there we go. Yes, a friend, a Swedish friend who lives in Brussels uh, phoned me on Sunday there and we were talking about Brexit and she said, how does it feel now that, you know, you're out of the EU? And I had to think of something right away and I said, I just feel imprisoned somehow. And that's how I feel. Now, we, uh, we've been talking about how an independent Scotland we hope we'll get, we'll get back into the EU, but that, that, this is some time off. Let's be honest. So my question to Alan in particular is, when we came, the, the final Brexit deal was done, Nicholas Sturgeon stood up and said, well, Erasmus. Yes, we'll, we'll have Scottish version of Erasmus. Now, that's very important for our young people to continue that. I've not seen much evidence of that so far, so perhaps you can tell me how far the government's getting with that. And also, are there other ways we can link into Europe? As I say, we'll, it'll be some time before we get a, a readmitted to the EU, but what other links can we have, to, especially for our young people, to continue the link and, uh, with Europe? Scotland have in that it would force, by be being independent, force the UK to give up its nuclear weapons. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to make a comment in the European context. When Scotland joined um, England in the Act of Union, she kept her own legal system and of course <coughs> That was based on Roman law, unlike the English Anglo-Saxon law. And I think that shows the basis of her route. That remains the case today. Thank you. Uh, shall we go in reverse order from you, Aline? Sure, I'll uh, start on the Erasmus uh, programme. Uh, yes, you're quite right. Uh, there was a commitment from the Scottish Government and the Welsh uh, Senate as well uh, to create uh, a, a distinct program for Scottish and Welsh students. Uh, Northern Ireland, of course, under the Good Friday Agreement and the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, Northern Irish students are part of Erasmus via Dublin. So, so their, their rights were maintained. Uh, the lack of progress on it has been about uh, lack of capacity in terms of actually signing a cooperation agreement of that sort with the European Commission on behalf of the EU. We didn't have legal capacity to do it in that uh, you need to be a member state and part of the EU to be part of that. Also that while the trade and cooperation agreement was being negotiated, there was a gray area as to how that accountability would be managed, uh, what the legal form of that agreement would take. And all of this sounds like a real politician's answer, but when you're dealing with the European Union, there needs to be a document, there needs to be something written down that says it's this, it's this, it's this. 
Uh, there were also, frankly, issues about the extent to which the UK government was willing for the Scottish government to sign an agreement in those terms. And as we've seen with the UK Internal Market Act and the UK Retained EU Law Act, there is a wholesale assault happening right now on the devolved competence of the Scottish government to sign such agreements. So there was a number of issues got in the way with that. Uh, also, frankly, the budgetary issues in terms of how many in and out would we be able to take historically. EU nationals were a lot more keen to come to Scotland than our students were, for, sadly, to go el elsewhere. So, so all that's being worked out, and Graham Day, as Minister, uh, had made recently a couple of announcements uh, on the progress to it. Uh, but there's, uh, that's still in the works, and that's still a commitment, and uh, that is something I'm conscious of is still being worked on in Edinburgh to, to bring that forward, because we need to, because the Turing scheme just isn't anything like what we've lost, and we do need to get that back, absolutely. Uh, yes, just to follow up from uh, what Alan has just said, uh, Scottish universities have taken the initiative into their own hands, really, because nothing has been happening that would meaningfully change the situation. So, uh, for example, Glasgow is part of the CIVIS network, which is um, an agreement between several universities in Europe, and it's sort of piggybacks on the Erasmus scheme, but we, we, we just have to set up our own uh, links, uh, which would allow us to send our students uh, to European universities, not all of them, it's much less um, price uh, at a smaller scale, but certainly we're doing what we can. Uh, it would be much easier uh, if, if we could come back, uh, but at the moment we just need to make do with uh, individual links. But yes, we're on it. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, say something about uh, law and constitutional understandings. Um, one of the problems is that, of course, Scotland has preserved Roman Dutch law to some extent, uh, with com some elements of common law, and that is going to be a great advantage in ending negotiations with Europe. Uh, also, it has preserved, although there are many arguments about this, you know, the shadows of constitutional thinking, um, which are essentially republican rather than monarchical. And that, I want to add here, one of the most important things about this proposed entry to the EU. And that is that you have to understand that the Anglo-British constitutional system is utterly monarchical. It is not a question of whether you have a king or a queen, for me, so much as the system which is monarchical in that power starts at the top and flows down gradually, reluctantly, <laughs> to the bottom where the people live. And it is ancient, ancient, antique, and out of date. But that is how the British system of administration and politics and government essentially works. And that has to be turned upside down to the European idea of European modern republicanism in which Power resides at the base. That's what uh, the whole theory of so-called subsidiarity, which is so, so important, means. That power goes slowly upwards and uh, is delegated. When you, this level can't handle a particular problem which is too big, you hand it down, pass it up to the next one up. So a complete upturning, you know, renversement, if you like, of the way that governance works in Scotland, unfortunately, hanging over from the Anglo-British system of governance, which we have largely inherited, that's so important, and that has to happen. Um, on the question of nuclear weapons, I'd just say, I don't think there is the slightest chance that the EU will attempt to interfere with uh, the <coughs> Westminster fetish with nuclear weapons <coughs> as a symbol of power and grandeur and all the rest of it. So um, what will happen, in fact, the only thing which is going to change it, possibly, is very difficult negotiations, and they sure will be, uh, about Scottish independence with a Westminster government, and then where shall the weapons go? I mean, how is it, is it 40 or 50 years that Poor old Glasgow has been, you know, the prime first track target for uh, 
any nuclear exchange in uh, Eurasia, and it is, it still is. So, you know, why should that go on? Uh, why shouldn't it be, I wouldn't say Cardiff, but how about Southampton? <laughs> Thank you. I'll I'll say, say, I don't see the EU getting anywhere or even daring to attempt to interfere with the British, Anglo-British obsession, the Ukrainian obsession with nuclear weapons. It took a long time to we'll leave a that off. We'll we see about that. I mean, many in Europe don't like nukes. Anyway, as you want to... Yeah, just maybe a quick comment about the um, the possibility of uh, like how how do we create cooperation? Uh, how can we continue despite exit? And I think losing the uh, the institution, the platform that the EU uh, is, was definitely going to make things more difficult. And it is making things more difficult for artists, for example. But despite all this. You know, uh, people in Europe are still uh, interested in Scotland, they're still inspired by Scotland, they're still looking towards Scotland. Certainly, from the, you know, I interact with a lot of French people through uh, the magazine that I co-created with a bunch of fantastic French people this year, La Revue Ecossaise. And uh, actually, the vast majority of our readership is not even, you know, in this country. It's in France, it's in Canada, uh, the overseas territories of France as well. In, uh, we have some readers in the Nouvelle Caledonie, New Caledonia, which I actually find pretty cool. So, <laughs> um, and also politically, uh, if you see, uh, so there are a lot of debates in France about the centralization of the state. It's a very centralized state in a very different way uh, than the UK, but still very centralized. And you have calls for more autonomy, coming especially from Brittany, from Corsica. And in Britain especially, you have the uh, Democratic uh, Brittany Union, Union Democratic Britain. But they, the, the demand that they're formulating to the French state is, can we have something a bit like devolution in Scotland? They're looking at Scotland for inspiration of what we could have in France. So the, the, the links and the interest is happening, as I think, as long as we want it to happen. So I think it's also up to us, individual citizens, to be curious about each other. Thank you very much, Asa. Uh, we have uh, just a couple of minutes before the end of the session, and uh, I would like to make a, uh, introduce a new guest to make a very quick announcement uh, to address something that we, really, we didn't really have time to mention, which is the European elections in next uh, spring. And uh, you probably all have uh, found on your seat uh, some flyers, and uh, I would like to ask uh, Elise Talaron, who is a member of the, uh, our campaign and also of yes for You, Yes, for you, you might know as an organization that organized the rally on the 2nd of September. And you might also remember Elise because she spoke after the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, in the rally in Hollywood after the Supreme Court judgment, when she read a statement of solidarity, which was read simultaneously also in Rome, Brussels, Paris, Berlin, and Dublin. Over to you, Elise, what do you want Thank to tell you. us? Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm very pleased to be popping out to make this <laughs> announcement today. Um, so I've been given the task to announce the, long, the launch of a new Europe for Scotland petition, uh, which will be launched officially on the 30th of November, St. Andrew's Day. Uh, but today we are asking you to be the early signatories of this petition. And as uh, Andrea said, on your seats you should have seen a flyer and on this flyer, you have a QR code, which will take you to a private page uh, where you can sign a petition if you wish to do, so, to do it. Um, just to say, we are not launching officially today. It's a pre-launch. So if you could keep the petition for yourself just now, and then after the 30th of November, just spread it far and wide to everyone you can think of. Okay, so that's where you find the petition. What is the petition about? <laughs> uh, as Andrea said, in the context of the European elections next year, uh, 2024, and in the context of the debate on EU enlargement, we are asking, we are well, trying to get the voice of the people of Scotland uh, to be heard across the EU. Uh, so we are actually asking Scottish, the citizens of Scotland, to sign this petition to relay your voice to uh, the EU, okay? Uh, so that's what we're asking you to do. Europe for Scotland is very excited and felt that it was important for Scottish citizens to have an opportunity to engage in the EU debate, having lost that possibility of engagement with Brexit, okay? So if you want to be part of the conversation, 
please sign it now and share it after the 30th of November. And if you haven't got a flyer, there are extra flyers in the ballroom uh, just under the Europe for Scotland banner, actually holding the Europe for Scotland banner, so they're on top of the Europe for Scotland banner. So you can get one there and, um, and get your signature in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elise. I also want to point to Nina Jatter on the second row that has a lot of these flyers and is also the co-director of Europe for Scotland with me. I think we have run out of time, so I would like to really thank our speakers and uh, thank all of you as well. It's been a very long and exciting day, I hope, and uh, I pass it on to Peter for some final remarks. a three course closing for you. Uh, I'm going to be very quick now and I'm just going to hand over to James for the, for the final time uh, today uh, and uh, he's going to do the news where you are. I've just, uh, I've just actually cleared this with Peter. I, I noticed um, when we were talking about how long I was going to take to do this, I said, this is about two and a half minutes, but I noticed on the program it gives me five minutes. So he's allowed me to do one other thing first. Uh, and so I'm going to read you a poem uh, before I get to the news where you are. Um, uh, earlier on I made reference to a language called Pish. Uh, I've had very little Pish today. It's been absolutely brilliant to listen to such a wide range of people speaking so eloquently and passionately about so many different things. I feel like people are going to leave this room uh, with a renewed uh, sense of purpose and hope. And uh, we've already, Antonio Gramsci has been mentioned several times. He seems to me, that, it seems to me that behind the, the spirit of Tom Nairn is the ghost of Gramsci uh, in today's proceedings. And uh, one of my favorite quotes of Gramsci's is his belief in Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. And I think that's a guiding force to take us through the bad times so we get to the better times. So I would like to read you a poem that I wrote last year uh, for an organization, a charity called Rock Trust. The, the Rock Trust. Uh, is a, a charity established in Edinburgh 31 years ago, now 30 years last year, which is a charity specifically dealing with homelessness uh, for, and young people in homelessness. And uh, when they, they, they published a book to mark the 30th year of their existence, not in, as a, in any way as a celebration, but to note that they were still there doing necessary work 30 years after they started and the hope was that in 10 or 20 or 30 years further on they wouldn't exist because that problem would have been solved but we know that uh, there will always be other new problems coming along and there'll be new needs to address those issues um, but what the rock trust does does is to try to replace despair with hope and to bring positive change into the lives of young people who are afflicted by homelessness and by lots of the other issues that bring about homelessness. So this is a poem I wrote for them and uh, you'll notice when I read it that it owes something to the work of Bob Dylan, but it's also written in a fairly um, uh, full-on Scot and if you're not familiar with all the words, don't worry, I hope that lets you, the, 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 the sound and the, the direction of travel will get you through to the end as my late friend, the uh, Dundee songer, singer, singer, songwriter, Michael Mara, used to put it when he was uh, launching into one of his, what you might call, full-strength Dundonian songs, hopefully I'll meet you at the other end. <laughs> this is called A Sair Time Coming, and when I wrote it last week, uh, last year, I was full of doubts and pessimism about the state of the world, and I still am, but we have to look beyond uh, those things and invest some of our faith in optimism of the will. Well, what have you been, my dearest in? 
Ofo hy bien rari kam heen. A hy stoch hid en streed op vennels en kloses. A hy stood on a ledge and looked down at the water. I was out in the cold but I burned with a fever. I was pit in cells for consorting with strangers. I slept with the deed in a thousand old kirkyards. And it's a seer, and it's a seer, oh it's a seer, and it's a seer, it's a seer time that's coming. Oh what did you see, my dearest in? Oh what did you see, and have you come home? I saw hunkering men like soldiers in trenches. I saw women with misery etched on their faces. I saw folk getting bivied and folk that were starving. I saw beggars with dogs and neighbor caring. I saw streets full of shops that shone like cathedrals. Their windows were mirrors, but the glass was all broken. And it's a seer, and it's a seer. Oh, it's a seer, it's a seer, it's a seer time that's coming. What did you hear, my dearest Dane? Oh, what did you hear, and had you come in? I heard the bird sing in the hearth of the city. I heard chainsaws roar in the midst of the forest. I heard orchestras playing and missiles exploding. I heard diplomats screaming and scientists praying. I heard an old spay wife, I tell thee, I tell thee. I heard an old potter, he couldn't stop greeting. I heard a young lass, she was ranting and raging. And it's a seer and it's a seer, oh it's a seer. And it's a seer, it's a seer time that's coming. And what did you meet, my dearest Dane? I what did you meet before you came home? I met some that were ghosts and some that were haunted. I met bairns that had drowned in the deeps of the ocean. I met teachers with guns and dreamers with banners. I met peacemakers wading in blood to their oxes. I met a dictator. He said he was sorry. I met a protester. She said she was Jesus. And it's a seer and it's a seer. Oh, it's a seer, aye, it's a seer, it's a seer time that's coming. Oh, what'll you do now, my dearest Dane? Hey, what will you do, and will you bide him? I'll have water the dreech and desolate places to yowl at the moon and break bread with a stranger. I'll stravag in the woods and hunt with a hoolet. I'll drink for the pool of the psalm and the wisdom. I'll seek out the licht in the beeld of the mountain. I'll gang to the shore and collog with a selkie. I'll stone at the lip of the loch like a hen. Then I'll look to the lift and the grey lags of me. Crying their news or the tunes and the clackings where hodden bin people are walking and rusing, the hameless, the hermless, the sick and the stricken. But gin there to thole or gin there to rise, it's a seer and it's a seer, oh it's a seer, oh, it's a seer, it's a seer time that's coming. It's all from us. Now it's time for the news where you are. The news where you are comes after the news where we are. The news where we are is the news that comes first. The news where you are is the news where you are. It comes after. We do not have the news where you are. The news where you are may be news to you, but it is not news to us. The news may be international, national, or regional. The news where we are may be international news. The news where you are is never international news. Where you are is not international. The news where you are comes after the international and national news. The news where you are may be national news or regional news. However, national news where you are is not national news where we are. It is the news where you are. If the news where you are is national news, it is only national where you are. The news where we are is national wherever you are. <laughs> On Saturdays, there is no news where you are after the news where we are. In fact, there is no news where you are on Saturdays. Any news there is, is not where you are, it is where we are. 
If there is news where you are, but not where we are, we'll wait until Sunday. <laughs> After the news where you are comes the weather. The weather where you are is not the national weather. The weather where you are comes after the news where you are, and after the weather where you are comes the national weather. Do not confuse the national weather with the weather where you are. The weather where you are comes first, but it's lesser weather than the national weather. Extreme weather is news. However, weather that is more extreme where you are than, when we are, than where we are is not news. Weather that is extreme where we are is news. Even if extreme weather where we are is only average weather where you are. <laughs> On average, weather where you are is more extreme than weather where we are. Tough shit. Good night. And to summarise uh, today's event, I'm now going to hand over to Joyce McMillan. Uh, I can't think of anyone better to do this. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing uh, how she synthesised what's happened today. Joyce. Uh, well, it's a tremendous honour to be asked to do this, and I just want to thank all the speakers that I've heard today and all speakers that I haven't been able to hear, because of course there have been, as we all know, some terrific tantalising clashes between the breakout sessions um, and the sessions here in the main hall. So it's been a tremendous um, privilege um, to have been here today, and of course the job of summarising it is completely impossible. Um, I've thought about it and uh, I've, I've um, drawn so many different strands out of it, I couldn't possibly, in a brief summing up, because I think it should be brief at this time of the day, couldn't possibly cover everything I've thought and everything I've learned. Um, and so I'm going to go back to Will Storer's wonderful introduction to the day, back just before 10 o'clock this morning. Um, Will, if you remember, talked to us about four toms, the four different tom nairns that he knew and valued and loved. Tom the European, Tom the Revolutionary, Tom the Social Scientist, and Tom the Citizen and Activist, who was never far from the political movements uh, that were close to the heart um, of his um, concerns and the issues that he wrote about with such eloquence um, and such wit. I think every one of those four Toms would have been really delighted by some of what he has heard today and perhaps um, almost by all of it. I think Tom the European would have been delighted um, by the discussions today and in particular by this final discussion um, that we've heard this evening. I think he would have been thrilled that despite um, the Brexit triumph, the Brexit um, triumph of um, those uh, who prefer a kind of nostalgic and exceptionalist um, view of the UK, I think he would be delighted by the extent to which that old Ukrainian, Ukrainian ideal is now being tested to destruction by the Conservative government that we have and is being rumbled and rejected by ever more people across these islands. And I think he would have been uh, thrilled by the tone of that discussion and by the way that it forces, as that idea begins to crumble in front of our eyes, it forces discussion about where our partnerships and where our allegiances and where our belongings will be um, in the future. So I think he would have been delighted by that, by the emergence of a European dimension and by its continuing strength in the movement for Scottish self-determination and for Scottish statehood, and um, that it is always seen in a European context and always with a European future and hopefully with an internationalist future that goes beyond that as well. 
Secondly, I think Tom the Revolutionary would have been thrilled to hear um, the spirit of some of his old comrades and the spirit of 1968, which was evoked by Hilary Wainwright this morning. I think he would have been delighted by the sense um, that underlying the apparent political stasis of the United Kingdom, the apparent constitutional conservative of conservatism of both the main parties and the apparent stalemate of the independence debate in Scotland, there is a growing sense that the old um, Ukrainian state, which, we, which we've seen being pushed to its extremes by the muscular unionism, so-called, um, and the other extremely reactionary uh, moves of the present government, that that state is increasingly forcing a recognition that people in these islands have to stand up have to stop crouching, as Hillary Wainwright put it, and have to begin negotiating with each other on their feet as citizens um, rather than as subjects. I think he would have really valued the sense that that is now bubbling under, you know, the decaying structures um, of, of, of the United Kingdom as we have known it, and it's a movement that's becoming stronger and stronger. And that movement has many strands to it. It's not just about nations stepping forward to declare their own sovereignty, sovereignty, although that will be part of it or may be part of it. It's not just about those nations, once they've recognized one another as sovereign, renegotiating new relationships. The word confederalism has been both mentioned and rejected in really interesting um, ways today, but those relationships being renegotiated in that new context. But it's also in the recognition that standing up and becoming a citizen of a democracy is not an event, of course, as, as everyone used to say about evolution. I think David Steele and various others, George Robertson, used to say about um, uh, uh, devolution. It was always, always going to be a process. And that process involves, as Jamie Driscoll reminded us, um, talking about his role as mayor um, in, in the northeast of England, um, that, that that process also involves local government. It involves an internal process of continuous democratization and debate about democratization, as well as renegotiation of international um, relations between uh, perhaps new sovereign um, nations. I think Tom, the social scientist, would have been delighted by much of what we've heard today, and particularly with the care um, that, that we've seen from some of our academic speakers who are really listening to people in the communities who have really um, had a tough time in the UK over the last 40 years, many of whom voted for Brexit as an act of protest, among other motives, um, and many of whom are yearning to have their voices heard, listening to those voices, understanding the nuances of what was going on beneath the surface of that vote, beneath the surface of um, Scotland's referendum. Um, these are the, the great works of social science, and um, understanding also um, the relationships among the people of Europe, how they see each other, how they see the future of Europe, and what the European project means to them. There's so much good work and research being done on people's attitudes and feelings in all of those areas, and I think Tom would deeply have appreciated uh, the subtlety and the attention to, 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 to reality and to detail in a lot of what we've heard today. But finally, I think the most delighted and joyful of all would have been Tom, the active citizen. Um, Tom, who was always looking um, for movements and for um, um, things like political parties, but perhaps not political parties, but political formations, um, which he thought would be pushing things in a positive direction. I think he'd have been thrilled, for instance, by Leanne Woods's insight into the kind of symbiotic relationship between uh, the idea of independence in Scotland and the idea of independence in Wales. The people in Wales say they would be much more likely to vote for independence if Scotland had already done so. And I suspect many people in Scotland would feel almost goaded into voting um, for independence if they felt that Northern Ireland had finally worked itself up to the point of saying, we are off, we're not going to be part of the UK anymore. So that kind of productive symbiosis between all of these parts of the UK who need to talk to each other, who need to support one another as we seek out um, a different kind of future and move on at last um, from that kind of dreaming. I think you would have loved Caroline Lucas's idea that this event should be the beginning of something. Perhaps, Caroline said, a roadshow that goes around the UK and begins to bring these issues and these possibilities in front of people in every part.
of the UK and Ireland. I've also been delighted to hear mentions of the things that, that have kept me sane through 40 years of writing about relatively reactionary government most of the time um, at UK level. Um, trade unionism has had one or two mentions, and as a member of a union, the National Union of Journalists, which has always organised in both the UK and Ireland, and which was not deterred uh, from doing so by Ireland becoming independent over 100 years ago, um, I'm fascinated by the role that active trade unionism can play in all of this, and I'm so glad that that was mentioned in the session um, earlier this afternoon, and the new appeal of trade unionism and labour organisation to a younger generation who are beginning to understand just what a raw deal workers can be given if they don't organise, and if they don't um, take those steps. And above all, really, as someone who's been kept sane through all these years by my dull role as both a theatre critic um, and a political commentator, I think it's, it's wonderful, you know, both to hear... Um, um, hear these wonderful poems that we've been hearing um, throughout the day, absolutely fantastic from James Robertson, but also, but also to remember the vital role that uh, artists have played in both Scotland and Wales in reinventing, reimagining, joking about, developing the idea of uh, making into fun the idea of building a new and different kind of political community. Um, all of those have been absolutely vital here, and I'm sure that if you look beneath, even slightly beneath the surface of English culture and the very bland version of it that often comes to us through the mainstream media, the same is true there. Tremendous rivers of creativity, of poetry, of brilliant novel writing, of music, of every kind um, from classical to rap. Let's think after all that it was back in 1977, the same year that Tom Nairn published The Breakup of Britain, that the Sex Pistols were on it. Their thought was as advanced of that, that of Tom Nairn, although perhaps a little less detailed. In seven words, they summed up the spirit of much of what Tom was saying about the state of the UK's constitution back then. They said, there is no future in England's dreaming, meaning England's imperial dreaming, England's nostalgic dreaming, England's dreaming of the past rather than of the future. I think what we've learned here today is that that old kind of dreaming is dying in these islands. It's slow, it's agonizing, there are many sort of florid symptoms of death twitches and apparent revivals and all the rest of it. But today we've also seen what a new kind of dreaming would look like, and not just dreaming, but practical organisation and planning for a different kind of community of these islands, um, in which people as citizens step up both to claim their own sovereignty and to cooperate and live together with one, one another and also to become better and more um, powerfully contributing citizens of the wider world. So we've seen glimpses of all those possibilities today. We've had hints of the organisational structures or at least a series of events which could begin to lead us in that direction. It's been tremendously inspiring. It's been truly thrilling. I want to thank the organisers again for putting it all together. Thank everyone for being here and wish you all the best in taking these ideas, Tom's ideas and his wonderful spirit um, of inquiry, of campaigning, and of liberating politics forward into the future. Thank you. offered you three courses. I suppose this makes this the pudding. Um, so I just really wanted to add to those thanks on, on behalf of those of us who've organised this. To you as attendees, you've made this event. It's been incredibly exciting. There's been uh, a, real, a real vibe of, of urgency and, and, uh, and change in the room, and I think that's been fantastic. I want to thank the speakers who have been uniformly fantastic. Uh, I, some of the best speeches I think I've ever seen I've seen today, and I'm really uh, invigorated by that. I want to thank the steering group, of which Joyce was a part, and a number of other people in the room were a part, who helped us to bring uh, that, that group of speakers together and give us plenty of good advice and 
maybe a little bit of bad advice on uh, how, to, how to run the event. Uh, I want particularly from the, from the steering group, from the executive, to thank uh, Anthony Barnett, uh, whose idea this was. And I don't want to embarrass him, but um, quite often I say, do you know he's 81? And people say, what? He's 81? Uh, an, an incredibly vibrant person and, and somebody with, with so much energy to bring this together. And Adam Ramsey as well, who uh, also did an enormous amount of work to help us. And finally, uh, Jamie, you're there, and Anne, you're there. Can you come up? I'm sorry to do this to you. Um, so this is the slightly shyer event organisers uh, who don't quite enjoy being on stage as much as I do. And I think we've got a couple of gifts for them. So Jimmy has uh, has been working on this with me for seven months and uh, we've, we've uh, got to know each other a lot better. Uh, it's been a, an enormous pleasure, so thank, thank you. Um, um, you were only with us for the last little bit, but you really helped to pull things together, so thank you so much. And uh, we, we have a little gesture of thanks for you. Um, the the last and just with the It's a gender prison, I think. No, okay, so. <laughs> I hope you like space, Sally. Um. Uh, and the last and most important announcement is that I think some of us will be continuing the conversation in Milne's Bar, uh, round the corner, so you're all very welcome to join us. Uh, I haven't told them that, so uh, we might have to find another spill. Thank you all so very much, and uh, it's been a wonderful day. Thank you.